Next, a hearing on rewriting the Endangered Species Act. The 22-year-old bill requires the government to do everything it can to save all species from extinction. The new bill, debated by the House Resources Committee in mid-September, emphasizes voluntary efforts to protect fish and wildlife. It would also eliminate a ban on the destruction of endangered species territory on private lands. Witnesses include Assistant Interior Secretary George Frampton, officials from the American Farm Bureau Federation, National Fisheries Institute, and the Endangered Species Coalition. This hearing is being chaired by Representative Don Young of Alaska and runs five hours and 25 minutes. hearing will come to order we're going to go ahead and get started I'd like to welcome everybody here today I have a brief opening statement and then someone from the minority side will also have an opening statement then we'll move as expeditiously as possible into the panels this hearing is scheduled today on the endangered species Conservation and Management Act, H.R. 2275. I sincerely appreciate the willingness of the chairman to address this extremely important issue and the leadership he has shown in making this bill one of the top legislative priorities of the 104th Congress. I am happy to have co-authored this legislation, which has the bipartisan support of 117 of our colleagues. I would also like to thank the chairman for allowing me to serve as chairman of the Endangered Species Act Task Force. I appreciate having had the opportunity to provide the committee an extensive review and analysis of the problems associated with the current Endangered Species Act. Finally, I would like to thank all of those who participated in the task force hearings for taking the time out of their busy schedules to see firsthand how the ESA is being implemented in the different regions of the country. The Endangered Species Act Task Force held seven field hearings from coast to coast and three more in Washington, D.C. during March, April, and May of 1995. In fact, the task force held more field hearings on the ESA in three months than in all of the previous 22 years since the act was signed into law in 1973. In addition, the task force has received letters and comments from thousands of concerned citizens nationwide. H.R. 2275 was created from the ideas and suggestions provided by the 161 witnesses and the thousands of letters received during these hearings. The current Endangered Species Act celebrates its 23rd birthday this year and has been due for a rewrite since 1992. Like many other conservation laws, it has, it has become outdated and outmoded by advances in science and technology. Numerous scientific experts have recognized that there are some species that should not have been listed and some species that simply cannot be saved. At the same time, the act has been inflicting a disproportionate amount of sacrifice, human, economic, and social, at an enormous cost. Okay. Make no mistake, I believe in the goals of the Endangered Species Act. I also believe, however, that it must be comprehensively rewritten to restore this law to its original intent. H.R. 2275 is the correct path to that reform. The current ESA imposes stifling command and control bureaucratic regulations to accomplish the goal of species conservation. There is no longer necessary in an era of new environmental awareness on the part of the American people. People want to save species and want incentives to do them, not conflict and controversy. H.R. 2275 bases conservation efforts on the best possible science to restore the faith of the public in decisions made by the government. The bill bases listing decision on current factual information and requires an adequate peer review of all, the, of all of the data. 
It also makes all of the data used in the listing process open to the public. It also encourages voluntary measures to protect species, including cooperative management agreements, habitat reserve grants, land exchanges, and habitat conservation planning. This represents a dramatic positive shift from the current law. The current act imposes burdens on individual private landowners when biologically valuable resources are discovered on their property. Since it does not recognize constitutionally protected private property rights, the ESA gives landowners no incentive to harbor endangered species. Instead, it places the costs and the burden of species conservation not on society as a whole, but on the backs of private property owners. H.R. 2275 protects private property rights. It recognizes that the goal of species conservation is a societal benefit. Therefore, society should bear the costs. By punishing private property owners for having endangered species on their property, we have caused people to fear the Endangered Species Act and not embrace it. Specifically, H.R. 2275 compensates property owners when the restrictions imposed by this law diminish the value of their land by 20 percent or more. Of course, it honors all local zoning and nuisance laws of the states in the process. By recognizing property rights, landowners will no longer fear having endangered species on their land. The result will be an unleashing of the conservation ethic within our nation's landowners and the dramatic enhancement of our rich biological heritage. The current ESA focuses on the preservation of undeveloped land while discouraging good management efforts to increase species population. The success of the peregrine falcon, for example, would not have been realized if it weren't for the captive breeding program for that species. The ESA must be improved to allow for greater use of similar efforts. H.R. 2275 recognizes that our efforts to save species should incorporate the innovative ideas of, from emerging from the American people. It utilizes scientific advances in captive breeding and species propagation programs to restore threatened or endangered species to greater numbers and return them to the wild. Advances in scientific te technology are welcome and encouraged in this law not hindered with rigorous paperwork and senseless bureaucracy. The current Endangered Species Act has been driven not by biology, but instead by the courts and the manipulation of the public participation provisions in the law. For example, the public process to petition a listing of a species requires little scientific data, yet requires the Fish and Wildlife Service to undergo extensive analysis to determine whether or not a species should be considered for listing. In addition, as the Spotted Owl fiasco makes clear, frivolous lawsuits have contributed not to the conservation of endangered species, but instead to the economic and social upheaval of our rural communities. The bill encourages public participation, but in a more positive, constructive manner than the current law. It makes all scientific data available to the public. It requires that people who petition to list the species provide more thorough and concise scientific information in order for that species to be considered for listing. It also limits citizen suits to actions against federal agencies and eliminates other abuses. Finally, this bill encourages states to be more actively involved in endangered species conservation by giving them incentives to implement this program. The bill also establishes a national biological biodiversity reserve system consisting of over 290 million acres of land for the purpose of protecting biodiversity and our natural resource heritage. A proactive program, the biodiversity reserve system will utilize conservation lands to foster biodiversity and conserve endangered species. Lands can be added to the system by exchanging properties with non-federal landowners. <clears throat> this is a positive shift from the current conservation practice in those areas. I realize that this bill is not perfect. It does, however, represent a dramatic and fundamental reform of the existing law by recognizing that key to reforming the threatened or endangered species is through incentives and rewards, not threats and fines. Rewarding people for species conservation and good land stewardship is the key to strengthening the ESA. It's just that simple. Thank you again. Thanks again to the chairman for scheduling this hearing today. And with the unanimous consent, I would like to include statements from the field hearings, the task force field hearings in the record. Do you want me to do that? Okay. 
And I would like at this time to recognize the ranking minority member on the, the task force, Mr. Studs. Briefer than yours, and you may also notice some other differences. Uh, I uh, would very much have liked to come here today to say that the bill before us represented a genuine effort to reform the Endangered Species Act. I cannot say that. I wish I could say that this committee had undertaken something resembling an honest review of the statute, but I do not believe that it has. I had hoped that our proceedings might value science over anecdote, that we could all concede that matters as important and complex as this act have shades of gray, or at the very least, we could show common respect to witnesses who actually might have differing views. Sadly, we did not. I think members know that I am not given to shrill accusation, and given my decades-long friendship with a gentleman from Alaska and our remarkable history of working cooperatively to reconcile our sometimes very considerable differences, I searched this bill for redeeming qualities, and I could not find them. And as we convene this hearing, let's at least be clear about our intentions. This legislation constitutes, in substance, an outright repeal of the Endangered Species Act. If the subtext of the debate pits science against politics, then we now know who wins. The bill barely gives lip service to the overwhelming weight of testimony from respected scientists. Rather, it validates uncritically the pseudoscience purchased and packaged for us by special interests, which are aching to resume timbering on salmon streams, and, believe it or not, to require the United States government to seek permission from the likes of Muammar Gaddafi to protect threatened gazelles. We set out to heal an admittedly <laughs> ailing Endangered Species Act. Instead, this bill amputates its key provisions and then decapitates it. I am saddened to have to conclude that the results of our work over the past many months are as discouraging as the way in which we conducted that work. And I emphasize the word saddened. Uh, we have a long tradition in this institution of a bipartisan fashion of approaching this matter. This bill, as I recall, was signed into law by President Nixon with huge bipartisan majorities in both houses. That kind of comedy, that kind of reflection of a broad bipartisan understanding in this country and an appreciation of the basic premises which underlie this statute has now fled the scene. And I hope we don't have to wait too long for its return. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent, which is what I understand we have to do under the new rules, to proceed with an opening statement. Without objection. Thank you. I'll try and do this quickly. Uh, if I may ask unanimous consent also that my entire statement be placed in the record, then I won't have to uh, <coughs> take quite as long. Mr. Chairman, first of all, let me um, thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to express ourselves this morning, and let me commend you for the great effort that you have put into uh, this uh, uh, issue over the past uh, several months. Uh, I know that uh, you have traveled and listened and hopefully learned. And uh, to the extent that uh, you have done that, I think you deserve a great deal of credit. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I have a strong interest in the conservation of endangered species. As such, I have, as you know, informed both yourselves and Mr. Young of my intention to introduce a measure to improve the implementation of the Endangered Species Act, which I will do in the next few days. Uh, I have some concerns about the, uh, the, the, the bill that you have drafted. Uh, for example, its definition of take which defines it as a direct action which harms or kills an endangered species, I believe is wrong directed. I believe that habitat protection is important for many, uh, in fact, for most species. I realize that other factors, such as predation, can also lead to decline of species, but habitat modification also <coughs> plays a major <coughs> role in species decline, and we as a committee cannot ignore that issue. A major criticism of the current Endangered Species Act as it currently exists in law is that the federal government has too strong a role in its implementation which shuts the states out of the recovery planning process. Many states have strong endangered species conservation programs in their own right. To shut this expertise out of the recovery planning process is seen as many as quite unwise. I intend to introduce the Endangered Species Habitat Conservation Act of 1995 to address this problem. My bill would, at the Governor's request, require the Secretary to delegate the authority to develop and implement recovery plans to the states. 
While the Secretary would retain authority over the overall conservation of species, the bill puts in place checks and balances that give the States power to negotiate if the Secretary rejects the State Delineated Recovery Plan. For example, if the State of New Jersey, which is my home State, develops a plan to conserve and manage the Pinelands tree frog, which the Secretary rejects because he or she does not believe it will adequately protect the species, an ad hoc panel of scientific experts would be convened. This group, called the Joint Federal-State Panel, would be comprised of two state-appointed scientists with expertise in species, two federally appointed scientists with expertise in species, and a scientist appointed by the President of the National Academy of Sciences with similar, similar expertise. This panel would be charged with working out the differences between the Secretary's vision of conservation and the State's. The resultant recovery plan would be a scientifically and not politically based plan. My bill does not ignore economic considerations either. It requires the Secretary to minimize and fairly distribute adverse social and economic consequences that may result from the impl implication of recovery plans. It also sets up scientific content requirements for petitions to list so that only those that are scientifically based will be considered by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Further, it requires peer review prior to final approval of listing. If the Secretary is requested to do so by a person with legitimate scientific <laughs> concern. Finally, it lets stand the Supreme Court definition of harm to include habitat modification. I am concerned about the takings section of the bill, as I had mentioned earlier, and I look forward to working with you and with Chairman Young to address this issue. Mr. Chairman, once again, thank you for the opportunity to discuss uh, this issue this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. The committee will temporarily recess. We have a vote going on right now. We have about seven minutes left in the vote, and we will return promptly after that and resume the hearing. The hearing will come back to order. I would like to apologize to everybody, but we're going to try to avoid as many, as many of the interruptions as possible with the floor, but uh, they're calling votes on stuff that really doesn't matter, so we have to go over and vote <laughs> once in a while. We're pleased today, before we proceed, I'd like to say that we're pleased today to have several honored guests in our audience who I would like to take one moment to welcome. They are here today because the action that we will take on the Endangered Species Act has enormous consequences for the peoples and the wildlife of their countries. His Ex Excellency Ambassador Midzi of Zimbabwe, His Excellency Ambassador Colomo of Nam Namibia, Namibia, representing His Excellency Ambassador Chikone who could not attend is the first secretary, Mr. Kum Kumbatira, <laughs> and Mr. Mustag Murad, the charge d'affaires of Botswana. And if they wouldn't mind standing for a minute, welcome to our hearing. <laughs> we thank you very much for your attendance and your interest in this issue. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, is Namibian here? Tracy. <laughs> Kind of. It's about as close to Tracy's it is Fresno. <laughs> yes, Mr. Tozan. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I ask you then, Mr. Consent, to make a brief opening statement. Uh, without objection. Mr. Chairman, I, I simply want, before we begin the hearings, to point out uh, a very uh, interesting distinction in, in the way in which people approach this extraordinary, extraordinary complex and controversial issue of reforming the Endangered Species Act. Uh, in the last several Congresses, Jack Fields and I introduced endangered species reform. It immediately was characterized by opponents as the blueprint for extinction, I think is the term they used for the bill. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, an alternative bill was filed by the then chairman of Merchant Marine Fisheries Committee, Mr. Studs, um, 
also reforming the Endangered Species Bill. In his bill, five of the six general principles outlined in the Tozan Fields Bill were incorporated in some form. Uh, the only one where there was huge difference of opinion was in the sixth, which was the property rights section. And yet, for all those years, we never had a markup of either one of those two bills. We had hearings. We had sessions like this. Uh, we had uh, field hearings on some occasions, but we never had a markup. Process never evolved into action by the Congress. And so today, in, in a new Congress, we're taking it up again. And not surprisingly, there is a huge difference not only in people's appreciation of the issue, but in the way they approach this debate. Already we have seen debate by characterization. I want to paraphrase my, my friend from Massachusetts' statement. He called the bill not genuine, not honest, driven by anecdote, no redeeming qualities, amounts to repeal, uh, represents uh, the victory of politics over science, puts Gaddafi in charge of protecting giraffes, I think he said. It uh, amputates, decapitates, all debate by characterization. I want to contrast with the statement made by Mr. Saxon, who has very substantial differences with the, the bill that we have prepared and filed and which we are uh, hearing today. Mr. Saxon talks about his difference of opinion on the definition of take, his difference of approach on the question of state control of the programs and conservation habitats, all legitimate differences of opinion that we ought to debate and settle and eventually work out. I, I draw this distinction to the attention of the committee in the hearing for this simple reason. I'd like to make a request upon all of us here in this hearing, in the Congress, and eventually as we, uh, as we debate this with the White House itself. And that is that we end this debate by characterization. I do not uh, disrespect, uh, nor do I, uh, am I intolerant of the views of those who feel like the status quo in endangered species is okay. I think they're wrong, but I respect their opinion. I deeply respect those who will disagree with the reforms this bill proposes. I think we're right, but we ought to have a good, honest debate about whether the language we've crafted in these reforms does the job or whether it fails to. And if you can prove to us that it doesn't do the job in building a better Endangered Species Act or that in some way it will fail us in terms of balancing the needs of, of uh, people and, and the ecology, uh, then we ought to be willing to work with you to change it. But that ought to be the structure of this debate. We ought to end this debate by characterization. I don't care what you call this bill. If you want to call it the Blueprint for, Blueprint for Extinction and publish that in mailings and pamphlets, that's not going to get us anywhere. I don't really care how you characterize it. What I care about is whether we collectively join together in reforming an act that desperately needs reform and desperately needs to be made more user-friendly so that people who are affected by it support it more so that it can do a better job of protecting species and at the same time respecting property rights and people in the equation. If we can just agree to do that, this debate will be much more pleasant, more productive, more fruitful, and in the end, I think the American public will appreciate it more than this name calling and, and again, debate by characterization. I'd like to see it end, and I'm calling upon all our colleagues to try to end it. This is a great debate we start today on this bill. I hope the hearing enlightens us I hope it tells us where we're right and where we need to change. And in the end, I hope we produce a bill that more and more people in America can come to support so that we can have a decent program in America that works with common sense and takes people and the ecology into account in a way that gives us both a chance to survive in this ever-changing planet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I ask you unanimous consent for opening statement. Without objection. Mr. Chairman, I. I, I do so simply not to, uh, uh, not to defend my colleague from Massachusetts, who is among the most thoughtful and articulate members of this body and has been for the entire time I have been in this body. But we must and we will arrive at conclusions as we read the various proposals that, what will, be for, that what will be before us. And in so doing, in arriving at those conclusions, 
we will characterize and we will properly characterize our conclusions as they pertain to the bill and to amendments that will be offered and to the final work product. And I think it is a very fair characterization uh, when you look at uh, how the bill that, uh, that will be before this committee uh, treats uh, habitat, how it treats compensation, how it treats the definitions of species, and how it, it, it places limitations on various uh, species, foreign, marine, what have you, that you can arrive at a very fair characterization that this is the repeal of the Endangered Species Act as people have come to know it and have expected the benefits of that act and have received the benefits of that act. That is a very fair characterization. To say that this, this, this amputates major provisions and protections and goals and purposes of the Endangered Species Act is a very fair characterization. I assume many in this room will not agree with that and won't, won't ever agree with that. And I don't know that uh, one side will be able to prove to the other to the extent of changing their mind. But that is a, that is a, a characterization that, that uh, can be properly arrived at. And you can't, in, 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 in the course of discourse, eliminate characterizations. We have had many people who are proponents of this legislation time and again uh, sit at the witness table or testify in this committee that they are against repeal. That's sort of the, the chump change that you throw out on the table so that nobody can attack you and then engage in the process of repealing the Endangered Species Act as it is currently known to the American people and as they have watched it work and they continue to overwhelmingly support that act. That is not the proposal before us. And, and we will continue down this road and there will be, there will be changes, I assume, uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this legislation, there will be alternatives offered, and uh, at some point uh, you will decide that, uh, uh, that, that that may be the status quo or that may be radical extreme environmentalism. You, you, will, you will make your decisions and your conclusions, but, uh, and we, but we, we simply will not, we, we, we have no ability to deny people to articulate uh, uh, their, their, their conclusions after, after reading uh, the proposals of legislation and as, as amendments are, uh, are offered. And I, I think that, that uh, it, is, it is very fair to say that this is the repeal of the Endangered Species Act. This is a much different approach. Whether or not it will protect the species, we will start to hear from today and this committee will have to decide and again people will have to arrive at the conclusion. I do not believe that it will. I, I, I think there's such huge inconsistencies in this legislation uh, between the protection of species and how, and, and, and how you would achieve it, that it's, that it's impossible to believe that this, that this legislation leads you uh, to, to, uh, uh, that, uh, to, to, to the conclusion that this legislation could wear the mantle of the Endangered Species Act as it is commonly known uh, in, the, uh, in the United States of America and as it's been embraced by the, uh, uh, by the American public. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Vento. Mr. Chairman, I have an opening statement. I ask unanimous consent to give an opening statement, I guess. The, Without objection. The new procedure here. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, obviously very concerned about the direction and the, that has been uh, put forth in the, uh, the measure and that's going to be testified today by the, the administration and other uh, witnesses, H.R. 2275, earlier this year. I uh, enlisted uh, 130 sponsors on a bipartisan basis and in signing a letter to Chairman Young and uh, Ranking Member Miller uh, concerning the, uh, the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act has been a success, and uh, it has been a great success. It's one of the strongest uh, environmental and, uh, and uh, uh, public policy laws concerning conservation. Uh, which relates uh, uh, not only uh, within the, our nation, but on an international basis in terms of uh, trying to provide the type of leadership that will, in, in fact, uh, preserve uh, uh, biodiversity, which I think uh, all of us should recognize as being enormously important to our, our future on, on Earth. The fact is, though, that this, uh, this letter uh, put forth in general terms some, some specific concerns. I'm not uh, portraying and would not portray that 
most of the legislation that, uh, that, uh, and laws that we have are perfect. We haven't quite worked ourselves out of a job yet. Uh, but the fact is that uh, I think the, the essence of uh, good legislation is to preserve the, the success and what works and then to, uh, to modify it so that it can accommodate and deal with some of the problems that have occurred. We had failed in that and the reauthorization of that has not gone forward because of the polarized views uh, concerning uh, some of the issues. But as I look at the major mark that's been put forth uh, by yourself, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chairman Young, I see uh, many problems with it. I, I feel that it retreats, it steps back, it denies uh, uh, the, to, to engage the, uh, the issues and problems that we have. I mean, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, this would cause the Secretary to uh, choose between extinction or, or pr by prohibiting killing and not preparing a conservation plan. And I just think that that lends itself to campaigns for the most visible of, uh, of species while uh, many of the others uh, would be left behind because they can't attain that type of visibility. I think it invites and enlists politics over, over the, the science of what should go on. It eliminates mandatory protection and provides discretion for various, uh, uh, various individuals when we have a state and local government uh, uh, agreements that are required in landowners. Uh, so it steps back from that. Do we have a problem with private property? Do we have a problem with state and local governments? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you uh, highlighted as an example uh, the bio biodiversity reserves, apparently you're, you think that that or feel that that's a major element that's going to help. Well, that provides protection in parks, wildlife refuge, wilderness areas, and portions of wild and scenic rivers. Well, I would suggest that those are probably exactly the areas where, it's, uh, where there really isn't as much of a problem. I think we can attain success rather easily there, but then you lessen protection on other public lands and, of course, provide no protection on private lands as, of course, the, the current interpretation of law uh, does provide under a Supreme Court uh, decision. So again, it backs up and takes an easy path here, but it really isn't coming engaged. You say we have to pay uh, significant amounts of money. In other words, uh, the taxpayer will have to fork over uh, with, the, with, the, with the prospect of inappropriate action if money is not forthcoming from taxpayers in terms of protection. I think that the, the better judgment here in terms of balance is to recognize uh, some responsibility that we all have that uh, that uh, with regards to, to property and with regards to our responsibility as, uh, as citizens. On the international basis, again, we step back. I think the United States and, and many other nations have been leaders in terms of uh, biodiversity and the importation of various products. Uh, by, uh, by force of the marketplace, we can have a tremendous effect in terms of, uh, in terms of what has happened and what is happening. Uh, in other continents and other places where we have, I think, a real concern and interest on an international basis, yet this steps back from that and gives a veto power, in essence, it's my understanding, veto power to the nation or to the place or the locale that uh, is, act, uh, in, a, in essence, uh, doing this. Furthermore, of course, the, the, it eliminates uh, Endangered Species Act protection for sea turtles, many types of marine mammals, many types of mammals that would be incidental simply to uh, uh, to catching uh, to in terms of fish, and, for, and this I interpret as being the dolphin and the tuna type of thing. It provides special interest exemptions uh, for shrimpers and oil companies and others in the, uh, in the economic zones, the 200-mile area, and I just think that that's the wrong way to go. We went through a lot, of, uh, a lot of debate and a lot of decisions that have been made, and I think it's a recognition on the part of the public generally of the importance of this. Mr. Chairman, I think that that you have, uh, that this, uh, this particular product that is being put forth as a solution is very flawed. Uh, I think that there is a strong, uh, a strong support uh, in the general public, as a matter of fact. I've been very pleased to find very strong support and interest in this and public perception of endangered species, all the way from uh, elementary kids uh, through, the, through any parts of our society. There is a big interest in this particular issue, and I'd hope that, uh, while I think that this is a flawed approach and start, I hope that when we get done, we can that more reasoned, uh, reasoned approaches uh, will prevail. I've been disappointed with uh, the hearings and the, the tenor of the hearings. And the fact is, uh, uh, I wouldn't hold it up uh, as a scientific model. If this is science, I guess uh, we could say that the idea of, ref of the idea of the Inquisition was good religion. Uh, and uh, I, I think probably uh, that's not the case. So I hope that, uh, that uh, we can see a change in the tenor and work together on the, the problems that uh, address this. I'd like to call up the first panel of witnesses, um, Mr. George Frampton, Assistant Secretary of Fish and Wildlife in Parks Department of the Interior, Dr. Milan Ledeek, 
Ministry of Environment and Tourism, Senator Drew Pierce, President, Alaska Senate, State Senate. Thank you for joining us, and we are using the, the lights in front of you. Uh, your opening statement will be limited. Your oral statement will be limited to five minutes. Uh, your entire statement will be included in the record. Uh, when you see the yellow light, um, you have 30 seconds remaining. The red light is it's time to quit, and we're going to try to keep it to that if possible. So, Mr. Frampton, you may begin. Mr. Chairman. Pass on. Mr. Chairman, the Endangered Species Act is completely broken and needs a major overhaul. That's obviously your view and the view of at least some of the co-sponsors of the bill you and Mr. Young, Chairman Young, have introduced uh, if it takes a 156-page printed bill to reauthorize this act. The administration fundamentally disagrees. We think, many other people in this country, I think including the, uh, the uh, a scientific community believe that the Endangered Species Act is a, is a core component of the country's environmental protection program, that it's worked uh, pretty well, had some major successes. There's some things it doesn't do as well as it might for species. There are definitely some problems in the impact of the act, potential and actual impact on the regulated public, especially private landowners. These problems can be fixed. We are fixing some of them by trying to administer this act in the last two and a half years in a very different way. New policies, new regulations. There are other things that need to be done through statutory changes. We've identified most of those, uh, most of those things. We can fix the problems with the act. My point, Mr. Chairman, is that while there is some disagreement about little bits of fixes and more fixes, I think it is fair to say that those who genuinely want to see this act survive and want to see it work better, better for the regulated public, better for species, more or less agree. There's broad agreement on the areas that need to be addressed. And I think it's easy to say what those are. Ensure the use of good science. That's the first postulate of the Republican policy statement on the Endangered Species Act. Uh, make sure the listing process works right, there's a, the right standard, we have peer review, good decision-making process. Relief for homeowners and small private landowners in most cases for most species. We don't need their property for recovery, uh, full recovery of species. With respect to large landowners, try to focus on voluntary multi-species agreements because it's that approach that gives them more flexibility and more certainty and is better for the species recovery. Include states and local governments more than we're doing. Provide for safe harbor and incentive provisions and have better recovery planning, which includes better consideration of socioeconomic impacts and more involvement in the part of states and other stakeholders. Those are the things we need to do. But this bill, Mr. Chairman, does not do those things. In our view, it does not chart a constructive path to reauthorization. Now, there have been statements made in the last week that this bill, your bill, Chairman Young's bill, effectively repeals the Endangered Species Act. I don't agree with that at all. The problem with your bill is that it ineffectively repeals the Endangered Species Act. <laughs> it creates tremendous opportunities for uh, wheel spinning. You said you wanted to cut down on paperwork and bureaucracy. This quadruples it. This is a litigating lawyer's dream. As a former litigating lawyer, I can tell you that. It, it, you know, it'll take decades to resolve some of the inconsistencies in this act, and it doesn't even allow us to try to take steps that we're taking under current law and policy to keep species off the list. It forbids that. Congressman Tozan challenged us to be specific. Let me take a minute to be specific. This bill doesn't honor sound science. It repudiates it. The latest National Academy of Sciences report makes it clear that protecting species is about protecting habitat. But this bill eliminates private habitat, all private habitat. It shrinks by 70 or 80 or 90 percent the amount of federal land habitat that is, can be managed to protect species. And it creates brand new disincentives, perverse incentives to destroy habitat. 
in the period between the time when a species is listed and a final plan is adopted. There's no impetus here to do multi-species planning, so certainty is reduced. Uh, the bill has virtually nothing from the Western Governors Association uh, proposals for partnerships between the states and the federal government. It removes the obligation of federal agencies to try to run their programs to avoid extinction, which has been the most successful and efficient uh, part of the Endangered Species Act. The compensation provisions alone make it very difficult to administer the act. On the international front, it would allow virtually any poacher or illegal wildlife taker to import into this country, but prevent probably U.S. businesses that currently can get permits to export CITES listed uh, products like alligator skins to other countries. And finally, uh, by uh, disqualifying taking off the list population-based species, a vote for this bill is a vote to take off the Endangered Species Act, the bald eagle, the grizzly bear, the wolf, the California sea otter, the Florida panther, the peregrine falcon, and sea turtles, among others. Now, just let me conclude by saying that there have been processes in the last eight months that have been very constructive. The administration introduced a 10-point plan. You and I, Mr. Chairman, talked to the tim timber industry executive several months ago. I heard you say that, you know, our plan has a lot of good stuff in it. You'd put it in, our, with the exception of the small landowner exemption, you didn't like that. You'd put it in your bill. Uh, it's not in the bill. I can understand why you wouldn't want to take the administration's plan, but there have been other processes that have also developed good building blocks for constructive reauthorization. The Western Governors Association has been working for eight months with the international, the state fish and game agencies. We've worked with them. A lot of common ground there. We tried to find common ground. Uh, Governor uh, uh, Roscoe, Mark Roscoe from Montana, uh, Mike Levitt from Utah, Republican Western governors, they're not environmental extremists. Uh, you know, they've told you what the states want, but very little of that's in here. The Keystone Initiative, the National Academy of Sciences, uh, the, the building blocks for a constructive reform of the Endangered Species Act are out there, but we don't think your bill incorporates any of those constructive building blocks. And the plea I would make to you, I guess, on behalf of the administration is, we need a path to get this done in this Congress. There isn't a constituency in the Congress or the country for repeal. I don't think a bill like this can pass both houses of Congress and get signed by the President. If all we have is this kind of bill on the one side and the people who say, let's tighten down the screws, then we've got gridlock. We're not going to move forward. We're not going to have a, cons we're not there's no path. We're going to end up two years from now with the existing Endangered Species Act, less money, more problems, and, and no progress and no reform. That's not where we're coming from. The administration wants to support practical centrist reform, fix the problems, improve the act for species and the regulated public. Uh, We've got to find a vehicle to move forward on that. We'll support such a vehicle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will avoid making a comment at this time and wait until the question and answer period. Dr. Linda Q, you may proceed. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to give evidence at this hearing. I represent the Minister of Environment and Tourism of Namibia and appear on behalf of a group of Southern African nations. Uh, next to me is my colleague Stephen Kasseri of Campfire in Zimbabwe, who testified earlier before a Senate committee on the same issues. We have submitted our detailed views in a written statement that, are, that I request to be made part of this of the record. Um, also, I would like to present supporting statements from 16 other organizations. I will summarize our views very briefly. Most of the provisions in H.R. 2275 concern regulatory actions affecting species and persons within the United States. We see it as, as inappropriate for foreign nations to express an opinion about U.S. domestic matters, and I will confine my comments to the issue of foreign species. The Southern African governments are very grateful that the bill contains a number of extremely important and beneficial provisions about the treatment of foreign species under the Endangered Species Act. These provisions about foreign species will help African nations and others 
to expand wildlife populations and to retain and expand their habitat. Under the current Act, determinations made by the US government authority about our species have caused great concern to governments in Southern Africa. These concerns have been expressed repeatedly as official protests from us. For example, on the 10th of March, the directors of conservation agencies of Botswana, Malawi, Namibia and Zimbabwe wrote to the chairman of this committee. They expressed their belief that the act is fundamentally flawed as far as foreign species are concerned and undermines our conservation efforts. This was followed by a diplomatic note from the ambassadors of these countries reiterating this concern. The current act is not beneficial to conservation in Southern Africa as it is based upon a fundamental misunderstanding of the essential conservation problem on our continent. In our region, people and wildlife are dependent on the same land. A great diversity of wildlife still occurs outside national parks, and it is this wildlife that we are most concerned about. The most serious conservation problem in Africa is how to maintain this wildlife heritage in the face of increasing demands on land by an essentially poor rural population. We are trying to develop the best possible incentives for people to retain wildlife. And we have to oppose any regulatory method that bestows a competitive disadvantage to wildlife. Such disadvantages, amongst which we have to count barriers to trade and controlled use, will lead to their replacement by livestock and croplands. Our conservation programs also aim to restore the traditional relationship between people and wildlife by converting wildlife from a liability to an asset. The Act assumes that conservation is best accomplished by strict prohibitions on trade and, and use of wildlife. And, and this assumption undermines our approach. Our region has pursued policies which retain the highest possible values on wild species and natural landscapes. Without these values and a competitive contribution from these resources to the development and well-being of our nations, we will not be able to stop the progressive loss, loss of wildlife habitat to other forms of land use. We are grateful to see important improvements in the proposed bill that would address our concerns. Of special interest in the proposed legislation are provisions directing US authorities to cooperate with and support the conservation strategies of foreign nations. We are fully aware that some US organizations consider that these provisions remove the protection given to foreign species by the United States. The proposed bill actually provides a mechanism for the implementing authority to assess various options concerning foreign species, to consult with the relevant governments, and to establish the type of partnership in conservation that we would all like to see. It is of great importance to us that the Endangered Species Act does not have a counterproductive effect on our domestic conservation programs. We cannot afford to subject our long-term conservation programs to the threat of unilateral action by a foreign agency, ostensibly in the interest of protecting our own species. The proposed bill also contains provisions that align the Act with CITES, which we applaud. CITES, or the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, provides the appropriate framework for international cooperation in controlling the use of and trade in wild species. Of particular importance to us is that CITES has established the necessary expertise and the effective mechanisms for collective decision making. Perhaps the most serious problem in the past has been the failure of the implementing agency to consult effectively and meaningfully with foreign governments over conservation measures. Governmental wildlife agencies in Southern Africa, staffed by well-qualified professionals, have their own special competence in developing wildlife management strategies that are suitable for local conditions. Yet under the current Act, US officials are put in a position to second-guess and overrule strategies which have been proven successful in practice. The new provisions in proposed legislation, if enacted, will go a long way towards eliminating the problems that we have had with the way that the existing Act has been applied to foreign species. We urge you to accept the provisions relating to foreign species in the present bill as it stands now, and we sincerely hope that these provisions will become part of an amended Endangered Species Act. On behalf of the Southern African countries involved, and particularly in Namibia, my own, 
I wish to thank this committee for their attention to these problems and their willingness to hear our views. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Doctor. And uh, we, we do deeply appreciate your coming and, uh, and testifying today. Uh, I know the uh, chairman of the full committee would love to be here personally to welcome you, Senator, but uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the president of the Alaska State Senate from Anchorage, Alaska, Senator Drew Pierce. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. My testimony today is presented on behalf of both the Alaska State Senate and also the Alaska State House and the people of Alaska. First, Mr. Chairman, I want to express our sincere appreciation for the de dedication and hard work of the Endangered Species S Task Force, which has been chaired by Congressman Pombo. Speaker Phillips and I both had the opportunity to present testimony to the task force. We hope that the Committee on Resources will utilize the records as they proceed with your deliberations on H.R. 2275. We did make specific recommendations during that testimony, which I'll not be repeating today. I want to make it clear that the Alaska Legislature does not advocate the dismantling of the Endangered Species Act. The Act, however, has been effectively used by Federal agencies and extreme environmental organizations as a weapon and not as a tool of conservation. Rigid and revisionary interpretations of the law by the Federal courts have effectively tied the hands of Federal, but most importantly, State agencies. We do have a few constructive comments we'd like to make about some of the new <coughs> concepts included in the bill before you and essential items that were excluded. First, the def definition of species. The Alaska Legislature strongly supports your efforts to redefine species under the Act. From our perspective, the definition of species and the misinterpretation and implementation of this portion of the law by the Federal agencies is the single biggest problem with the Act. Although we support the concept of requiring congressional approval for listing of a population segment, we would strongly recommend that distinct population segments be dropped from the Act. Second, the consultation process. We agree with the approach to allow non-federal persons to use the consultation procedures in Section 10. We also strongly recommend that an amendment be considered that would allow states to participate in the Section 7 consultation process. It is frequently not advantageous for a cooperative agency with concurrent jurisdiction to utilize the process outlined in <coughs> Section 10. Third, the Federal Biological Diversity Reserves. Mr. Chairman, we have to respectf respectfully oppose the creation of a new system of Federal Biological Diversity Reserves. We urge Congress not to mix biodiversity management with the listing and recovery of endangered species. Although we do agree that proper implementation of biodiversity concepts and good conservation practices should avoid species listings, integrating biodiversity management with the ESA results in a frightening expansion of agency authorities under the ESA. Biodiversity management principles should be debated separately on their own merits and not mixed in to this reauthorization. We are very strongly opposed to yet a the, the creation of yet another overlapping classification for national conservation systems in Alaska. Our state is already blessed with 68 percent of all National Park Service lands, 85 percent of all Fish and Wildlife Service refuge lands, and 60 percent of all wilderness acreage. When these areas and the chairman has told you many times, I will repeat it, totaling almost 130 million acres were created in 1980. Congress established major use exceptions to accommodate traditional Alaskan uses and to provide for compatible development of some natural resources. Alaskans witness every day the loss of many of these privileges due to the overly restrictive policies of the federal agencies who seem to totally disregard the needs of Alaskans and the guarantees that were provided to us by Congress. We are concerned that overlaying national park status with wilderness designation coupled with biological diversity reserve status would virtually guarantee the most restrictive <coughs> management possible at the expense of many Alaskans. Conservation goals. 
We strongly applaud the provisions which authorize the selection of an appropriate conservation objective for each listed species. One of the greatest difficulties arising from existing law is the judicially established mandate that each listed species is to be fully recovered regardless of cost or consequences. Greater role of the states. We concur, I don't think it's surprising, with the importance this committee has placed on elevating the role of the states in the implementation of the Endangered Species Act. We do, however, believe that states should be exempt from the provisions of the Federal Advisory Committee Act pertaining to the ESA and should have a more meaningful role in the listing, delisting, and recovery process. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, we would be negligent if we did not formally recognize that there have been some positive changes initiated by Secretary Babbitt towards his agency's implementation of the Endangered Species Act. The cr problem is, quite frankly, that the Secretary and the Federal agencies have offered many of these revolutionary changes only after Congress and this task force and the public have threatened a major overhaul of the Act. Some of the policies adopted by the Secretary should be considered for inclusion in this rewrite of the ESA. We are, however, adamant that Congress should precisely spell out its intent in the revision of the Act. Secretarial actions cannot overcome faulty court interpretations of the Act, which have hampered effective implementation of the law. It is also safe to say that after 20 years of intolerance and indifference towards the public and cooperating state agencies, the public, the states, and certainly Alaskans do not trust the federal agencies to maintain a cooperative attitude in the implementation of the Endangered Species Act. A true partnership between federal, state, and private landowners is essential. A true Endangered Species Act partnership will never occur unless Cong Congress clearly mandates the conditions and the role of each of the parti participants in the partnership. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you again for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the Alaska Legislature and all of the Alaskans who we represent. I have offered to you an honest critique of H.R. 2275 from Alaska's perspective. We hope our suggestions and comments here will prove helpful in your deliberations. We stand ready to assist you in any way we can in this momentous effort. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It was indeed an honest critique, and we appreciate it. Uh, the, the chair will now recognize the ranking minority member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Studs, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I really don't have questions. What I would like to do with whatever time I have, I may, is if Mr. Frampton, if you would like additional time to elaborate, obviously we're coming from roughly the same place in our assessment of the bill before us and in our understanding or our appreciation of where we think <coughs> we ought to be going. I know that you were rushed. I know you had far lengthier testimony. If there are any other specifics um, with regard to either ways in which you acknowledge that the Act needs some fixing and that you would ask us to direct our attention to, or any other uh, observations, uh, friendly or otherwise, that you'd like to make, I'd be happy to give you some of my time. Uh, thank you, Congressman Studs. I, I just, I guess, reiterate that uh, the administration has tried to work closely in a number of these processes which I think have uh, produced pieces of what could hopefully be a practical, centrist reform reauthorization in this Congress. Uh, we worked very hard uh, with the state fish and wildlife agencies and the Western Governors Association to look at how we involve state and local governments, how we uh, would uh, use legislative changes to try to make, uh, to streamline the act and make it easier to do the kinds of things that uh, we're doing in Southern California uh, and in the Southeast and in the Northwest with timber companies and with local governments to do multi-species planning, how we would reshape the act to make that easier. Uh, we worked uh, participated in the Keystone uh, inst Institute process to look at uh, incentives and safe harbor provisions. A and we think that there is out there and hope that there will be incorporated in, in other legislation that's introduced uh, in the near future in both houses, uh, provisions that uh, the governors like, the administration likes, 
the scientific community likes, the local elected officials like. Uh, there, there is, surprisingly, given the level of heat in the debate about the Endangered Species Act, uh, surprisingly, there is a lot of common ground about what needs to be done to fix and make more effective this statute. A lot more than I would have predicted and many others, I think, would have predicted two years ago. And we found a lot of that common ground. It's out there. It's out there in the WGA bill and the Keystone report and, the, and our 10-point plan, which I think is, re represents significant proposals for change. There, you know, the shape of a bill that can win a very broad consensus support to take this, to, to, to take this act forward is out there. We just need, and, and we'll support it, we just need to seize the opportunity uh, to do that. The, the, the bill we have before us today is far from common ground. And, and we hope that uh, since there is a common interest in trying to move this forward instead of had gridlock, that somehow we can, you know, we can, we can come to common ground here in both houses in the next month or so and move something forward that uh, not everybody's going to like and nobody may like entirely, but which can win pretty broad support. It'll have some significant changes in the act. Uh, it'll have some compromises. It'll make it work better for species and a lot better for the regulated public. That, that the shape of that bill is out there if, if we can find the right vehicle and the right process uh, to move it forward. And, and there, are things, there are things in this bill, in, in the uh, Pombo uh, Young bill, uh, you know, that uh, are, are good. I mean, the, the emphasis on trying to structure uh, uh, voluntary agreements with landowners is, is very important. The problem is that there are other parts of the bill that disable that. Uh, I was looking at the bill from the point of view of whether under this bill we could do what we did this spring with the Plum Creek t uh, Timber Company, the largest private landowner in Montana, the state, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and the county entered into an agreement to manage Plum Creek and state and Forest Service lands for grizzly bears. I mean, that's a, everybody wins under that agreement. We couldn't do that under this bill because a, a landowner with five acres could threaten a compensation suit and bring that to a halt for five years. So there are good things in this bill, but there are other things in it that disable the good things. And, and we need to be careful as we move forward uh, to make fixes that we don't do things that, you know, disable other important fixes. Let me just conclude by observing that around every, and all of us who've been in this business for a while know this, around every issue of, of, of substance and, 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 and consequence, there are many voices. There are always very shrill voices. And they're easy to hear. What's much more difficult to hear sometimes is, is the very quiet, broad consensus out there of just plain people who genuinely understand and support something. In this case, I fear that it is the th shrill voices that have been heard and not the uh, the voice of the land, which I think is very understanding. And I just want to com end by commending you and, and Secretary Babbitt, whom I think, uh, contrary to something which the distinguished senator from Alaska said a moment ago, I think have been, I hate the word, but proactive. I, Secretary Babbitt was in my office uh, three years ago before he was confirmed, uh, saying, what can we do to get to good science and make this thing work? That is a re refreshing and altogether appropriate attitude on the part of the chief steward of this nation's resources. And I commend you and him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. It's time to expire. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Pombo, and the author of the bill. Thank you. Mr. Frampton, in your opening statement, you said, before I get to that, I, I got to say, I knew no matter what we came up with, you were going to oppose it. I knew from the very beginning that we were going to gut the Endangered Species Act, and regardless of what we did, if we changed one word in it, that the rhetoric was going to be the same. I made the attempt from the very beginning to work with you and other people in, in fish and wildlife and in this administration to come up with ideas and ways to do that. About 90 percent of the stuff that you guys brought to me is in the bill. And it was ideas that, that you talk about so eloquently in trying to get private property owners to work to protect habitat and to encourage <coughs> them to do that instead of always coming down with the heavy hand of the federal government on them. I mean, those were the things that we tried to do, that the ways that we tried to go about coming up with a balanced approach 
to protecting endangered species. It was said in one of the opening statements of, of one of the minority members that this is a new approach. And it is a new approach. Everybody likes to, to go into this debate looking at, at this issue from inside the box of the current Endangered Species Act. Everybody's afraid to stick their toe outside of the Endangered Species Act, outside of that box, because they're afraid that they may anger some constituency or anger someone that's out there. Well, no, I think it's time we got outside of the box and looked at a new approach. And that is a cooperative management approach, a cooperative agreement between those that are being regulated and the regulators, and getting outside of the box that currently exists. And until you take this from that new approach, we won't see eye to eye on this. You really do have to look at it from outside the box. Because the current Endangered Species Act, contrary to what's been said here already this morning, is not working. And if anybody took the time to go out and actually talk to the people that are being regulated by this, they'd understand why it's not working. People are destroying habitat so they don't become habitat for an endangered species. People are destroying the ability of wildlife to, to live on their ranches and on their farms because they are terrified that an, an endangered species is going to be found on their property and they're going to lose the right to, to farm or ranch their property. That is the reality of what we're doing. Now, inside the Beltway, inside all of these fancy offices back here, we may not realize that, but that's what's happening in the real world. And until we look at this from a realistic approach, we're never going to agree. And we have to get outside the box and look at a new way of approaching that. In your opening statement, you said 70, 80, 90 percent of the federal land would be left unprotected. Currently, 35 to 40 percent of the federally owned land is held with the conservation easement, is held within the national parks, is held within the wilderness areas, is held within the wild and scenic rivers. Those are the areas that we're looking at to establish biodiversity reserves. When the conservation biologists came to me, I asked them, what is the one thing that, that you really want out of this? What, what, what do you want to achieve? They said they wanted to protect biodiversity because they didn't know where it was going to go. They didn't know what all the answers were. The best conservation biologists in the country told me they don't know what the answer is. They don't know what's going to happen. That the one thing that we had to do was try to establish a series of biodiversity reserves across the country that could protect that biodiversity. Everybody realizes that it's a futile effort to try to say each and every single subspecies and, and unique population segment and, and everything across the country. They know that we'll spend money and not be able to do that. <coughs> but the reality of it is we have to look at the scarce conservation dollars that we have and try to develop a system of protecting biodiversity, of saving wildlife, of protecting endangered species. That's what we need to do. That's what this act is. If you want to come to me with your criticisms of the act and say, if we change this, it would work better. If we change this scientific model, it would work better. I'd be more than happy to work with you. And I know that the members on this committee would be happy to work with you to achieve that goal. Because we want an act that works. That's what we're trying to do. And in, and in regards to foreign species, it, you know, I found this quite, quite ironic that through this entire debate, over the past eight months that we've been going through on foreign species, I had a group of, of wildlife managers from a number of different countries that have come to see me over the past eight months. And it was very interesting to hear them talk about the way they felt the United States treated their country, that they didn't care about wildlife, that they didn't care about what was happening with their wildlife in their countries. And if it sounded exactly like one of our hearings out west. It sounded exactly the way that the people in, in the western United States feel about the, Washington, D.C. They were saying the same things, that they were being dictated to from inside the beltway, from people who really didn't understand what was going on in their country, who really didn't understand that they valued the wildlife in their countries, and they were trying to do what they could to protect that wildlife and to put a value on it so that they could achieve their conservation goals. Okay. Those are the kind of things we want to foster, not just with the Western United States, but with the rest of the world. If that doesn't work perfectly, we can work on that language. But I am not going to dictate to every country in the world 
what somebody inside the Beltway of Washington thinks is a good conservation goal. Thank you. Uh, excellent set of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do I get yeah. five minutes or, <laughs> or one minute to respond? <laughs> we, uh, we actually have to move along. Mr. You'll get a chance to another question. Uh, we've been called to the floor, but we're going to go ahead with one more round of questions. Uh, recognize uh, the ranking minority member of the committee, Mr. Miller. Why don't you go ahead, go ahead and respond for a minute on my time, and then I'll, I'll ask you a short question. because it's. On. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Mr. Pombo, I, I do honestly think that we have been, we in the administration have been outside the box for the last two years. We have to administer this act. It has problems. We, we, we've tried to, to, to really work a quiet revolution in how we've administered this act. We've identified things that need to be done through legislative change to take that further. And as I said, I think there's broad agreement among other people like Western governors about significant changes that need to be made. We're not saying this act doesn't have to be changed. We're not standing on the status quo, and we haven't. But I don't think that you have an effective reform program by stepping out of the box and then throwing away most of the tools that are in the box. The principal tools of this act are, first, <laughs> the obligation on other government agencies to run their programs to try to avoid extinction of species. Very efficient, saves a lot of money. It's been very successful. That's eliminated in your bill. Those agencies don't have to do anything they don't want to do. Second tool is habitat protection on public lands. We use the public land base in an appropriate way first. Subs more than half, whether it's 60, 70, or 80 percent of that base is removed for in your bill. Third, last, we look to some contribution from private landowners for habitat protection. That's out of your bill. You know, Fourth, we try to structure incentives or remove perverse incentives so that we can have some kind of uh, uh, pressures other than regulation on people to preserve habitat. There's some real problems with the existing law. This bill, in our view, exacerbates those perverse incentives. Those are the principal tools that, that I would argue to you are thrown away, and you're left with a very, very small toolbox in this bill. Now, briefly on the international uh, front, uh, I think it's important that you talk to United States wildlife managers in this country and ask them whether they honestly think that this bill would cripple our involvement in CITES and, and international efforts to protect endangered species. And, and I would warrant you that 90% will tell you uh, that, it do, that, that it does. And I think it's ironic that, you know, six weeks ago, Speaker Gingrich went to the floor of the House to protect our, our miserable small program for rhinos and tigers, you know, our budget for next year for this Fish and Wildlife Service budget, and this bill guts that program. It, it lets other countries dictate to us. So ask U.S. wildlife managers what they think of that. That's relevant, too, it seems. Mr. To me. Mr. Uh, Secretary Frampton, let me, let me, if I might, just ask you a question that I think of concern and certainly the community I represent, which is a, a high-growth, mainly suburban district. And that is, I think if I, uh, uh, well, a lot of home builders and developers and others are deeply concerned about the Endangered Species Act and, and its impact on, on their businesses and the price of their product and, and all the anecdotal uh, material that we hear. Uh, I think if I read them, the, the bill that's before this, they wouldn't agree with the results because they have their stronger beliefs about the purpose and the goals of the Endangered Species Act. One of the things that constantly is brought home is the question of, of getting, getting some certainty into, into the Act and, and getting a resolution of disputes, but also getting some resolution of something here in, 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 the, uh, in the Congress. And I think, I think you're quite right, and I think Mr. Studd said it quite correctly, that there is a very broad area of common ground out there about uh, uh, the intent and purposes of this Act and trying to make it, trying to make it work better. One of my concerns is that we will just add to the number of years here uh, in which Congress will not resolve these things that needed to be resolved if, we, if, 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 we, if, if this bill, which apparently you and the administration have very, very strong objections to, we end up at the end of the year with no work product because of a veto or because of it's just unacceptable, as I believe it will be eventually, to, to, to the Congress, and then we're kind of back in, we're back in the other box of, of not having the certainty brought to this, this program. 
Well, I, you know, I, I just want to say that we are, we are for moving this, we're for reform, we're for moving forward. There are real positive changes that can be made. The administration is not embarked on some strategy of delay or deception or hoping that nothing happens this year or next year. We would like to see this act changed, improved, reformed. We'd like to get on with it. And we need to find a dynamic that allows us to have a vehicle that incorporates a lot of that common ground. Otherwise, we're going to end up, as I said, a year and a half or two years from now with the existing act, and we're going to be in a worse situation than we are today. Thank you. The uh, committee will stand in recess, and we ask our guests to, uh, we have two votes in the row, so we'll be, we'll be in recess until after that second vote. I ask members to return as quickly as possible and ask our guests if you can, uh, if you can make yourself comfortable until we get back. Thank you very much. We'll continue with this hearing in a few minutes. First, some programming information. Today on our companion network, C-SPAN, campaign financing, a discussion on regulations, the issue of soft money, and 1996 campaign funding. The forum is hosted by George Washington University's Graduate School of Political Management. We'll have live coverage tonight on C-SPAN at 7.10 p.m. Eastern Time. Also today on C-SPAN, coverage from the 1995 Hispanic Heritage Leadership Conference. You'll see a forum on affirmative action and set-asides. Our live coverage on our companion network C-SPAN begins at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 7.30 Pacific. We now continue with the House hearing on rewriting the Endangered Species Act. The 22-year-old bill requires the government to do everything it can to save all species from extinction. The hearing is chaired by Congressman Don Young of Alaska. We're going to call the hearing back to order. And at this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Saxton. I thank the uh, chairman for, uh, for recognizing me. You might be interested to know uh, that on the way back from uh, this last vote, Mr. Tozan and Mr. Pombo and I were walking along together. Mr. Tozan, who's the great mediator, recognized that Mr. Pombo and I have some differences. And he said, why don't you guys get together and settle your differences? At which point Richie remarked, as long as Saxon agrees with me, there'll be no problem. So. <laughs> we're closing. We're closing in. We're closing in. Let me ask you a question along the same line, uh, uh, Mr. Frampton. Uh, uh, during the uh, testimony of uh, the senator from Alaska, uh, my, my aide brought this uh, spreadsheet down to you. And I'm interested in finding some common ground with the administration and with we've got to solve this problem. And uh, we put this together in my shop uh, primarily to uh, be able to, at a relatively easy, in a relatively easy fashion to uh, compare and contrast uh, the different versions. We've got the, we've got current law, we've got uh, Mr. Young, Mr. Pombo's bill, we've got Mr. Gilchrist's bill, who was uh, here just a few minutes ago, who has worked exceedingly hard uh, putting together uh, a bill that may be quite similar to mine, and, and then of course my bill. <clears throat> and I might say, <clears throat> my bill, you know, I don't take any real pride of authorship, but most of my bill is fashioned after the Western Governor's uh, association um, uh, version and uh, which which I looked at and thought it was quite good we made some changes but anyway my question is this how can we find some common ground uh, I guess this question goes more to the process than the content at this point because uh, obviously we need to do something uh, this is a this is a process that we need to all be involved in um, I don't think that I have particular pride of authorship I know that you're I know the administration has ten points and uh, what do you suggest that we do in order to, um, to provide some kind of a forum, or some kind of a process where we can get together and, and, and end up with an Endangered Species Act that works that we can all live with? Well, Congressman Saxton, you know, this is uh, uh, your process. Uh, and I guess all I can say is that we're, you know, willing to come to the table anywhere in any way that uh, uh, the committee uh, leadership or uh, committee members or uh, 
you know, whatever role you want us to play, uh, we'd like to to uh, be there. I mean, I think that, uh, as I understand it, for one of your, for example, uh, major uh, components of your bill would, uh, you, as you described it uh, earlier, would uh, set up a system where we try to make recovery planning more effective by uh, incorporating the so-called critical habitat or similar judgments, put that back into the recovery planning, make it more of a cooperative process where the state uh, wants to take the lead in developing the recovery plan, uh, both in the WGA proposal and in our 10-point plan. We propose that the secretary delegate the lead uh, to the state. Ultimately, the secretary would have to approve. Uh, there would be a more explicit requirement, I guess, than current law that socioeconomic, you know, impacts be minimized. I mean, there's a big area of common ground between the administration, WGA, and, and your, your description of your bill. I think there are a lot of other areas. Uh, but we're ready to, you know, we're ready to uh, do whatever you feel would be constructive to try to see if we can't uh, develop a vehicle that uh, the administration could support or largely support that would be bipartisan and then could actually, you know, move to the House floor and, and command a large majority. Well, I for one and <clears throat> I for one and I know other uh, members uh, from uh, this side uh, are looking for, for that common ground. We want and I want and I think I can say that we want an Endangered Species Act that works. Uh, we recognize uh, that there's a very strong role here for the administration to play during the process of reauthorization as well as after. And uh, therefore, um, you know, I invite you, uh, perhaps we can do it on the staff level, maybe a good place to start would be to, to add whatever your version looks like to this spreadsheet. And then we've got uh, five alternative potential plans to look at. And we can begin to sort through the differences and find that uh, commonality that's so important to form a consensus uh, so that we can move forward together. And uh, I'd, be, I'd be delighted, uh, Mr. Chairman, to, to play a role with you uh, in that process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vinto. Uh, Mr. Uh, Frampton, uh, I was just looking at some of the testimony ahead here and it said uh, uh, the, uh, Mr. Bean, and I think it is very insightful that uh, the, the issue here would be that the in order to continue on the successful path toward recovery of the bald eagle, example, the secretary under this new uh, this proposed bill must determine that it is in the national interest to do so, uh, seek congressional concurrence with the determination, invite 48 governors and nearly 1,500 county governments to nominate representatives to serve as assessment team, appoint an assessment team with the potential uh, potentially in excess of 1,000 members, review the t review the team's assessment, determine a conservation objective for the eagle and replace the existing successful recovery, plan, recovery plans for the Eagle with a new conservation plan, all of which must be done in 18 months while they simultaneously carrying out similar requirements for several hundred other species. Did you uh, participate in this with, uh, with uh, my colleagues in terms of drafting this particular provision? <laughs> no, I saw it yesterday for the first time, Congressman Vento. Uh, it, it, uh, actually made it more uh, sort of uh, vivid to me what would be required to try to put the eagle, the grizzly bear, the peregrine falcon, uh, the Florida panther, and other species that are populations. They're listed as populations, but they may be biologically, scientifically very important. Well, uh, difficult would be to put them back on the list. Yeah, well, that's right. They have to, in order to keep them on the list, and some would argue that the bald eagle doesn't belong on the list. I don't know, but I mean, I just think it's sort of vivid, I think, because it does illustrate what you'd have to go through or be subject to a challenge, I guess. Uh, uh, there, are, there are all kinds of problems. I mean, um, it's my understanding that most of the, in the exclusive economic zones, the so-called EECs, that today certain activities take place that have uh, uh, incidental taking occurs there, for instance, with marine mammals that might be an endangered or threatened uh, list, and that oil activities, other types of activities in terms of fishing, uh, netting, and so forth, require certain activities uh, that, uh, that must take place to avoid incidental taking. Now, it's my understanding that the bill before us 
uh, simply excuses those activities. In other words, it does not, uh, does not involve uh, uh, that if that occurs that there is no regulation or action that is uh, permitted. Is that correct? Well, I, I would stand corrected by Chairman Pombo as to his interpretation of the bill. The way I read it is that I believe it's non-fish uh, marine mammals in that offshore zone like well, manatees that would be sea and turtles whales, and sea turtles and manatees. Sea turtles, and, right. Uh, the, the, and there dolphins. isn't the, the take provisions are fundamentally uh, removed from the act. So that if you're a you're a manatee or a whale, you know you better learn to stay more than 200 miles from the shore, or you're in trouble. That's the way I read uh, it. Well, I, that's the way I read it too. But uh, what would, would prevent? Would you uh, well, yield I yield just on that. Yeah, I would just for a moment. Yeah. Uh, are not those animals protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act that, that you just named off? I don't know that they're protected from uh, sea turtles, not at all, but I don't know that they're protected from uh, the kinds Whales, of impacts manatees. that we currently uh, try to prevent from oil drilling or motorboats uh, flaying manatees, those kinds of things we wouldn't be able to reach at all. Well, that's, that's under, fair, under, under that's a fair point. This so bill, so through the consultation, you cannot do that now? I don't know that the Marine Mammal Protection Act well, maybe would give us. I, I just don't I think know. There, there's some would give us any authority that's your to deal with boats or or oil or oil rigs? If that's the administration's I opinion, I'm, I'm sure there's some people who'd be very interested in that new interpretation. Well, I, I'm saying I don't. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't respond to the well, question. Let me, let me respond I mean, to the I, question of marine mammal protection. But obviously, marine Act, mammals don't apply to, to sea turtles and other types of species that are non non-mammals. So, I mean, I don't think that, you know, so there, that's an important, it's an important issue, but uh, uh, this is also the interpretation, I might say, of others that are going to be testifying, so there'll be plenty of opportunity to discuss this. One of the provisions I noticed that, uh, uh, that uh, there is, a, in other words, any animal that's in captive breeding, uh, in other words, restrictions would not be put in place in terms of those captive breed uh, bred animals uh, abroad. For instance, uh, uh, the under, my understanding is that this legislation uh, would not prevent anyone from importing, for instance, captive-bred uh, types of Siberian tigers and so forth. Could be brought here for various types of events, like uh, which would be destruction, like a hunting activity. Is that your understanding of this, Mr. Frampton? That's my understanding. I think the bill relies very heavily on captive breeding, captive propagation. Well, I think that's for uh, other a number purposes, of different but this ways. is, a, this is a, I mean, I understand that this uh, maintenance in a zoo rather than in a natural habitat is a provision I read, too, as an interpretation of this bill. Uh, that's another thing, I think, that has to be defended, that we're sort of, uh, that there is a, a, a less of reliance on a natural environment. Most of the time when these captive breeding programs had gone on, I noticed there was some mention about the peregrine falcon or the condors, obviously, or another example, the California condor. They're really done in association with maintaining the, the habitat as well for final release. The objective is to have them occur naturally in the, in, the, uh, in the environment or in that ecosystem or that habitat. Is that correct? Well, that's correct. They're, they're a component of a program, but you still need the habitat. And the National Academy looked at this issue and others have found that it's also a very expensive component. But ultimately, I mean, in the case of turtles, for example, Sea turtles, you know, you can grow as many as you want in a pail, but at some point you put them in the water and they get caught, you're not going to recover the species. So captive propagation alone is, is ultimately unlikely to be a viable recovery program. Well, I think one of the other issues, of course, is this uh, international provision where we're supposed to get the permission for any nation, whether they're in CITES or whether they're not in CITES, in terms of any type of sanctions or any type of actions we take. Uh, this would require the president himself to, to, uh, to, in fact, make that determination if, in fact, the country did not voluntarily agree. So they basically have veto power. And this is uh, taking it out of the hands of the professionals and putting it really in the hand of uh, for better or for worse, someone that uh, is either a statesman or a politician, take your choice, you know. My time has expired. Mr. Gilchrist. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you coming here and giving your testimony uh, to evaluate this most important issue before uh, the House uh, and basically before the American people. I'd like to ask the gentleman I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. This gentleman right here, 
How do you pronounce your name, sir? Uh, Lindika, Milan Lindika. Milan? Lindika. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm not going to attempt to say it. I, I can't say it because I, I need long range L glasses. Lindika. So There's been several mention of the CITES Treaty. Um, could you give us your perspective? If the act is passed the way it is, your understanding or your perspective on its impact, what are the ramifications for your country uh, if this bill passes the way it is with some of the language in it dealing with um, this international treaty on endangered species? Is it a positive effect for the CITES treaty, mm -hmm. which is positive basically you know, for your country, I would assume, impact. or will this bill have a negative impact on your um, country as far as species are concerned? Mr. Chairman, yes. Um, my understanding of the proposed legislation is that it absolutely reinforces the role of CITES as the international forum and mechanism for coordinating and controlling wildlife use and, and international trade. For uh, our particular country, it will certainly make things a lot easier because CITES as a, a feature which is very attractive to us, namely it's an open consultative organization where we have a chance to give our views, make our contributions, while somehow uh, we do not have that same privilege when it comes to dealing with the Endangered Species Act. So we would by far <coughs> prefer to um, handle our international trade issues through CITES rather than the Endangered Species Act. Uh, I think certainly from the United States perspective, um, the proposed legislation also has some beneficial um, aspects concerning the implementation of CITES. It makes CITES a much a stronger uh, force in this country than it is now. Here you have presently have a dual system. Um, I guess what you're trying to say is um, the uh, proposal we're dealing with um, how the U.S. role is with CITES is favorable to you. The proposal before us, 2275, is, is something that you would endorse? Absolutely, yes, sir. Um, Mr. Franton, could you give us your perspective on how this bill would impact uh, the U.S. role with this international agreement, CITES? Well, what the uh folks who have participated in the program in the Fish and Wildlife Service and elsewhere for many years say is that they feel this would virtually shut down our effective participation in the CITES program. Uh, just a few examples of specifics, specifics that may be fixable, but which I think are in the bill. Um, the, uh, the bill, as I understand it, requires that permits be issued for importation of uh, species or animals or parts that were taken as part of a country's conservation strategy, regardless of whether that strategy exploits the species or is consistent with other CITES provisions. We have no choice. Uh, a, a subset of that uh, provision, I think, is cited also in, in uh, in Mr. Bean's uh, written testimony where he points out that uh, the way the bill is written, if you have a permit, if you have 10 permits to shoot blackbirds in the last few years, you have free reign, you're entitled to a permit to import pandas well, into this country and lead them around on a chain. Uh, the, 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 the I have a couple sorry. more questions, the yellow lights on. Um, I'll ask unanimous consent for proceed for an additional hour. Is that is anybody? <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I think there's some distinct differences that, that we need to take a closer look at. Um, Senator Pierce, you made a comment. One of the things you disagreed with in the present bill before us is, is the, how they deal with distinct populations. Uh, and I'm assuming you're, you're talking about bald eagles, grizzly bears, and things of that nature. Uh, yeah. and, and, and is your um, understanding that if we dealt with distinct populations as it is contained in the bill, that then probably Alaska would, would uh, if you didn't have to deal with bald eagles in, in Maryland or Massachusetts anymore, and since they're not uh, threatened or endangered in Alaska, Alaska would be the last ground that would bear the full burden of trying to protect these species and no one else would have to, or no one else, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have to. 
Actually, sir, that is not the direct intent of, of my discussion, I think, on uh, animals that you just mentioned, including brown bears, also eagles. We are not so concerned that Alaska is going to bear the entire burden. However, we are very concerned should distinct population segments of some of our fish stocks, and take the Chinook, for example, should there be distinct population segments of the Chinook, we are concerned that every run, some very nat some natural and, and uh, very, very healthy runs might be affected. So we're concerned that the bill could reach out that far into distinct pop population segments of the entire Chinook fishery. That's our primary concern is in the fisheries. An excellent recommendation. Thank you very much. I guess my time has expired. Your time's expired. Uh, Mr. Cooley. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Frampton, um, I want to say to you is that this is a good piece of legislation. Put some common sense back into this law, which has definitely been screwed through the 20-some three years has been in effect. Uh, it adds a little human element to it, and I think it's very well. Nobody in this committee is going to tell you that we're on the task force to help write this bill. It's absolutely perfect, and that's why we're having hearings in order to correct them. <laughs> You know, um, you talked about in your testimony that um, you're trying to change now some of these things. For 23 years, this bill has been in effect. The environmental community has been driving it. You've controlled Congress, and you haven't done anything, but now all of a sudden you're going to do something. Uh, I think that we are taking the initiative, and we are going to do something. And I think the changes are really well needed. I want to ask you a direct question. I'd like to have an answer for it. Do you believe in private property? Yes. You believe in private property rights, then? Yes. Okay. From your testimony, I don't think you really believe in private property rights, and that's been one of the big bugaboos, I think, of most of us from the western part of the United States. And your past history, which we all are well aware of, those of us in the west, uh, does not set forth that, that, uh, that uh, answer you just had. You know, we talk about the act and how it's worked and what it's done, and, and we have a lot of proponents sitting in this room today that, that think this is the greatest thing that ever came down the pike. But you know, there's so many things in this that really have no scientific background, that it completely ignored the human factor involved in this process, uh, that does not use good science, the best science available. What does that mean? And you know yourself that, uh, like in California, the prairie shrimp was listed as endangered with a merely a 19 cent postcard from some high school student who did a study about five years prior to that time. Uh, and that's what it was all based upon. We've looked at that literature over and over. Uh, th there's been no recovery process in there and no really good science. And you talk about science and you talk about the science community. Well, we have people on the other side of the science community that talk about the science community that the environmental people have hired and, and have uh, promoted. Uh, and there's a big debate on that issue. And you now talk about the administration's 10-point program. Where is this plan, and when was it derived, and what's the dating of it? And are we all going to have an opportunity to take a look at that plan and, and uh, scrutinize that as well as you've scrutinized our Bill 2275? Uh, yes, Mr. Cooley. It was released in March of this year, and I've previously testified here concerning it. And we'd be happy to send you, you know, all of the details behind that later this afternoon. Okay. Because I'd like to look at it myself. I've never had an opportunity to uh, survey that particular bill. Um, I think that uh, we can sit on both sides of the aisle and, and talk about all the good things that we both want to do. The Endangered Species Act on, po on public property has literally shut down the West. Uh, and then now it's starting to affect private property and outside of the West, and that's why we're getting some kind of consideration for how bad this law really is. Uh, up until the last couple of years, we had no support from the eastern part of our, our, our country here because nobody really understood how bad the Endangered Species Act was being administered by your agencies and other agencies of the public. Now we find that little places like Texas, who has 300,000 acres of impact, impacted law on endangered species uh, of things that you can't even see, snails the size of a head of a pencil, 
uh, vertebrae that nobody's even know existed before. Uh, we're starting to get some legislators there looking at this and saying to us when we had our hearings, how could you have people live with this type of legislation for 20 years? We're finding the same thing in the eastern coast as well. Uh, so your, your uh, protection of private property rights is helping us a great deal. Uh, I would like to see every species tomorrow listed as endangered so we could get this on the table and really discuss the merits of this bill and the merits of the previous uh, bills. Um, I, I think that it's a time well done and well passed and without this administration, uh, without this Congress uh, in place, we would have never addressed this legislation. If we had had the uh, other group in power, we would still be living under the 1972 law, which was enacted in 73. And uh, I, I'm certainly happy, and I know the western part of the United States, and we'll find other parts of the east are going to be happy uh, to this, uh, this piece of legislation. I want to close, because I only have a few minutes, is that we do not have a perfect bill. And nobody's going to try to tell you it is. That's why we're having hearings to try to tweak out those things that are most contentious in order to bring about some common sense to this process, um, such as the good senator's uh, consideration on the dangers on the sockeye. Uh, my state uh, has a tremendous problem with the sockeye on the Columbia River. We spent $2 billion and we haven't recovered one, one single animal. $2 billion. You talk about good science? And we've paid for every bit of it. I think everybody in this room and the whole United States has helped offset the cost of trying to recover the sockeye salmon on the Columbia River. But no, no, no. The way the law is set up, we carry the burden of that. And the scientists are driving this. And it's obvious that they don't know what they're doing because we've been at it for seven years. So this bill that is presently in place is wrong. This bill as presented, 2275, will give some consideration of changing some of these that you talked about, issues that should have been brought up before. And I think if in the two, in true bipartisanship here, not only from the other side of the aisle, but also from the administration, you should participate in this process and get down to what's really contentious and what we can do to bring back a good Endangered Species Act to protect the species, but also consider the human species, consider the economic factors involved in it. Let's put some good science in this and let's all work together. We never started out the task force with the premise that we were going to destroy the Endangered Species Act. We're trying to make this workable. We're trying to preserve private property rights. We're trying to preserve the species. And what is happening is that now we're getting ridiculed for what we're trying to do to change a bad law, which you already said, alluded to, because you say there's some things wrong with it, to make it a better law. So we need not criticism, we need participation. Gentlemen, we need that. Expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Farr. You know, let me share a little different perspective than that of Mr. Cooley. He may be a little bit older than I am, but I think I've had a lot of experience in the western states as a fifth generation Californian. What I see happening in the time that I've been involved in the public uh, elective office, now 21 years, is a, is a, an awareness that it's not an issue of ignoring the human factor, it's discovering the fact that the salvation for the human factor depends on the whole health of the planet. And as we discover what the planet is comprised of, we're discovering a lot of solutions to problems that we didn't have answers to before. I happen to represent a coastal community and the Stanford University has a uh, research center, at Hopkins Marine Center, the oldest in the, in the West, founded in the last century. Certainly written up a lot about Steinbeck. And that center is now spending more time working with Stanford Hospital to look at the solutions medical solutions to problems coming from the flora and fauna of, of the ocean, the marine life. And essentially they're turning to nature to find those answers. I think that what we are doing is over correcting a difficult problem and that is how do we balance, how do we preserve uh, 
species that may be discovered by future generations to offer solutions to problems as small as they may be. And I think that we, in the process, we overcorrect. I also, rep my district happened to ignore science, happened to even not even pay attention to it. They went out and fished sardines, the largest sardine port in the world, Monterey Bay. And in, in a year, they were gone. People disrupted, canneries closed, uh, all because of a lack of attention to kind of sound resource management. So I take a different approach than that of Mr. Cooley. I do believe that we learn from these experiences and we need mid-course correction. But I don't think it is so broken that it needs the kind of fixing that the bill proposes to do because I don't think the bill bases its content on good science. And Mr. Cooley, the interesting thing about good science is that sometimes that good science doesn't look or respect property boundaries. It can't. We happen to preserve in California the mountain lion. We don't just preserve it on public property. We preserve the habitat of that mountain lion uh, wherever it may be. Does that cause some problems? Yes. Are people thinking that maybe we have too many mountain lions? Yes. But the fact is the voters in California did that, not the politicians. Uh, and I think that there's a desire out there by our citizens of this country that we as stewards of this country, we're not here just to represent people. We're also here to represent all other living things on this planet and to make policy that makes it work well as we grow into a very complex, uh, very uh, large um, society on this planet. And it's going to tax the resources, but the resources are what we live on. We depend on the resources for water. We depend on the resources for air. We spend on the resources for food. We depend on the resources for our microclimates. And those microclimates provide the, the districts that we all represent. And those microclimates provide a, a plant life and a, a tree life, which is all dependent on the animal life. And I think that we need to, as stewards of all this, go very cautiously and make sound decisions based on good science, not just on private property ownership. I did participate in one of the hearings. Yield back. Ms. Chenoweth. I'd like to know which one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Mr. Frampton, I do want to say I, I wouldn't want to ruin your day, but there are several things in your testimony I agree with. Um. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that makes my day, actually. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you. I saw about a month ago, or maybe five weeks ago, on the Tom Brokaw show, uh, a piece that um, his news program introduced with, and that was that a species becomes extinct every 20 seconds. Do you believe that is correct? I don't, I don't know, but certainly species do go extinct and are going extinct uh, all the time as a result of natural causes, particularly in rainforests. Very sincerely, do you think that we can come together and establish what the public interest might be in establishing which species we should save? You know, I, I just don't see an avenue for that. It's still murky out there to me. I know that when the bill was debated originally, we wanted to save the great blue whale and, and the um, bald eagle. But um, 
and, and you know, there was some direction there that, that was in the national and, and public's interest, but now it's wide open. And so it's my hope that we'll be, as a Congress, be able to work with you and your agencies to focus in on, more on what the public interest might be so that we're not trying to save species that go extinct every 20 seconds. Um, I, I guess I would respond, uh, Congresswoman, that I think we should continue to have an Endangered Species Act which sets a goal of striving to protect from going extinct all species in the United States, at least strives to protect them from extinction at the hands of human causes. That doesn't mean that we ultimately can, can uh, hope to achieve that goal. Whether we can achieve that goal depends on, uh, among other things, the status of some of those species, the, the amount of money that's appropriated for the program, uh, the extent to which we are creative in uh, structuring partnerships, you know, between government and, and private landowners, and some of the trade-offs that we make between species protection and uh, socioeconomic factors. Shrinks the habitat by 70 to 80 percent on public land. And, you know, I've been with this subcommittee chairman or this task force chairman on all 12 of his hearings, and I know how hard he and his staff have worked. And I think that he truly has gone overboard to reach the, to uh, accommodate the agencies. Um, even to my surprise, um, I do want to ask you, do you have the bill in front of you, sir? I do, do not. You don't. Um, it does indicate that in this bill on page 8, that agencies should promptly pay their owner the agreed upon amount. However, that's subject to the appropriations process. And as I go through the bill, I find that there are many unique and, and uh, creative ways in which habitat can be, can be preserved. So I guess because I've worked with this task force chairman, I'm just a little um, taken aback um, by the fact that, that um, y you aren't seeing that. I think he's just gone really overboard in, in trying to work with you. I do want to say I don't share your affection for the grizzly bear or the gray wolf. Um, I, I will continue to work with, uh, with uh, Mr. Pombo and with your agency on trying to make sure the grizzly bears are not introduced into multiple use uh, areas. I think that makes about as much sense as bringing sharks to the beach or rattlesnakes to Washington, D.C. I, mean, I mean the kind that don't have two legs. Um, but, but I do want to thank you and your staff for working as you did with Mr. Pombo. And, and I, I hope, it's my goal, that we can focus on very clearly uh, what we want to see in the future, because I still don't see it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I r just respond to the yeah. compensation uh, question that you, that you asked about? We have different page numbers, but one of the things that I think we all need to focus in on is, the, is what happens if you put most of the burden of protecting species. If, if we're going to have an act that really has a genuine goal of protecting species, and then you put most of the burden of doing that on land acquisition because certainly in the federal budget the money isn't going to be there in the foreseeable future. So you, it doesn't do that and, and to correct you it does not put most of the burden on land acquisition. It actually puts most of the burden when you deal with private property it puts most of the burden on cooperative agreements and voluntary agreements that are entered into where both sides the, the private property owner as well as the federal government has the ability to enter into a negotiated agreement as to how or what is the best way to manage the habitat that exists on their property. The compensation provision or the purchase of habitat, number one, is, the, is used as the last resort if an agreement cannot be reached into. And it also puts in a provision that says that we can trade federal land that is not biologically unique or biologically important or biodiverse 
contains a, a large amount of biodiversity, that we can trade that for private lands, which may be biologically unique or biologically important, so that we can connect up some of the biodiversity areas to, to make that work. So it does not, and, and i sorry, but I had to jump in, it does not put the burden on the purchase of property. That is the, the path of last resort when we cannot enter into an agreement that will protect the private property rights of the individual and protect the, the wildlife that exists on that property. My, I guess my point, Mr. Chairman, is that if you reduce the amount of federal land that can be devoted in any way to species protection and you take private land out altogether and you remove the obligation on government agencies to needlessly do things that impact habitat in their programs, it is inevitable that the burden is going to be shifted to uh, uh, purchasing private land, and the money's not all, there for All that. federal that, land still remains in, in protection. It still requires consultation, even if, if my bill was adopted exactly as it's written right now. All federal land still requires consultation. All federal land still stays within a protected status for preserving species. It depends a lot more on the agency, in, on you, in, in the administration, on what actions you take in terms of protection. On, on federal land. So it is a mis misstatement to say that federal lands are not going to be used for protection. Or private lands for that matter. Mis I'm sorry, Mr. Metcalf, it's your time. Mr. Chairman, my intent here today and over the last many weeks is to preserve endangered species and to preserve a working and effective Endangered Species Act. But whatever we do, we must modify the existing act to achieve several things. And I'm going to list three of them. So that it is to the benefit of the landowner to find an endangered species present on the property. Only then will we have the cooperation necessary to, to uh, pr preserve and help pr uh, in the preservation of that species. Second thing that I'm going to mention, there are others, we must have in effective incentives to delist de recovered species. There's a stellar accomplishment of the ESA, stellar accomplishment in western Washington. The bald eagles, which were in trouble years ago, are now very plentiful in western Washington. They should be delisted and we should uh, declare victory and, and because it's, it's, it's an achievement of that. And yet they won't delist because as long as they're listed, they maintain the power of the bureaucracy over people in that area, and that, that's deeply resented. Third thing, we must, mod we must modify so that sound science is the basis for decisions made in the listing process and in the rehabilitation process for particular species. Sound science and peer review are not part of the process today. Example, and then I'll get to my question for Mr. Frampton. Uh, in Washington State, a model called the Flush Model is being used by public agencies as a basis for salmon rehabilitation efforts on the Columbia River as required by ESA. It has had absolutely no peer review. Despite months of repeated requests, I have not been able to get the details in the copy of this model. With the chairman's assistant, this committee is considering a formal request and perhaps later subpoena if we don't get it. Uh, we have to have it for peer review. The whole Columbia River, hundreds of millions of dollars are going to be spent on a model that nobody has seen. And I'm asking for assistance, and this is my question. Uh, Mr. Frampton, will you use your position to help this committee gain access to this flush model upon which public policy is based? I, I will certainly do so, uh, Congressman Metcalf. Uh, you know, uh, I as I'm, I've, I'm not that familiar with the model. I've heard of it. National Marine Fisheries, of course, in the Commerce Department, not in Interior, has the lead responsibility under the Endangered Species Act for asked, salmon. And I will certainly uh, do my best to inquire uh, why that model has not been available for peer review and get back to you on it. Thank you very much. I asked Raleigh Schmitten when he was here, head of the fishery service, and he said, yes, we'll get it and uh, was unable, for whatever reasons, not to get it. And I need, I need the weight and the prestige of your office, and again, to get that. We can probably get it through a subpoena, but that's a sort of an embarrassment to uh, perhaps a lot of people. 
Well, I don't know how much weight and prestige it has over at Commerce, but I'll try. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. So the gentleman's recognized. I was. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to debate with staff here. <laughs> Uh, just to give you a, a little perspective, I don't. Uh, I, I, I come at this. I'm not. I'm not a co-sponsor of the bill, and and I, I'm here to learn uh, as as much as I possibly can. My my background. I'm a veterinarian by profession, and and uh, grew up in northern Nevada, at Lake Tahoe, in a in a beautifully serene area, and and have grown up to really appreciate the environment and 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 animals all of my life. Uh, I do. See problems as as uh, I'm sure you would agree that there are problems with the current Endangered Species Act, and and I think that that's that that's widely recognized, and I think that we do have to take a balanced approach when we look at uh, trying to fix those problems, uh, and I and I too agree that we need to be good stewards of of, of our planet. Uh, our planet is here for us today uh, to enjoy, but it's also uh, here for generations. Uh, that, that come after us and, and, and it's important for us to preserve a healthy planet uh, for those generations to come. In doing so, though, I think we have to ask some fundamental questions when we, when we go about uh, something like an Endangered Species Act. And, and first of all, we have to say, should economics play a part? Mr. Frampton, I, I'd start with that question Yes, absolutely. You. And I think economics, uh, I think you have to separate out the the listing decision, which has always been a scientific judgment under the Act, from the second question, which is if a species is, or subspecies or population is listed, then what actions do we take to Good. try to address that problem and recover that species, which is the point at which in a number of ways economic, socio and economic trade-offs are taken in, into account. And, and, and uh, you know, we have said, uh, you know, Do you think proposals that, if necessary, that should be made more more explicit in the end. more explicit? Uh, the reason I bring that up is is in the in southern Nevada we have the desert tortoise, and the desert tortoise in southern Nevada it's a magnificent creature. Uh, we've, as a veterinarian, I help many people adopt out uh, these these tortoises that that have uh, acquired this uh, particular respiratory disease. Uh, one of the major reasons for the uh, uh, for them being listed. Uh, I'm not too sure that's great policy, uh, considering we don't really know how it's transmitted and, and all that and whether we're propagating that disease, I'm, I'm not too sure. But in the Las Vegas Valley, uh, we have a fee now that, that every developer, if you're building a house, uh, it, it goes per acre on how, on how much money you have to pay uh, for a desert tortoise fee. And, and that doesn't matter, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I was involved with a project that was that was uh, I was working for my dad for a couple of years and and we built a hotel on a parking lot no. and we had to pay the desert tortoise study fee and and have the desert tortoise study done on the parking lot uh, and I you know as a veterinarian I did have quite a bit of expertise and I probably could have told them that there weren't any desert tortoises living out there on the parking lot but uh, didn't matter it was law you had to do it and that, that that's just the way it was. In Las Vegas, or in the Southern Nevada area, we have a now a desert tortoise hotel situation set up, to where each you know one of these species that's relocated, it costs eight thousand dollars per tortoise to relocate. Um, the, the reason I asked the question, the whole question about economics, is that if you look at if you look at you drive across Nevada, you drive across from or or drive from Las Vegas to Southern California. It is a big desert. I mean, a very, very, very big desert uh, that is very good habitat for the, for the desert tortoises. As a matter of fact, there are better places for the desert tortoise that don't have current desert tortoises uh, living in there, that has the vegetation that's necessary that could be much more cheaply, uh, you know, the, these, these tortoises relocated. And I don't think economic factors sometimes are taken into account uh, enough because you know, when we, we, we don't do enough in our country, I don't believe, uh, the number one cause of early death in our country uh, for people. You know, we talk about, you know, trying to save uh, some of these things for scientific reasons for humans because we want to extend their life and have better quality of life. Well, the number one cause of, of low quality life, but also shortness of life in, in America is poverty. 
There's, there's no question about it. Statistically, it by far leads all other causes of early death in America is poverty. The, the uh, uh, I mean, it outranks cigarette smoking, outranks accidents, and outranks anything. So when we're, when we're looking at those types of things, I mean, if we truly care about people as well, I think that we more and more have to take into account you know, what, what we're doing, you know, with the, the millions of dollars sometimes we do spend. And I was glad to see the listing. I would agree that from a scientific perspective, list an animal. But then from an economic perspective, let's take into account some of the other factors and how much money are we going to end up spending. Uh, because I, I agree with the, the statement that you made earlier about species are going extinct all the time. But from the time of creation forward, basically species have gone extinct. Much more rapid uh, fashion at, at, at this point, and, and a lot of that due to the factors that man has introduced. Uh, so we need to, you know, look at the bigger picture, I, I believe, and, and, and take a really balanced approach, take uh, ecosystems into, into, into play, and, uh, you know, I'm going to be interested in, in learning much more about this, this uh, whole revision of the Dangerous, Endangered Species Act. I would appreciate if you could get to my office also the proposal that you had last May was it? And, uh, and, and, and in as simple a language that, uh, that, that somebody who's not a lawyer could understand that, uh, uh, that I could read and, and see where you have problems, maybe even an analysis of where you have problems with this bill. I would appreciate it. I'm trying to get as much, once again, balanced information as I can from both sides on, on this because, you know, the, the old saying is there's, there's three sides of every story, one side, the other side, and the truth somewhere in between. So I would appreciate that. Thank you. I, I will get a copy. I, I wouldn't disagree with you that there's certainly been conflicts about whether and how much to take economic impacts into account in recovery planning, but I do think that uh, the uh, Clark County, Las Vegas area is an example of how that was done, has been done well, the, uh, with a partnership between county government and uh, the federal the, the, the agency people of, for the people the of my the people plan. of southern nevada would not agree that it's been done well well the county majority of the people there would not including local and county governments uh, county government did uh, we've reached a partnership with the county government whether members of the county government feel good or don't feel good about that the net result of the plan is that uh, a lot of potential tortoise habitat is, I believe, is opened up to development. Other habitat is protected. And I don't know whether the $8,000 figure for, for a translocation is, is correct, but my understanding is that that's a relatively short term. And the long term is, here's what you can develop, here's what you can't. Let's, let's do that up front, and uh, then the federal government basically gets out of your way for 25 years or more. And that, that has been the result of the adoption of the Habitat Conservation Plan for Clark County. Clark County. Clark County? Yeah, in Nevada. Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I apologize, I've been out of the room, but I have been in the back of the room, and I heard, uh, I believe, Mr. Frampton, it was your testimony. If not, I'm going to throw this question open to everybody. And it was basically uh, speculation that writing an Endangered Species Act, which requires for its main um, thrust the acquisition of land, is not uh, going to work. That, that at least is what I thought I read out of the testimonial statement, and I heard Mr. Pombo say that's not what is being discussed. I want to ask each of you candidly to Put aside kind of the armor that you came here with and tell me whether or not you think the current atmosphere <clears throat> created by the act as it's now written has created a climate between landowners, and I, I want to talk about private property here, between landowners, regulators, and concerned citizens. And, and within concerned citizens, I'm including people who are deeply concerned about the environment. Do you think the current act has created a climate which, which serves the purpose of protecting species very well? And if so, why? And if not, what do you think we could do about it? 
Well, I'll take that first, if I, if I might. Uh, I think that it is true that in some places, in some parts of the country, that the act, at least as it's been administered uh, in the past, has provoked conflict, uh, which uh, does not in the long run serve the, the larger goal of protecting species, because you have to have uh, some uh, public support uh, for carrying out these programs. And uh, I think that it has been a major priority of this administration, this department, to see how we could redesign policies and reg regulations and, and, uh, and, and approaches to the Act so that we could still effectively protect habitat and yet do it in a way that would build public support and be more effective. I appreciate and, your and, candor. Are there others that want Some places we've been successful, some places we haven't. Are there others that would like to comment on that question? Thank you. I would like to, on behalf of the state of Alaska, first of all, unfortunately, only 1% of the land in the state of Alaska is in private hands, so any answer that I give is also going to have to affect public lands. I would say that in Alaska we have found the ongoing discussions over the Endangered Species Act to be very divisive. We also have found that inside the Beltway decisions do not translate very well to our rather unique and also very large state. But most importantly, we have found that there has been a use of the present Endangered Species Act to affirm and get to other decisions, whether it's the closure of logging in the Tongass, which is something that we have just been fighting through in the past year, or other designations that have been made previously in order to get to some other closure to Alaskans of some activity. I have found that the atmosphere of the entire act has been uh, divisive and certainly negative to Alaskans. Other, yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I think uh, it must be quite clear that this act on the international scene has certainly led to great divisions, unfortunate divisions. And we felt that such great progress has been made in another forum where similar divisions existed, such as CITES, but somehow here it has not happened. We are intrigued by the very interesting parallels between what's happening here in the U.S. and in our situation. Ultimately, it's all about land. And we have in our experience, there's a limit to what you can achieve uh, through regulatory mechanisms, how people view land and resources. At some stage, you must get their cooperation. It must come from within, and that is achieved only through consultation and listening very, very carefully to their needs and their requirements as well. And that, to some extent, has been absent in the way that the foreign species have been dealt with in the Endangered Species Act, and if I may comment maybe also in the domestic situation here in the U.S. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in fact, we are quite concerned because in Southern Africa we have taken serious initiatives to try and balance development and conservation. And uh, such steps have proved to be quite successful on our part because we are quite realistic with our situation where we are seriously underdeveloped and uh, even the people that we deal with do not have that kind of understanding of what we mean by endangered species. But being the leaders ourselves, we understand sincerely and understand that there is need for us to conserve those resources. But then we have to be pragmatic and embark on programs which are quite conducive to conservation and development. Like my colleague has already said, the issue of land is quite critical and I'm quite amazed that here, the Endangered Species Act is not doing adequately to address the issues here. But what of countries which are far away in Africa, which have to deal every day with wildlife which destroy their crops? I feel that the issue of economics must be seriously taken care of, and not just economics in the sense of developed countries, but economics in the sense of those countries which are still struggling to make ends meet. Because what you define as economics here is probably 
something much more comfortable than what we describe, describe as economics in our developing countries. So we have taken serious initiatives and we feel that the Endangered Species Act should take serious cognizance of those kind of activities that we are doing, rather than taking us as passengers in a system where you will expect us in the end to look after those species. We will find ourselves in a quagmire or in a difficult situation where we will join other countries in Africa which have destroyed their species and they are now comfortable. They are not even here in Washington because they don't have elephants, they do not have tigers to destroy their crops. And what will happen is in the future, we may simply be comfortable and destroy our resources, which we dearly love, simply because we have ignored our economic interests. We want to conserve those pieces, but still you must strike a balance between development and conservation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I know my time's expired. Let me make a quick statement. Um, first of all, I have found that, at least in Arizona, the current Endangered Species Act has not created the right climate, particularly with regard to private property. Um, and when you talk about Alaska, Arizona probably, I think, second to Alaska has the most public lands. Um, I, I also, and I'm just going to throw this last point out there, I wonder if, if, in fact, we shouldn't be looking at writing two different <laughs> laws or laws with starkly different rules for private property and for public property. Um, I think a case can be made quite differently for what we can and should do on those lands which are owned by the people and those lands which are owned by private interests. And I, I just in my own experience find where we have created a dramatically adversarial relationship between the owners of private property, where the vast majority I think of these species are, and the regulators, we are not achieving the goal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Tozan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Friend, and, uh, I've just re-examined the bill very carefully, and, and I need your help here. The bill says that except when the government seeks to regulate property in, in a way that diminishes its value more than 20 percent and refuses to compensate the landowner, that except for that case, it has the full uh, opportunities to take agency actions under this act on federal and private lands. Where in the bill do you base your claim that the bill exempts 90 percent of federal lands and all of private property from protection? Can you cite me in the bill where, where that is? Yeah, as I understand it, the bill creates a system in which endangered species protection is primarily, if not virtually exclusively, relegated to existing areas like parks, National not true. parks and wilderness areas. Well, show me in the bill which says in that. which uh, Mr. That Frampton, I have a limited already... amount of time, sir. Where in the bill does it say that endangered species protection is now limited to certain parks and wilderness areas? If you're going to cite to me the biological diversity reserves, that's yes. a special section on biological diversity enhancement. It does not in any way limit the federal government's responsibilities or obligations under the act to protect species on other federal lands and private properties. I, I had the provision a moment ago, Congressman, but I believe there's a provision that specifically prohibits the Secretary from taking any action to protect biological diversity on areas outside of the reserves unless he certifies oh, through there, a there, process in which there's again. a publication there two sections, in the there two sections Federal Register. The, I'm limited in time. There are two sections of the, uh, of, of the law here. The added section is this biological reserve section. It does not limit the capacity of the Secretary to enforce the main body of the bill, which is the protection of endangered species and species conservation recovery plans and everything else under the main body of the bill. Biological pres reserve protection is a special section. I have to pass on that quickly. I just want to point out to you that it, if that's the basis upon which you say that 90 percent of federal lands are exempted or that all private property is exempted, you're dead wrong and you need to go back and read the bill. If, if there's a misinterpretation of language, we can straighten that out for you real quickly, I think. Secondly, you, uh, you criticize very heavily the compensation provisions of the bill, and yet you answered earlier that you support private property in America. I have a letter from the President saying he believes in private property too, but he doesn't like our compensation provisions. Do you believe the federal government has a right under endangered species or wetlands or other such environmental protection measures 
to take people's property without paying them for it in order to, in order to make it a habitat protected area? No. Uh, do, you, do you believe that the government has to take away 80, 90 percent of their rights on property before they have a right to be compensated? I believe the Supreme Court has defined what a taking means. Well, what, 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 I, what do and, and you I, believe? I agree with what the President said to I'm you asking you, Mr. Rappin, what do you believe? Do you believe that the government has a right to take 60, 70, 80 percent of a person's <laughs> property rights away without paying them? The Constitution and the courts have defined what is a taking that's required oh, to be compensated. It's still going on. The courts it's have still never going yet. On. The Court of Appeals have talked about partial takings. The Supreme Court has not ruled right. on it yet. I think I'm asking for your opinion, sir. Forget the courts for a second. What is Mr. Frampton's opinion about whether or not a person should be able to lose 60, 70 percent of their property to the government by regulation and not be compensated? Is that, is that okay in your frame of legal in, in, reference? In my personal frame and in the frame of the capacity in which I'm here yes. as a witness for the administration, uh, we think that the provisions in the Constitution, as interpreted by the courts, are uh, provisions which, you know, are ample and we will comply with in terms of compensation for taking. So we the, should the, have no provisions that, that give doesn't mean That doesn't mean that we should have no provisions. What provision would you like to see in this bill on compensation? question that I, I thought you were going to ask me is what provisions to help protect private landowners and we I'm proposed a number I'm asking you what provision in this bill would you like to see in that defines compensation rights so we can have that settled for everybody. They don't all have to go to the Supreme Court. None that go substantially beyond existing law. None. Where's the law that provides for compensation? In the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Right. So you want everybody to go to court? We'd like to see the law comply in the Constitution. So if we provide for any compensation provisions in here, other than telling everybody you've got to go to court and find out what your rights are, you will oppose the bill? Not necessarily. I don't think that uh, One final question. we have seen right a compensation now. provision that we think doesn't cripple the law. Right. One final question. You criticize the harm provision. Is it your belief, the administration's position, that the government can tell a landowner you cannot modify your habitat even if those modifications have zero uh, effect upon the protection of an endangered species on that habitat. Uh, could you repeat the question? I... Is it the administration's position that the endangered species law should give the government the power to tell the landowner that you cannot make any modifications on your land even where those modifications do not affect the, the survivability of an endangered species on his property. Well, when you say s affect the survivability of the species as a whole? That species on his property. I don't I'm, think uh, the let current me be, act let me be specific. As, as I understand the question, I don't think the current act gives the federal government the right to do that. To mo to, so you think, you, you think it's okay for us to, to, to provide... Regu to regulate habitat uh, 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 conduct that has no impact on a listed species? That, that has no... Uh, impact upon the species on that property. It will not harm that species specific. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I don't think the way you asked the question that, uh, that the government has any authority to do that under the current act, nor Thank should you, it Frank. under a uh, reauthorized act. Thank you very much, Mr. I think the panel for their testimony and for answering the questions, the, the ability to work with this administration, the state governments, I know that Alaska has probably as much to gain or lose out of this as anybody and I appreciate you coming out and Senator and, and being here. Uh, I recently took a trip to your state and I had the opportunity to, to spend some time with you there and was uh, truly amazed at, at what you have in, in Alaska. It's a beautiful place. Mr. Frampton, I appreciate the, the opportunity for you to come testify. I appreciate your answers, but I do hope that as we go through this debate that we can have a more factual discussion on the bill and a more factual discussion about what differences are and, and try to tame the rhetoric somewhat from both sides. And, but I do hope that in the future that we can have a more factual 
discussion on the bill and what it actually says. Thank you. To our foreign visitors, thank you very much for agreeing to testify and, and sharing your insights with us. Thank you very much. The panel is excused. I'd like to call up the next panel. Mr. Michael Bean, Mr. Henson Moore, Mr. Bob Irvin, Mr. Bob Stallman, Mr. Rob Gordon, and Mr. Ben Cohn. Mr. Bean, if you are ready, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by complimenting you and thanking you for the other bills you introduced the same day you introduced this bill. Uh, those other bills include uh, most particularly a bill to create tax incentives for encouraging conservation on private lands. And I think uh, there are some very constructive ideas in those other bills. Uh, as you know, if you've read my testimony, uh, I'm a little less charitable toward this bill. But I want to honor uh, Mr. Tozan's admonition to not try to characterize this bill, but rather just to describe for you the actual practical consequences of this bill. And let me list a few of those. First, uh, smugglers of rhino horn, tiger bone, and other wildlife contraband will find it much easier to thwart U.S. endangered species laws. And the reason for that is because of the provision in this bill which, which requires the Fish and Wildlife Service to return to those smugglers any products that are not identified as to species within 30 days. Well, many of these products, take for example rhino horn, do not come in uh, attached to the head of a rhinoceros. They come in in the form of powder in vials. They must be subjected to rigorous analyses to determine the presence of enzymes and other chemicals. Those tests often take weeks to complete. And when a shipment consists of several hundred separate items, as commercial shipments often do, the Fish and Wildlife Service will simply be unable to accomplish within 30 days what your bill requires and will be required to return to smugglers that contraband item. Uh, secondly, uh, Mr. Vento pointed out the practical consequences for the bald eagle. Mr. Metcalf earlier described the success of the bald eagle in his state as a stellar success. It has been a substantial success almost everywhere in this country. The recovery plans for the bald eagle are working extremely well. Despite that, however, to continue on that successful path, here's what your bill would require. It would require the secretary to make a national interest determination to continue to protect the eagle. It would require congressional concurrence with that. It would require 48 governors to nominate members to an assessment team and 1,500 county governments to nominate members to that same assessment team. It would require the secretary to review the assessment from that huge team and to uh, uh, prepare a conservation objective and a new conservation plan all within 18 months. Uh, frankly, sir, I see no reason why our resources need to be squandered in that way. The bald eagle is doing fine, and there is absolutely no purpose in requiring those sorts of Byzantine requirements. Uh, third, um, I'm sorry that Mr. Young is not here because Mr. Young played a very important role in 1982 in overturning a court decision which had required reliable population estimates of species protected by CITES before those could be exported. The uh, problem was that that court decision was met with resistance by professional wildlife managers who pointed out that reliable population uh, evidence is not necessary to make the sorts of determinations um, that um, are necessary to, to uh, assure that uh, export will not be harmful. And in fact, uh, the International Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, the director of the Louisiana Fish and Game Department, and other state fish and game agencies 
all were consistent in their view that to require such population data was wasteful, unnecessary, and in most cases impossible. Yet your bill in three different locations requires exactly that sort of information for the species that this act tries to protect. I submit to you, just as in 1982 when Mr. Young and Mr. Tozan and others concluded that the court decision requiring that sort of data was irrational, so too this bill, by requiring that sort of data, will have extremely mischievous and, and wasteful effects upon uh, protecting endangered species. Uh, I know that uh, a lot has been said about sound science here, and I know that the Republican policy statement on um, the Endangered Species Act begins with uh, a statement of adherence to the importance of sound science. Yet I've, I have to say that this bill reflects, in my judgment, a very poor understanding of science. For example, among other things, this bill requires that petitioners for the listing of species submit the names of the peer reviewers of the scientific articles upon which they rely. Well, sir, Unfortunately, uh, for this, the drafters of this bill, that is impossible to do because a key uh, element of peer review is confidentiality. No one knows who peer reviews articles that appear in scientific journals. The editors and the authors uh, will not divulge that information. So you've required of petitioners uh, information that is impossible to provide. Uh, lastly, I want to point out that um, uh, this bill requires some things that are simply, um, simply nonsensical. Uh, for example, uh, this bill uh, authorizes the secretary to issue captive breeding permits for endangered species like pandas, chimpanzees, and what have you on the basis that someone has previously received a permit to kill blackbirds. You didn't misunderstand what I said, sir. That's what this bill actually does. Because it says anybody who's received 10 or more permits under any of a long list of laws, including the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, is by virtue of that fact qualified to receive a captive breeding permit for endangered species. Well, one of the permits most frequently issued under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is for killing blackbirds to protect crops. So one uh, consequence of this bill is to allow permits to be issued under those circumstances. My point is not to suggest that anybody really intended that result. I don't think they did. Rather, my point is simply to suggest that this bill, to me, strikes me as having been prepared very hastily and rather carelessly, and I would strongly urge you to take the time to go back over this more carefully and to recognize that there are many parts of this bill that impose unnecessary requirements, lead to totally illogical results, and can uh, properly and should properly be changed. Thank you, sir. Mr. Moore. Congressman, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the chance to testify this morning. I'm here on behalf of the American Forest and Paper Association and its 256 direct member companies and some 80 affiliate organizations, and also the Endangered Species Coalition, which is a coalition of uh, companies, unions, landowners who are involved in ranching, farming, forestry, mining, and fishing. We applaud the work you've done in this area. We support the bill that you've come forward with. Basically, it's our opinion, you can't protect in species by endangering the livelihood of people. At this particular point, we've pitted the species against the landowner. That's not going to work. Your legislation is moving to try to correct that and find a way to give the landowner a stakeholder in this to where they'll be coming, they'll be, they will become willing participants rather than begrudging uh, citizens in terms of working to try to protect endangered species. There are a number of things in the Endangered Species Act over the 22 years it's been in existence that those people have had to live under it and deal with it and administer it, they found that aren't working like they should. Most people will indicate, including uh, this administration, that there are things wrong with it that need to be fixed. I think your legislation goes a long way to fixing those things. It's a good starting point. It's a good point from which to work and try to see if something can't be perfected that makes the existing law work better than it does. There are a number of mechanical problems, as I indicated. You've addressed most of those that we can think of or we've been able to find. But there's also a very basic problem that I started out speaking to, and that is the pitting of a landowner against a species. You've heard the examples before where the farmer is now planting fence row to fence row, of where people are prematurely cutting timber, or where people can't build on a residential lot or an acre and a half of land they bought to build a house on because of the fear or the reality that the Endangered Species Act will not allow them to use their property. This isn't helping protect endangered species or any species or wildlife. 
And the issue really isn't, and we can thank the passers and the people who supported the act in the beginning. This law has gone a long way to make the American people understand that there are endangered species in addition to wildlife in general that ought to be protected. I don't know many people today who seriously would take the opposite position and say that we shouldn't have a national law on protecting endangered species, or we shouldn't be interested in that. I think that's a highly socially unsupportable position, and certainly people that we represent don't believe that. The question is, how can we make it work? How can we work together to where people don't have a fear of this law, but quite the contrary, have a willingness to try to work with the government and try to work with people who care about endangered species to see that they are protected. The basic problem of pitting a landowner against the government is never going to work. It's going to create a lot of hostility because some people who may, when this law was crafted 22 years later, not knowing quite how it was going to turn out, are overlooking the fact that an awful lot of people came to the United States over the last 300 years for the right to own property. That's what separates us from most countries in the world, that anybody can in this country. And the fact that a landowner has no rights, virtually, under the way the legislation works today, just isn't going to be considered as fair and balanced by the American people. They believe very strongly there needs to be a balance in fairness. And the existing law doesn't have that. And I think most people believe, and most people have said, you've got to find some way to create an incentive for the landowner to want to work with this. And that leads to the point that that incentive and that kind of a uh, system to cause landowners to want to work with the government is going to cost something. Protecting the environment costs money. Somebody has to spend money to do that. Protecting endangered species costs money. Somebody is losing some economic right that they have. That costs something. And I think the first thing this legislation does is faces up to that and says that you should, somebody's going to bear the cost besides the landowner. It's going to be society as a whole. And that's a very fair way to go about it. We're being very honest with the American people and saying it costs something to protect an endangered species, and therefore we're going to help come forward with paying for that cost. Once you do that, I think you're going to find landowners show a great deal more interest in trying to work with you. Therefore, Mr. Chairman, we conclude by saying that you have fixed most of the abuses we've been able to identify and to call to the attention of this committee. And while the legislation may not be perfect in certain people's opinion, the law is far less perfect and that I think we err greatly by not moving forward and by moving forward to amend this law than we would by sitting still and letting the abuses continue on the existing law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Irvin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Robert Irvin, Deputy Vice President for the Center for Marine Conservation. In addition to my own organization, I'm pleased to be testifying today on behalf of the Endangered Species Coalition I'm testifying on behalf of the coalition. He's testifying on behalf of a different group. Uh, our coalition represents more than 200 environmental, civic, religious, health, business, and labor organizations across the nation. I think that the National Research Council, in its recent report, Science and the Endangered Species Act, really summed it up quite appropriately when they wrote, the Endangered Species Act has successfully prevented some species from becoming extinct Retention of the Endangered Species Act would help to prevent species extinction. Your bill, Mr. Chairman, purports to retain the Endangered Species Act, but it reminds me a little bit of, of the old Greyhound bus station in downtown Washington. Uh, the developers took that station and developed it into a fancy office building. If you look at it outside, there's still a sign that says Greyhound. There's still a dog on the front, but you can't catch a bus there. And that's the effect of this bill. There'll still be a law that says Endangered Species Act, but it won't protect endangered species. This bill undermines or eliminates every important protection for threatened and endangered species under the ESA. It is not based on sound science. It will be enormously costly, both ecologically and economically, to the American taxpayer. In the time allotted to me, I don't have time to go through all of the things that are wrong with this bill. It abandons the goal of recovery of the act. It undermines habitat protection. It eliminates federal agencies' duties to conserve endangered species. It imposes wasteful bureaucracy and needless cost on taxpayers. But what I would like to do is spend a few minutes focusing on what this, group, this bill does to one single group of endangered species, endangered marine wildlife, some of this country's most beloved 
and visible species, humpback whales, California sea otters, Hawaiian monk seals, Pacific salmon, stellar sea lions, Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, marbled murrelets and other seabirds, and Florida manatees. Because this bill will harm those species dramatically. Section 201 of this bill contains an across-the-board exemption for incidental take of endangered marine wildlife other than fish out to the 200-mile limit of U.S. waters. What this means is that off of California, the oil industry won't have to lift a finger to protect California sea otters anymore. But they can go about their drilling activities, their barging activities, all of those things without worrying about the Endangered Species Act. The, I, I think one of the most striking things, too, about this bill is the degree of overkill it engages in. Because as if that across-the-board exemption wasn't enough, it has specific exemptions. For example, Section 208 specifically requires the Secretary of the Interior to exempt shrimp fishermen from the requirement to use turtle excluder devices if they undertake some other measures to, to protect sea turtles somewhere in the world. Section 104 has a similar provision exempting people from the take prohibition of the act if they participate in some unspecified way in captive breeding, predator control, artificial feeding, or habitat management programs. And Section 205 requires the Secretary to give priority to research into alternative technologies to protect endangered species, even if the technologies that are being used now are perfectly fine. So in other words, again, even though turtle excluder devices work to protect turtles, uh, the secretary would have to look into some other de device for, uh, for doing this. And I think this is particularly ironic. It comes at a time when uh, not only are TED requirements in place and sea turtles are being protected, but when you ha have the National Fisherman magazine in its October issue right at the top of the, the uh, cover saying, Gulf shrimper yards are booming. So you're offering this extra uh, benefit to an industry that is doing fine under the, the existing requirements. Mr. Chairman, this bill does a number of other things to harm endangered marine species. It eliminates the Secretary of Commerce from his responsibility to protect endangered species, doing away with 25 years of experience that the National Marine Fisheries Service has in protecting endangered marine wildlife. Now, alluding to, to some of the sloppy drafting that Mr. Mr. Bean referred to, while the bill does away with the Secretary of Commerce's responsibilities, it continues to authorize increased appropriations for the Department of Commerce uh, in, in the uh, latter part of the bill. Mr. Chairman, the bill will also harm marine species internationally. Before the United States can take any steps to protect our own stocks of salmon, which may be in trouble, we have to consult with countries like Japan and Russia and other nations that fish for salmon on the high seas. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, let me just say this. The Endangered Species Act is our nation's promise to ourselves and to future generations that we're going to leave them a world as rich in biological diversity as the one we enjoy. If this bill is enacted, that promise will be broken. In my written testimony, I have a number of suggestions for responsible reform to the Endangered Species Act. If this committee is interested, I'll be happy to describe those in greater detail during the question period. Thank you. Mr. Stallman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Bob Stallman, and I'm president of the Texas Farm Bureau. But I'm here today representing the National Endangered Species Act Reform Coalition, and uh, we are a member of that coalition. I do appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to testify regarding H.R. 2275, the Endangered Species Conservation and Management Act of 1995. As Mr. English testified before this committee several months ago, the coalition is made up of a broad cross-section of Americans most affected by the Endangered Species Act. Our members range from small individual landowners and farmers, small companies, rural electric cooperatives and public power entities, to agricultural interests, water districts, mining interests, and other companies. We commend the committee for the work of the task force chaired by you, Mr. Chairman, 
and we commend you for listening to the voices out in rural America, and I particularly appreciate uh, you bringing the task force to Bernie, Texas. I think uh, you learned a lot of the problems with the current Endangered Species Act at that hearing. We urge the members of this committee to move swiftly and favorably uh, to report H.R. 2275. This legislation offers the only clear hope for reform of the Endangered Species Act in the United States House of Representatives. We recognize that the bill is long and complex. We urge you as a committee and as members of the U.S. House of Representatives to recognize that complex and difficult endangered species management issues, which have been years in the making, cannot be papered over with vague changes in the law. We believe this legislation represents responsible reform. To make the Endangered Species Act work, any reform must accomplish at least the following specific changes in the law. We must place the ESA on equal footing with other laws and responsibilities. Conserving species is an important goal for our country, and our federal government must play a role in that process. However, that role cannot be undertaken at the expense of all other government functions. The ESA listing process should remain based on science, but should be opened up for scientific peer review on key biological decisions. And this is absolutely critical to ensure that species listed for protection under the Endangered Species Act truly are threatened or endangered. And Title II of this bill does that. We need to provide a more open and balanced recovery planning process. Title V establishes a conservation planning process which allows much greater public input and provides for public hearings in affected communities. It also provides a significant change in the Endangered Species Act allowing the government to determine the most appropriate level of species conservation. And we have urged the Congress to clearly authorize conservation standards other than full recovery. And this bill does so. We must significantly increase incentives for species conservation. There are, ser there are several significant increases in incentives for species contained in the bill and which we support. In addition, we commend the leaders of this committee for introducing separate legislation dealing with the most important issues of tax incentives and a greater agricultural habitat conservation reserve program. These other bills are significant and necessary if we are to establish a truly incentive-based system for species conservation. Probably most important, we must provide compensation for lost use of property. We recognize that compensation can be a difficult subject for local governments as well as for the federal government. As a coalition, we strongly believe that proper endangered species management should seldom, if ever, require that an individual landowner lose his or her property in a manner that requires compensation to be paid. If land and water are required for species conservation purposes, they should only be acquired on a willing seller basis. However, if a regulatory approach to ESA management is maintained in the upcoming reauthorization, a sense of fundamental fairness requires that property owners be compensated for lost use of property which has become dedicated to a public good such as conservation of endangered or threatened species. We must establish clear standards in several areas for making the most difficult ESA decisions. Conservation of population segments of species should require special consideration or separate acts of Congress as was done in the, in the acts of Congress passed to protect the bald eagle. We need to establish clear standards for when habitat modification will be viewed as a violation of the law. That uncertainty must be removed for property owners. We need to establish clear requirements for the designation of critical habitat, and the bill certainly moves toward providing these clear standards. We need to significantly increase the involvement of state and local government. They have a great deal of expertise in land management and wildlife conservation and we must make use of that. We support the delegation of endangered species management to the states as is called for in the bill, as well as the significantly increased role of state and local governments found throughout the bill. And finally, we support the provisions of the bill which provide for cooperative management agreements that do provide for regulatory certainty. In conclusion, the National Endangered Species Act Reform Coalition has worked on ideas for ESA reform for close to four years. We believe that this Congress has an opportunity to reauthorize and improve the ESA and bring this law, which has direct impacts on so many communities, much closer to the people. If the politics of the past are allowed to continue to still make progress on this important matter, the law is doomed, and with it, many of our smaller communities, as well as the species which could be saved if the law received needed improvements. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Chairman, committee members, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today on behalf of the Grassroots ESA Coalition 
and in the company of my friend, uh, colleague, and coalition member, Kathy Benedetto of the Women's Mining Coalition. Our coalition is a grassroots organization comprised of nearly 300 groups representing more than 4 million members. We commend the chairman and the task force chairman for addressing several issues in their bill which we consider critical, including addressing the use of incentives, the definition of harm, and measures to protect private property, which we anticipate will be heatedly opposed by those opposed to changing the way Washington does business. There are different views on how to conserve endangered species, but I think they can be generally divided into three groups. First, there are those who wish to retain the current program without significant changes. These interests argue that the current law is basically sound, but that uh, perhaps a few minor modifications are needed. This is clearly an attempt to stymie real reform, arguing for perestroika in lieu of meaningful change. Secondly, there are those who recognize that the act has been a failure for people and wildlife and who wish to alleviate the tremendous and adverse economic and social costs and to lessen a, a regulatory program's adverse conservation consequences by amending the law with such elements as tax incentives and measures to protect property. Third and finally, there is a group which believes in an altogether different approach from current law, which is where our coalition falls. This group sees the current act as inherently counterproductive because it is a regulatory scheme rather than an incentive-based one. We recognize that those regulations which cause the social and economic conflict also cause the act to fail for wildlife. A regulatory approach makes endangered species or suitable habitat a liability, creates an adversarial relationship between landowners and conservation officials, and locks out many creative and proven management strategies useful for conservation. Today we've been invited to specifically address the measure pending before the committee. So the rest of my remarks will focus on the two elements which the coalition members consider the most important. First is compensation for regulatory takings. Our members firmly believe that no reform will be of any significant value and, in fact, will be counterproductive unless property rights are protected. This step is essential to reduce the extreme adverse conservation consequences of regulatory takings. Secondly is the reversal of the counterproductive and expansive interpretation of what constitutes harm. While there's increasing acknowledgement of the adverse conservation consequences caused by this punitive regulation, there is almost general recognition about the need to incorporate incentives into conservation. But to most effectively use incentives, it's essential to reduce and remove regulations, as landowners will not respond to an incentive put forth in one hand if they know that in the hand behind the back is a club. Without these two elements, private property rights protection and responsible clarification of the term harm, the coalition does not feel a reform proposal would address any of the program's underlying faults. The coalition unequivocally believes in full compensation for losses of private land use from regulatory takings and that the greater the protection of property rights, the greater the benefit to wildlife and the greater the potential to enlist landowners as allies in endangered species conservation. While the status quo environmental establishment opposes property rights protection and improving the definition of harm, they are clearly out of step with the public. A poll by the Terrence Group for Project Common Sense and a poll conducted for, that, for the Competitive Enterprise Institute both reveal the public is prepared and would be overwhelmingly supportive of a program which includes these measures and even more that would be adamantly opposed by the status quo environmental community. The public believes our endangered species program should be one in which states are on par with the federal government, if not vested with primary responsibility, that it should be based on incentives as well as provide for the protection of private property. These are all principles of the coalition. This type of thinking is not comprehensible to an environmental establishment wedded to wage and, wage and price control era policies. But we've learned a lot about big government's shortcomings since then. The current act is a, is a prime example of a failed, outdated law that needs to be replaced with one that works. Not a single endangered species has ever recovered from enforcement of the act's land use re reg regulations. This punitive regulatory scheme pits people against animals and both lose. Its fruits are not wildlife conservation, but bureaucracy, litigation, and strife. We need to replace this outdated policy with a more dynamic and creative one. Frankly, what our members would prefer is to trade in the old law for a new model rather than to attempt to make repairs. We do clearly recognize that the two provisions I have addressed, as well as other specific provisions, represent meaningful and significant reform to existing law. Indeed, without these key provisions, no amendment proposal could be considered a real change or garner our members' enthusiasm. 
Our coalition recognizes these provisions value and will work hard to educate the public on the importance of protecting private property so that private property may be used to protect nature and to tirelessly advocate our principles, ideas we are confident will serve as the basis of a new era in conservation. We commend you for the many provisions of your bill that correct serious flaws in the current law and thank you for the conviction to undertake these reforms and the opportunity to represent our views to you today. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm Benjamin Cohn, Jr. I live in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, I'm a private landowner. I represent myself and no organization. I have uh, 8,000 acres of timberland in eastern North Carolina. It was bought by my father in the 30s as a place where he could hunt, fish, and get away from his busy industrial life. He bought it. Consequently, when you look at his objective of buying the land, management of this land has primarily been for wildlife. Practices include plantings for wild. We plant chufa for turkey. We plant uh, autumn islands, autumn olives for turkey. We plant bicolor lespidiesel for quail. We plant corn for bear and deer and never harvest it. Going on, we burn regularly. Over the years, we've had very little timber harvesting. What timber harvesting has done has been mostly thinning, and we've put a lot of fire in the woods. Talk to most environmentalists, and the management of, of this property is ideal in the advice of environmentalists. The thanks I got, of course, this management, which creates ideal wildlife, created the habitat for an endangered species as well. The thanks I got from the U.S. government for these very expensive management practices for wildlife is 1,121 acres of timber I cannot cut unless, or I can cut it, but if there is a threat of a felony arrest with a maximum penalty of one year in jail plus $100,000 per incident, since I have 29 birds, you could translate that. I'm liable for 29 years in jail, $2,900,000 in fines. I think I could shoot my wife for less. <laughs> the, the economic loss of the timber I can't cut is $1,425,000. I have consequently decided to change the management practices of my land on the property other than the 1,125 acres that's impacted. I've gone into a massive clear-cutting <laughs> policy since finding the economic impacts of woodpeckers. I've now clear-cut about 700 acres. I have 300 more acres scheduled for uh, January or February of this year. I'm going to go to a 40-year rotation instead of the 80 to 90-year rotation. I'm going to eliminate burning. This hurts my soul it hurts 60 years of progressive management, and it is created through the financial impacts of the Endangered Species Act. Now, I want to read some comments. First of all, I understand the Young Pombo Bill, and I'd like to say it is a giant step in the right direction. But I don't think it's the best selection, because in my opinion, what it does, it, it puts an, it keeps the regulatory burden but then creates an overlay of what I call financial, not financial reward, but a break even. So, you, so you've added the financial, you've solved the financial problem, but haven't stopped the serious problem. And I'd like to read my suggestions on I th think of, and it's in my written testimony, and only this I will read, by the way. My recommendation is to Congress, cut out the negative incentives create some positive incentives if possible. Now, I'm going to expand on that. At the minimum, the Endangered Species Act should clearly regulate only direct harms to endangered species. Legal activities, such as development, timber harvesting, and other habitat modifications that indirectly affect endangered species should be exempt from regulation. Negative financial or regulatory effects on private property owners should be removed from the law. All efforts to protect, save, and manage for endangered species should be voluntary. Once these provisions are in effect, the next step 
is further encouragement. Congress could then provide financial incentives that would hasten the recovery and heighten the protection of endangered species. Examples of appealing incentives would include assistance with burning, government leasing of the property, tax relief, assistance in planting species, proper habitat, et cetera, et cetera, as far as the imagination can go. I appreciate uh, the courtesy of being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are going to recess. We have a vote going on right now. We're going to recess the committee temporarily, and we're going to run a vote, and we will be back as soon as possible. And I apologize for the inconvenience. Continue with this hearing in a few minutes. First, some programming information. The U.S. Senate returns today at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Members will begin debate on an $81 billion fiscal year 1996 Veterans and Housing and Urban Development Spending Bill. Funding for the Environmental Protection Agency and NASA are included in this legislation. See live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the Senate on C-SPAN 2. Cable in the classroom encourages the use of cable television for teaching and motivating students. As a member of Cable in the Classroom, C-SPAN's programming is made available free to educators across the country. Teachers can use C-SPAN to show students Congress, state and local politics, and public affairs. To find out more, contact your local school or call 1-800-743-5355. Cable in the Classroom is a free service of the cable television industry. Portland High School was the site of a recent panel discussion hosted by Time Warner Cable of New England. The forum, as Maine goes, focused on the 1996 elections from a Maine perspective. Let's, uh, let's start with our theme tonight, as Maine goes. Uh, that goes back... Uh, a number of years, I believe, Tony Corrado, to when Maine actually voted before the rest of the country uh, in September, and, and uh, the state was often viewed as a bellwether for uh, what the rest of the country was going to do. Well, I think the climate here in Maine, the country is increasingly catching up to it. That if you look in 92 and 94, as you said, it was independent voters who are most prominent political party in the state, and they exercise enormous political muscle here throughout the state, not only with Perot, but also in our gubernatorial and state legislative races where we actually had some success there amongst independent or Green Party candidates. And I think one of the parts of this phenomenon is the fact that we now have a Green Party in the state that is qualified for the ballot here and is looking to increase its role in Maine politics. And I think that if we look nationally, while it's not as extensive as it is here in Maine, it's clearly the case that there's enormous public dissatisfaction with the two major parties. I agree with what Tony has said in, in general. As far as how it plays out in Maine, I think that was pretty evident. We have an independent governor, we have a Republican-controlled Senate, and we have a marginally democratically controlled, well, actually the Senate is marginally controlled uh, by the Senate, uh, by the Republicans, and the, in the House we have, uh, so far anyway, democratic uh, control there. I do think this speaks to a broader question that the average person is, uh, is asking uh, both of their political parties and their government, their government actions in, in general. How are they affecting my life? And what I see going on, you know, with going back to the theme as Maine goes, what I do see going on politically speaking is a concern about the anxiety that the public has about their future. And that if you talk about the future and have a message that has to do with the economy, I think that uh, you're going to be grounded not only as a candidate but as a party or a movement in this state. And that can be even in the Green Party. 
which is a concern about the environment as a primary issue, but needs to and does tie it back to sustainability. Uh, when we contacted people and let, th let them know about the C-SPAN visit to Maine, they were really excited about it. It wasn't hard to convince them to come on. And I think with politicians, especially those in Maine who are, as they said during the debate, very accessible, it was really their pleasure to come and talk about their own views. And uh, they, especially because it was opinion-based and there wasn't a winner, it wasn't a debate format. So they weren't hard to persuade at, at all. And we've had great cooperation from the local high school, Portland High School, and everybody here, and the people at Time Warner. So it really was a, con a, a real concerted effort as a group, and it wasn't, it wasn't terrible to put together. We're really glad we did it. It was, it was a lot of fun. Today, the C-SPAN school bus is in Philadelphia, where the crew visits the Betsy Ross Museum and the Edgar Allan Poe House. We now continue with the House hearing on rewriting the Endangered Species Act. The 22-year-old bill requires the government to do everything it can to save all species from extinction. The hearing is chaired by Congressman Don Young of Alaska. We're going to call the hearing back to order, and the other members will be back as soon as they uh, get done with their vote. I appreciate the, all of your testimony. Mr. Cohn, you are correct in when you say that we did leave a lot of the regulatory stuff in there, and we did attempt to overlay the incentive-based system on, a, on what remains of the regulatory approach. But I hope you understand from, from listening to the other testimony that's been this morning so far and what you'll hear later on, that we have to prove that the incentive-based system will work. Even though we agree that that is a much better approach, and from a fundamental approach, a policy approach, I would much rather have an incentive-based system than a regulatory system. I think that we have to put the pieces in place in order to make that work. You know, but the even funnier and sadder to me is there are government policies that have worked directly against endangered species. And I'll give you a wonderful example, inheritance tax. And I know this is a different subject, but I've got to get my two cents in while I'm here. I guarantee you when my wife and I die, my children will have to cut every merchantable tree on the 8,000 acres to help pay the inheritance tax. No doubt about it, because there's not enough liquid assets elsewhere. So and inheritance tax hurts. Uh, another thing, we know that Smokey the major, Bear was I'm disastrous. I'm on a time limit. I'm sorry, Mr. Cohen. I know this is your chance, but... Uh, <laughs> They give me a time limit, too, and I can only ignore it for so long. But the, in, the inheritance tax is one of the issues that we have discussed in, in terms of an incentive-based approach and using that as one of the incentives on, on the Endangered Species Act. And as we begin to work our way through this, that will probably be one of the, the approaches that we do take in an incentive-based approach is doing something with inheritance tax. As, as a means of, of putting the incentives in the right place. We, uh, in the bill that we introduced, the companion bill that we introduced, 2286, we, we try to begin to do that so that we can, can make an incentive-based approach work. And, and I think that that's important. Mr. Bean, in your, in your testimony, I know that you brought up a lot of good ideas, and, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate the, uh, the, time that, the time that we have spoken um, over the past several months in trying to, to find common ground and ways that we can work together to make this work. The, I know that in order to, to uh, prove your point, you need anecdotal statements, you need anecdotal stories, you need to... Uh, turn up the heat on the rhetoric a little bit in order to get your point across. Um, but a lot of times what comes out of it is not exactly accurate. And if you talk about, 
you know, what happens with the smugglers and, and what could possibly happen. Now, in, in the way that we drafted the bill, we may need to tighten up the provisions that deal with people trying to smuggle endangered species or parts thereof in. And I appreciate that, that part of it and that, that you brought that out. But our bill in no way legalizes people smuggling in parts of endangered species. And, and that, that's not, not an accurate statement. And it's not a statement I made. What I said was that the um, effect of your bill will force the Fish and Wildlife Service to turn back to smugglers the contraband they bring in. And I based my statement, sir, on uh, discussions I had with Fish and Wildlife Service uh, forensic, uh, wildlife law enforcement forensic laboratory personnel who described to me the nature of the tests necessary and the duration that those tests require, um, consume, the time they consume to be uh, carried out. And, and that was the basis for my statement that uh, what, you, what the effect of your bill will be, the practical effect, will be to force the Fish and Wildlife Service to return to smugglers but you know, the illegal and, items. And again, I'm on a time limit, but you know very well that that was not the intention of the bill nor the reason that those provisions were put in there. And if, if you have other language which would take care of that possible problem that may exist, I'd be more than happy to, to continue our discussions and, and work with you. Mr. Moore, the, you, the organization that you represent represents large property owners, small property owners. Is a combination of, of all of those? or A combination. With, in your experience with the Endangered Species Act, have the, the larger property owners, uh, you heard mentioned here today Plum Creek and, and a few other uh, examples of people who have been, been able to work the current Endangered Species Act and come out of it. In your experience, have you been familiar with small and medium-sized property owners that have had the ability to, to come to some of those agreements and, and to work their way out of those problems? Well, that's where the, the rub really, really hits. You're quite right that a big company, while they don't like the way the law works and while they think they ought to be compensated, they certainly have more wherewithal to be able to set aside pro a property for a wildlife uh, habitat and going to a conservation program. It's when you get to the smaller landowner, well, they simply don't have that ability. If you own 200 acres of trees and you're told that really 100 acres of that is needed to protect a certain endangered species, they don't have the financial ability to be able to do that. So uh, in your experience, you, would, you think that the provisions that protect private property rights in this bill would have a larger impact on the small and medium-sized property owners who may not have the resources to, to fight the federal government that the very large property owners do? I think the impact is the same on whatever size a landowner. Namely, they're paid for any land which they lose the use of the right of the use of to protect endangered species. Where the impact you're getting at may come in is you may find more landowners willing to work with the government who are now scared and don't have the ability to be able to deal with an endangered species. Thank you. My time has expired. Mr. Saxton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this hearing today that has gone on now for quite some time reminds me of, a, of something that happened to me when I went to Israel not long ago. I was with some Israeli officials and we were discussing issues that had to do with Israeli security and I noticed that around the room there were a number of different um, ideas as to what the situation was and what ought to be done and I said to the folks in Israel, how do you all make a decision? It seems like you've got as many opinions as there, as there could possibly be. And they said, well, there's an old Israeli saying, you put 100 Israelis in a room and you get 200 opinions. And uh, this bill uh, reminds me of, uh, of, of that occurrence. Uh, what, uh, what I think our real task is, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to share this with the panel and ask for their input, uh, our, our real task here, in my view, is to find common ground. Our real task here is to, is to find an approach that works. Maybe it's the chairman's approach. Maybe it's not. Maybe with the chairman's approach with some modifications, I don't know at this point. But let me tell you what I did in my search for uh, common ground. I, I tried to find um, some, um, uh, some, some areas of convergence uh, with regard to a lot of these proposals. And I'll tell you frankly what I did. I just passed out this spreadsheet which has my, my name and, and Mr. Pombo's, Mr. Gilchrist across the top along with a column called Current Law, which is the current uh, ESA bill. 
And uh, my staff uh, did some research and found out that the Western Governors Association had an approach which appealed to me. It appealed to me because it made a lot of common sense. It appealed to me because it uh, adopted some things that were in current law, and it appealed to me because there were some new things in it, which I thought the folks out in the hinterlands who had been elected by their constituents as governors um, had come together to say were good new ideas. And my bill, with uh, two or three very small changes, is the Western Governor Association's proposal. And um, in looking at it, um, in comparing it with others, I find that there's also a great deal of uh, commonality with Gilchrist, and there's some with Pombo, and there's quite a bit with, with current law. I guess my question is, if each of you were, were to be able to, to make one or two comments relative to the Western Governors Association approach, which you'll have to take my word for, it's under my name, uh, what would you say about it? And if you would like to say that there is something in one of the other columns that you think ought to be slid over there, or that something in, the, in my approach ought to be slid over to Pombos, just give us some ideas about how we can begin to come together on, on some of these ideas to create an approach that we can form a consensus around. Mr. Bean, would you like to start? Yes, sir, I'd be happy to. Uh, I think there are many good ideas in the Western Governors Association uh, proposed bill. Um, I note that they, that bill does not make the major changes in the responsibilities of federal agencies and private landowners that the bill currently before this committee does, and I think that is the preferred approach. Um, I would also say that the Western Governors uh, approach does not uh, burden the various processes that must be carried out in implementing this act with the sorts of requirements that I described for the bald eagle, processes and requirements that, in my judgment, will, will really paralyze this program. Uh, so I would encourage you, in, in examining these various alternatives, to look for those alternatives that can accomplish the objectives that you are pursuing efficiently and uh, with only those requirements that are really necessary to make this program work efficiently and effectively. My, my concern is that in the uh, enthusiasm for uh, making sure that the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, never makes a mistake in anything it does, it is being asked to do the impossible too many times by the bill that this committee has introduced. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moore? I have not had the time to really uh, study your provision. We certainly find some things in the Western Governor's legislation we like as well, but the thing that stands out right now, we're looking at it trying to figure out where else it interrelates is the lack of compensation. Uh, that to us is a major failure in what we see that, that you've shown us. In other words, in the Pombo bill where, where properties diminish by a certain percentage, 20% uh, or whatever the, whatever the right number is, you would favor that type of, a, of an approach to compensation? Yes. Well, Congressman, um, I think there are a number of areas of common ground uh, in these various proposals that, that you have made that Mr. Gilchrist is working on, uh, the, the Western Governors Association is working on. The whole notion of preventing endangerment is something that we strongly support. The best way to head off these uh, endangered species train wrecks is to, to prevent them from happening in the first place. And so looking at ways to protect species before they get to the point where they have to be listed is something that, that is uh, highly warranted. In addition, uh, we support improving the recovery planning process, putting some deadlines on the process, putting some uh, objective, scientifically based criteria for recovering a species and for delisting a species. In addition, um, involving all of the stakeholders in the process, the federal government, the state and local governments, industries that are affected, the environmental community, private landowners, all of those folks. Yeah. We've Thank you. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the changes that I made to the Western Governor's proposal is that we did put deadlines uh, in the recovery plans uh, proposal. To, uh, um, and you can read those there for yourself. But thank you very much. Yes, sir. Well, without having had time to review this, yes, uh, it's a little difficult, but three things jump out, I think, or at least two, and that's the definition of take. The uh, Young Pombo Bill certainly uh, is preferable uh, in that respect. Uh, Landowner voluntary agreements is a component of all, and that's something that we've absolutely been promoting and that we believe ultimately will provide a, a lot more species uh, recovery and maintenance than the, the current system. And then compensation, as has already been mentioned, uh, uh, 
uh, we absolutely have to uh, have some compensation for property takings. Thank you. Uh, a comment that uh, other folks have already made, but I'd have to say most importantly is that there's no, uh, uh, the only uh, mark here that has a property rights protection uh, provision is Young Pombo. And additionally, the uh, definition of take. Uh, if those uh, two elements are not addressed, the perverse incentives under the current law remain, uh, which is why this uh, law has not functioned well. Um, just in the brief time that I've had to review this, I'd say there's one other item on, on the delisting. It says you have uh, specific, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, that's the Gilcrest proposal. Um, but in current law and the Gilcrest proposal assumes that all species can be recovered. Um, that's probably just not a reality. There are things like the Iowa Pleistocene snail that are, uh, you know, relics of another geological era. And um, it, it just isn't going to happen in their existing natural habitat. Thank you. Mr. Cohn, do you care to comment? I'm not, I don't know anything really about the Western Governor's bill, but I've got to reiterate, any bill that approaches the private landowner that he is an enemy of the environment is so out of whack, it's scary. If you look at the SIP program uh, and the FIP program, Forestry Incentives, Steward Incentives programs, not, I can't give you the exact number, but I'll bet you nine out of ten either have wildlife first, second, or third. So obviously, <laughs> private landowners love their land. They love to hunt. They love to fish. They love to look at it. They love to enjoy it. They don't want to harm it. Any approach that starts with they're the bad guys won't work. Thank you very much, Mr. Gomez. Chairman, I know I went well beyond my time, so I'll uh, turn back to the... Uh, well, I appreciate the question, Mr. Saxon. I think you can appreciate the difficulty which we went through in drafting our bill just from the answers that we got from this panel. You have one person in the panel who states that we have to bring everybody into the process, you know, states, local government, you know, all of the, the stakeholders, and the other person... Uh, criticizes that provision as having to call in too many people into the system. So, you know, it, it is difficult to try to bring everyone in and not have a crowded room. I mean, that's the facts that we're faced with, and, and that was the difficulty and one of the difficulties in putting this together. Mr. Gilchrist, unless you want to pass. Run for a 30-yard dash to the goal line. No, just. You'll be tackled on the five. Uh, then I'll, no, I won't pass. I'm going to go for it. Let's see what happens. Uh, I, I do wish we had a, a more, this, this is an excellent panel here. You represent a, a wide view of, of interest in the United States. That's what we need here to, to create a, a bill that is much more flexible and, and, and aspires to the goal of, of protecting, I think, what, what all of us have become much more aware of, and that's biological diversity in the country. Uh, since I am limited in my time, what I would like to do is, I'm going to start off with Mr. Stallman, but the, the question I asked Mr. Stallman is the premise upon which my next questions will be asked, and I would like each person on the panel, when I ask that question after Mr. Stallman, just to respond with one sentence. And I know it's difficult to respond in, in, in the complexity uh, of this particular issue, but rather than focus in on one or two items, uh, I'd like to do it from, uh, from that perspective. We're talking about um, biological diversity, uh, and we talk of, I think everybody understands the need for um, biological diversity, Certain, certainly agriculture, as far as um, genetic diversity in a whole range of whether it's corn or soybeans or milo or pigs or cattle or whatever it is, there, there is a, a certain importance of, of genetic diversity. Um, if we look in the medical field, and we see a whole range of recent uh, chemical agents as far as discoveries are concerned, uh, from certain frogs that provide painkiller that's 200, 200 times stronger than morphine, uh, and yet it's not addicting. Digitalis, um, we have uh, heart medicine from a ra full range of species, cancer treatment from the, the yew tree, and, and the list goes on and on and on. So I think everybody recognizes the importance of protecting biological diversity, or at least we're getting pretty close to that point. And how do we do that in, in a bill that is trying to find a sense of cooperation among landowners 
among all of Americans to participate in that protection. And a variety of people have mentioned incentives, and the Keystone Report, I think, is right on. And the chairman has made some bills extracted from the Keystone Report to provide those incentives. And we need to stop the, the polarizing of, we don't want an act, it's bad for the West, it's not good for the East, or it is good for the East. We're one country, so we've got to stick together. Uh, and we're trying to work this through this bill. Mr. Stallman, just a sentence. Apologize. <laughs> How important is genetic diversity in agriculture? Genetic diversity is important in agriculture. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. We're on a roll here. We're on a one-yard line, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now what I would like to do, starting over with Mr. Bean, and just, just a sentence. Um, as, as far as the bill now is, if we change the definition of harm, uh, what will this do to habitat protection? Can I use a semicolon in a sentence? <laughs> <laughs> the definition of harm will have a profound effect upon the protection that species receive uh, on private lands, an effect that will, in my judgment, um, largely render irrelevant the uh, compensation provision about which Mr. Tozan and others here have talked at length because as a result of that redefinition there will not be circumstances in which private landowners will be in a position to claim compensation because they will never have suffered any sort of regulatory imposition upon their use of their land. Thank you. Mr. Moore. The definition in the chairman's bill will resolve a controversy over what that term means. And we do not think in the beginning it was designed or intended to conserve habitat, and habitat needs to be provided for another way other than through the, the, the current law's definition. Thank you. Mr. Irwin. The bill's redefinition of harm means that regardless of the ultimate impact on a species' survival and recovery, that unless you can show a corpse, you will not have a take under the Endangered Species Act. Mr. Stallman, if you want, you can tell everybody what Milo is, as opposed, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Sorghum. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, prevent direct harm to a member of the species uh, while <clears throat> limiting the formerly uh, arbitrary and uh, overly expansive uh, regulatory rulings by the Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, in doing so, reduce the uh, perverse incentives to provide habitat on private property. Thank you. The gentleman from North Carolina, and I hope we can pass that estate tax really fast so your kids can hold on to those trees. Well, I hope you've got 30 years, sir, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to pass this act. Um, you know, I, I, I am... Uh, I am really not sp smart enough to comment on the value of biodiversity. It's too large for a small private landowner that was a math and German major and not a biology major. Well, sir, I think you gave a, a, an excellent testimony this morning that was very eloquent. And I am sincere in working here in this Congress, not in the next Congress, but in this Congress, to create those incentives so that your children do not have to sell one square inch of that land. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Chenoweth. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Cohen, I <clears throat> I uh, enjoyed reading about you today in the Wall Street, uh, in the Washington Times. Um, I'm sorry that you've had to go through what you've had to go through, um, and I I, sh I share the sentiments of my colleague and hoping that this become this is resolved right away. It's interesting that we have. We have military people down in Fort Benning, Georgia, using military time to lay out the grid for the breeding habitat of the red cocated woodpecker, and we're altering. Miss uh, Chenoweth, uh, I don't want to interrupt you, but if you will delay your questions until we return from the vote, I think that you'll be able to ask them in, all in a row, because if, if you start now, we are going to end up having to leave before you finish. So if you wouldn't mind, we could recess and, and do our vote, and then you could ask all your questions at once. Certainly, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, again, we have a vote on the floor. We will recess temporarily and return as fast as we can.
we're going to call the hearing back to order, and I'll warn you ahead of time that we're under a five-minute open rule on the floor, so we don't know when votes are going to come, but we'll try to move as quickly as we can. When we recess, Mrs. Chenoweth was just beginning her questions, and at this time I will yield to her. Ms. Chenoweth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohn, I was just remarking that down there in the, around Fort Benning, Georgia, they're laying out grids for the breeding habitat of the red cocated woodpecker, and that's what we're having our military people do now. Instead of, instead of laying out grids on Saddam Hussein and what his activities are. So I, I you know, I, I was uh, surprised at your, and sor very sorry about the story that I read in your testimony and that I also read about in the Washington Times, but thank goodness it was, it provoked the media attention that it did. Um, Kathleen, I wanted to ask you, have you reviewed the Young Pombo Bill? Pardon me? Have you reviewed the Young Pombo Bill? I, I haven't reviewed in thoroughly the most recent version of it, but I have read it, yes. Okay. Um, as you know, this has very systematically and, and in an organized manner set out 20 separate sections. And in the past, we've seen the federal government agencies take great license in interpreting various provisions of the United States Code and the regulatory process. Can you tell me if my ranchers in the Runal Valley or the timber mills in Orofino will be able to conduct their business and protect their property rights in light of the regulatory atmosphere that, that uh, has prevailed and may continue? I think it's been very difficult for people who operate on federal lands or have private property adjacent to federal lands in the West to operate in a, an appropriate manner under the current regulatory scheme of the Endangered Species Act. Um, personally, I, when I reviewed looking at the, the eight, 1973 Act, I don't believe the regulators ha are really regulating to the full extent that they could under that law. Um, I think uh, Chairman Pombo and has made an effort to try and put some restrictions on how far the regulators can go and to try and bring, a, some ba bring balance into how this law is administered. Um, my, one of my primary concerns is that the law, the 19, 1973 law, did not take into consideration that extinctions are part of the natural process. And if you look at the geologic record, you can see throughout time that extinctions have occurred. Uh, we're all familiar that the dinosaurs uh, were here for, for several uh, million, millions of years, and they're not here any longer, and they disappeared long before man ever emerged as a species. I think that uh, Congressman Pombo has uh, put that into the findings of his bill, and I think that is will lead us in a direction where we can make better choices about how this law is, is administered and regulated. I'm still concerned that regulators will push that envelope as far as they can to really put constraints on what people can do. And I think often it's based on uh, just mis misinformation and uh, misguided objectives. We are part of the natural process. And I think many people that work in the out of doors have a much greater conservation ethic than many people who live in urban areas. They live there. They've been there all their lives. There are generations of, of, of families that have established a good uh, stewardship, environmental stewardship. And um, I think that we need to be very careful with the regulations that are promulga promulgated with uh, any new law. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to ask Mr. Moore, Henson Moore, um, as we've seen with the spotted owl in many other um, instances, and of course the spotted owl decision with regard to Sweet Home was devastating to us all because we certainly 
some of us thought, I'm sure including you, thought that private property would be protected. Uh, based on an assumption of a whole body of law before the, this, the Sweet Home decision. But the Endangered Species Act has created some real undesired train wrecks, especially in uh, the forest uh, paper industry, with the multitude of government regulations and their effect on local economies. Many times these problems would not have occurred if there would have been a process in place in which a stringent review would have been done on the Secretary of Interior's recommendations with regards to what effect it would have on the economy. And that has not been done primarily because they bypass the NEPA process in preference for the biological opinion, uh, which is, is distorting the purpose of the law. After reading this new bill, <clears throat> I've noticed that the Secretary still maintains his position of having the final say or veto power on virtually every federal decision. Unless this is changed, how are we going to avoid, avoid future train wrecks? And do you agree with my conclusion? I think I know where you're, you're going. Um, uh, Congresswoman, but I'm, I'm not sure we can come to the same conclusion you do, that there are parameters on any agency and that uh, ultimately that this, this has to be dealt with in court. So I'm not, I'm not sure we can agree with your, your conclusion. I think ultimately probably some of the biggest train wrecks have occurred in court, such as Sweet Home, and, and one of our biggest problems is that people cannot afford to go to court anymore. But um, I would like for you to be sure and take a look at, at um, page uh, 82, beginning at line 16, and, and get back to me with regards to my question. We certainly will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had a couple of uh, follow-up questions for the panel before, before you excuse or before someone else comes in. Um, Mr. Cohn, I was told that you recently filed a, a claim, a takings claim under the Endangered Species Act. Is that correct? That is correct. It was filed at the end of, uh, I think it was about the end of uh, July. No, yeah, end of July it was filed. Uh, it's for $1,425,000 taking under the Endangered Species Act. It's mine and my lawyer's understanding that this is the first takings case only under the Endangered Species Act without 404 permits tied in or some other thing. Uh, it's installed, delaying for another meeting with Fish and Wildlife Service to see if we can compromise or work something out. I'm not sure what will happen, but the next action, I guess, is not in the court, but a private meeting October the 12th between my gang and their gang, I guess, is the way to describe it. So it's up to the attorneys? Not totally. If I can work something out with the Fish and Wildlife Service, I'd be glad to. But it's got to be reasonable and sensible. Uh, but attorneys will be there. Biologists will be there. Foresters will be there. Uh, it, it'll be a big group but not the legal. It will be a private meeting to see if we can compromise, see if we can work this out. In your experience as to what you've been through and, and you've testified to what happened in your case, to the extent that you have gone in taking this and filing a takings claim and, and where you are right now, in the process, is this something that the average property owner could undertake? I don't think so. I've got about $70,000 invested so far in professional, I mean, in legal help and expenses. Uh, it's, I'm estimating legal fees, if it continues on, will be 
another hundred to hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. I don't think the uh, average small landowner is willing to take it on. Their solution is different. All of my neighbors at this point have clear cut all of their timber. They've just solved their problem. So, their res their response to the current Endangered Species Act was to destroy the habitat. Absolutely, I can't I can't impugn someone's motives that I don't without testimony from or asking, but you look at the ground and there's a lot of timber missing that was there four years ago. And your response to the implementation of the current act was not only to destroy the habitat, but also to go to court over it. Not exactly, because if I destroy the habitat, I go to jail. Not, I'm, just, I'm just making sure they don't expand by destroying the habitat they could move into. I mean, birds do it, bees do it. I'm just saying, you got 1,100 acres, you're not going to get any more. I'm clear-cutting extra habitat is that outside of the, the restricted part that habitat. is not covered by the 1,100 acres. The 1,100 acres. I, I understand that. <laughs> please, don't, please don't say I'm cutting in the 1,100 restricted area. <laughs> I'm not saying you cut any of those 1,100 acres. <laughs> That, Mr. Uh, Shattig, I will yield to you if you have your questions prepared. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do. Um, Mr. Bean, uh, Mr. Saxon kind of started uh, where I wanted to start, and that was by pointing out that one of our goals here ought to be to identify where we have common ground. Um, we can find lots of places where we may be miles apart. That's probably not a very productive exercise. I think it would be more productive to focus on areas where we are in agreement. Um, I have been of the view and have expressed it uh, in Arizona in my district that uh, those most concerned with the protection of species ought to, at least in my logic, and perhaps I'm mistaken, embrace the, c the notion of compensation. That, um, that if what we do with compensation is create habitat or facilitate the creation of habitat, or facilitate the protection of species, that we are advancing a goal that those who are concerned about losing species ought to agree with. Um, I guess I'd like to know how you view the issue of compensation, if you see it the way I see it or see it radically differently. In this bill, as I said earlier, I think you were not in the room at the time, I view uh, the issue of compensation as a red herring because I believe that the um, uh, changes that this bill makes in the requirements applicable to private landowners negates uh, any possibility of a situation arising when compensation would be uh, owing. I do believe, however, that it's extremely important to offer incentives to private landowners to get them to do the sorts of things on their land that would be beneficial to endangered species. I commended Mr. Pombo for having introduced a tax bill and another bill that both have as their purpose creating those incentives. Uh, I would echo the sentiments that members of this committee have uh, stated today that the Keystone Center recent report on incentives contains a great many good ideas along those lines. I think that, um, and, and parenthetically I would add that Mr. Uh, Pombo's bill on reforming estate tax law would, um, according to my calculations based on Mr. Cohn's filings in the Court of Claims, would result in a net estate tax reduction for him of between four and six million dollars. In other words, uh, two or three times the amount that he has been, uh, uh, he claims a loss as a result of uh, the restrictions today. So those sorts of incentives seem to me to be the best and most appropriate way to deal with the private landowner issue. My, my time's limited. You got to my second point before I got there, which was to see how you feel about incentives. I'm glad we're in agreement on the issue of incentive, but let's go back to compensation. You believe that for reasons uh, dealing with other things in this bill that you're not willing to take the compensation portion of the bill as genuine or bona fide. But I did, that didn't get an answer to my question. My question is, as a general concept mm -hmm. uh, in legislation designed to protect species and to advance the goal we all agree with, would you not agree, or do you, do you or do you not agree that compensation is an important, should be an important part of the process? My feelings about compensation are as follows. I, I believe strongly that landowners should be compensated for any taking of their property in violation of the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. I believe equally strongly, however, that it is a mistake 
and a slippery slope for Congress to begin going down to compensate people when they have not suffered a taking and they are not entitled to compensation under the Fifth Amendment. I certainly see no basis for extending compensation to people when they are not entitled to it under the Constitution when the issue is endangered species and not when it's some other issue. I think once you start down that road on this issue, there is no logical place to stop on any number of other issues. Let's go back. I think what a fine place is where we agree. You embrace the comp concept of compensation as you, in, in those circumstances where you say the Supreme Court has said it should occur. I quite frankly believe as a lawyer, and as a lawyer who practiced eight years in the Arizona Attorney General's office, relying upon case law precedent as the only way that we deal with how to resolve these issues is a mistaken one. We would never have passed an, you know, any number of laws uh, had we not, had we just said, well, the courts dealt with that, that's good enough. Uh, instead, the Congress's job, I think, is to fill in the gaps. Judges write a decision for one specific instance. Um, they do not look at what we're supposed to look at, which is creating uh, a different situation. There, there are two um, issues. Two uh, my time is really limited. I want to ask uh, Mr. Gordon. Yeah, somebody just handed me the classic note, which is the Civil Rights Act. I mean, I didn't use it because it always gets used. Um, we would not have enacted the Civil Rights Act had we just wanted to rely on the Supreme Court's decisions at those times. Uh, Mr. Gordon, I want to ask you to talk uh, about the issue of incentives and about the climate that the current law creates, and quite frankly, even though this is uh, Mr. Pombo's hearing, about the climate that a certain other bill uh, introduced yesterday might create, which would create a different climate uh, for the protection of endangered species. Uh, clearly, my opinion, and I think the majority of the members of the coalition believe that the current law uh, causes a, uh, a climate of conflict between uh, property owners and property managers and land use regulators. Uh, the best thing, uh, in our opinion, you can, you can do to alleviate that is to go to an entirely non-regulatory system. I mean, there's, there's just no way about it. Um, no better way to go about it. There's obviously perverse incentives created under this law, as you uh, have heard today from the personal experience of Mr. Cohn. And it's not just Mr. Cohn. It's people all over the place. If you go to Texas, uh, you'll find that the cost of cedar posts has uh, uh, dropped dramatically uh, since the uh, black cap burial and golden cheek warbler um, have become, uh, have had a, tr a dramatic effect. Uh, on land values. If you have uh, cedar growing on your property, you may not get a bird letter, so you can't, you can't build a single family home or something without, uh, without getting this permit. Uh, as a result, people don't want cedar. Uh, people that had no reason to uh, be an enemy of a cedar tree on their private property have, t have turned against it, and uh, the, the uh, price has plummeted. The, the current system uh, basically functions like a Soviet five-year plan. We just demand that something's going to happen and totally ignore the reality of human behavior and uh, that we could, get, uh, uh, we could get to where we want to be a lot easier if we worked on an incentive and a cooperative basis rather than uh, th this, this uh, absolute uh, conflict between regulators and regulated uh, folks. Everybody wants to uh, conserve endangered species, and it's ridiculous to turn stewards of uh, private land against them. Mr. Chairman, I know my time's expired, but let me just make a, a couple of quick comments. One, I, I, I want to reiterate again, given the proportion of endangered species which do appear on private land, I think it is absolutely essential that we figure out a structure which encourages private pr property owners to cooperate. A and I will tell you, the best analogy that I've been able to come up with, and I've struggled with it, is um, I can, with my 13-year-old daughter and my 9-year-old son, issue them an edict. You will go to bed at 9 o'clock, and that works. We are not dealing with children when we're talking about private property owners in America. And I, I just happen to believe the command or, or this is the rule and you must follow it will work in the instance where we see it, but the implications for all other private pro property landowners to just say, oh, they're going to force my neighbor to do this? Well. I'm going to make sure they can't force me to do that, creates a climate in which we are not advancing the goal of the Endangered Species Act, but retarding it. Thank you. I just have one final question for Michael Bean, then, I'll, then we can dismiss this panel. But Mr. Bean, in, in the definition of take, a lot of times when, when we think of endangered species, we think of the pristine wilderness and, and cutting down trees and all this stuff. 
And we fail to think about what's really happening. The, the other and, and with your of harm so that um, uh, individual landowners will have a much greater level of certainty about what they can and can't do than they currently have with the existing definition. In, in the bill that 2275, the bill that's before us right now, we attempt to do that by requiring that they define in the conservation plan what the definition of take would be with each individual species because there is a difference between aquatic species, between uh, species in the forest, between species in farmland, and, and what the definition of take is. And, and I think it was Mrs. Chenoweth that said earlier, or no, excuse me, it was you <laughs> who said earlier that the law is not being taken to its extreme right now in some cases. In some isolated cases, yes it is, but in other cases they could go much further. If they took the, the law to the extreme that they have with the spotted owl and did that with the fairy shrimp, we would literally shut down the valley in Central California. And so there are differences. Well, with respect to the, the authorization in your bill f in a conservation plan to, to have that plan define in some way what the scope of the take prohibition should be, uh, I understand that to mean that discretion exists within the limits otherwise set forth in the Act as to what uh, take and harm mean. I do not understand that provision to mean that through a conservation plan the Secretary can embrace a harm prohibition that encompasses um, habitat protection. Um, I, think I, we're, I think we're debating on on a different on a different level. I think we agree on it, but I think, for the sake of argument, we're debating. But, um, Mr. Shattuck, you had an additional question. If we have time for a second round, I'd be happy to do it. Um, <laughs> great, I'll do it. Um, uh, let me just, uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Bean you this question and then if others want to comment it on, they can. One of the things that I have encountered in learning about the ESA and its implications in Arizona um, and, and in conversations with people kind of on the ground uh, on forest issues and on marine issues is an, an internal conflict in the current law, which is the command that you manage for the endangered species when in fact it's only a matter of time until in any given arena there are multiple endangered species. And, uh, and so it's, what I have been told is that 
uh, in the years that we've been under the act, Fish and Wildlife Service started out saying, this is the law, you will do this, by gosh, and everybody beneath them took that as the edict. That was all driven by a command to protect and identified endangered species. Guess what? Time's gone by, they now discover in the same habitat there's another endangered species. And now, what if to protect the habitat for this species, we do things to damage the, hab the habitat necessary to protect the other species? And I think that's a structural problem which we need to deal with. I'd be interested in if you agree it's a problem and how you think it should be dealt with. Well, that, that in fact is one of the issues that the National Academy of Sciences report on science and the Endangered Species Act explicitly addressed. And what they found is that while there is the potential for that to occur, it has not occurred heretofore. And they uh, concluded that it is not likely to be a serious problem in the future. Let me, let me add my own view that if the strategies we employ to protect the species that are currently listed focus on protecting their habitat, then it is not likely that we're going to have many other species dependent upon those same habitats being added to the list. If, on the other hand, we try to protect species now on the list by relying upon captive breeding and other artificial measures while doing nothing to maintain the habitat, then we will assuredly have more species uh, being added to the list that depend upon that habitat that we're not protecting. Well, I don't know of anybody that is arguing we ad ought to do nothing to protect habitat. I, I guess, I don't, to me, that's a red herring argument. Does anyone else want to comment on that particular point? Yes, sir. Well, Congressman, um, the Endangered Species Act, since it was enacted in 1973, has clearly provided that one of its purposes is to conserve the ecosystems upon which threatened and endangered species depend. And uh, there is much more that can be done in that regard to make the act more effective for conserving ecosystems. But the bill that is before this committee will undermine the ability to do that in a number of ways. So let me just give you one example. This bill provides for the establishment of cooperative management agreements um, to, to take over the management of a particular area for endangered species. Once one of those agreements is in place, all of the usual provisions of the Act are suspended, including the ability to list species in the future in that area. So once you, once you um, make a decision under these cooperative management agreements, you will never be able to do anything to adjust that in the future. Um, I'm not familiar with that particular provision. I have some doubts about its characterization, but it's section, it section 102. Pardon me? Um, uh, let me ask you a second point. Well, let me tell you, you say the Act does that. I will tell you, on the ground in Arizona, um, the forest managers that I talk to tell me that Fish and Wildlife is giving the, was giving them uh, certain edicts to begin with, and then, now that they've recognized that there are competing species that need to be dealt with, or at least to be concerned about, the Fish and Wildlife Service has had a change of attitude, and now rather than issuing edicts, across the street in Albuquerque saying, Albuquerque saying, you will do X, they're actually walking across the street and saying, we've got a problem here. What, you know, what, what do you think we should do? And they're actually managing for multiple species. Let me ask a second question. Um, one of my concerns is the issue of the protection of all habitat everywhere it is found. Um, one of the issues that's arisen in uh, the southern part of my state is um, whether or not a particular area is in fact habitat for a particular species, when we know that there are literally millions of, ac of acres of other habitat for that same species, it seems to me there is a danger of overreaching. And it seems to me the current law creates pure incentives for, those, for that overreaching. Indeed, I think the one thing that's wrong with the current law is that it drives Fish and Wildlife Service personnel to the most extreme position. If the issue is do we list or do we not list? The only way they can be criticized is if they don't list. If the issue is do we create a habitat of 80 acres or 800 ac acres, the only way they can avoid being criticized is to create a habitat of 800 acres. And, and everything in that dynamic takes them to the absolute extreme. And oh, by the way, concerned citizens standing in the middle, otherwise called environmentalists, drive them further and further out at every turn. Now, what effect does that produce over here on the other side where you have private property owners? The effect it produces is not, gee, I'm a concerned American. I want my children to have a biodiverse uh, uh, 
environment to inherit and my grandchildren and their grandchildren. So I want to cooperate. It creates the exact opposite. Um, and I guess uh, I'd like to hear from anybody who thinks that uh, we ought to look at some way to examine whether or not we preserve all habitat for every species and every subspecies wherever it is found. And if you don't see a, a problem with that. Mr. Gordon. Uh, I, clearly, I think you're on to something uh, important. Um, under the current uh, definition of take, uh, it requires in cases people to manage or, or not undertake specific activities to affect habitat that may not even be occupied uh, by a species. It may just have the type of tree they prefer. For example, there's a woman in Texas who for years was struggling to get a permit to build her house. Um, and it was either one or two reasons. One was because she lived near uh, uh, some habitat that had cedar in it. Uh, and the only other possible reason would have been that she had one cedar tree on her property. She eventually did get this, but only after coming up here to testify. Um, the uh, protection has been extended in cases to, uh, or, or theoretically, you'd be guilty of a take um, for driving through uh, tire ruts. Uh, where fairy shrimp have bred when uh, water's collected uh, from, from rainfall. Uh, there's a case in um, New Mexico, I believe, where the uh, sole existing habitat of uh, something called the Socorro isopod is a 20-meter uh, piece of drain pipe and a watering trough that one fellow has on his uh, uh, ranch. Uh, you know, it, it is rather extreme uh, in that regard, absolutely. Mr. Shadid, can I offer an observation about sure. your uh, remark uh, to the effect that the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, invariably uh, asks for the maximum in protection? There is, in fact, uh, only one peer-reviewed study of uh, recovery plans, a study that appeared in Science Magazine about a year ago. And the purpose of this study was to assess the uh, recovery objectives in the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, recovery plans. And what the conclusion of this peer-reviewed Science Magazine article was, was that the Fish and Wildlife Service systematically sets objectives for recovery that are biologically indefensible because they are too low. Rather than doing, as you suggest, setting objectives too high and unattainable and unrealistic, they in fact, uh, it was the conclusion of this peer-reviewed article that they in fact were too low and consistently too low. Well, if that's true, then we better be moving towards compensation. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Me, because, because they are already effectively taking landowners' land. And, and, and well, to some degree, this may be dealt with by the difference between private and public lands. And maybe they could get more extreme in their uh, plans for recovery on public lands uh, if, they, if they go much further for their, in their recovery plans on private lands. I don't see how we are going to be able to achieve that without compensating people. I mean, maybe I, I was not going to ask you this quote, but the quote from today's Washington Times is in fact attributed to you, Mr. Bean. Um, and it says, despite nearly a quarter century of protection as an endangered species, the red cockaded woodpecker is closer to extinction than it was a quarter of a century ago when protection began. There may be a technical explanation for that, but unfortunately, I think the truth is for way too many species, the current law has led us to where we are in the same situation <clears throat> for many species. So I, I'm mm -hmm. just not convinced, and I'm pretty well convinced you're not convinced, that the current law is working. Well, let me <laughs> just say about that statement, which is an accurate quote and one I would repeat today. Um, however, the context in which that statement was made was in describing a new approach to endangered species, or to, to red cockaded woodpecker conservation in the Sand Hills area of North Carolina, an approach with which um, I was very much involved as a result of working with landowners there over a period of years. It is an approach that is called now a safe harbor approach. The purpose of that approach, approach was to remove the threat of added um, Endangered Species Act restrictions on private land use as a result of landowners undertaking actions that would enhance or create habitat for red cockaded woodpeckers. And in fact, uh, since that program has been um, initiated earlier this year, uh, it has been enthusiastically embraced by landowners there. It is being done under the existing Endangered Species Act. There was no need to amend the law to accomplish that. Uh, and in fact, uh, I believe that as a result of um, uh, that program there, if it is replicated elsewhere, 
the statement that I made more than a year ago about the red-cockaded woodpecker continuing to decline will, in fact, uh, no longer be true in the future. As a result of cooper the cooperation of private landowners. I think that's wonderful. Under I mean, the existing <laughs> Endangered Species Act. That is correct. Um, I suppose one last open-ended question for us lawyers. Open-ended question, open questions are always dangerous. Um, in Arizona, we have situations where um, uh, people use certain provisions of the Endangered Species Act openly acknowledging that that's not their goal. They really don't care about the species they are using to achieve an objective. It's for a different objective. I will tell you that I think is occurring in many places across America. I think it is undermining the credibility of the uh, legitimate environmental movement uh, because to pervert the law to achieve a different end is not something I think convinces people that people doing that are genuine. Uh, and as a, either you or Mr. Irvin, as defenders of the current law, are you at all concerned about those kinds of perverse uses where someone takes the law, uses the identification of a species to achieve some totally other, some other end which they acknowledge and which the law, quite frankly, doesn't allow them to get any, in some other fashion, uh, does damage? I would be concerned if they were using the law to achieve a purpose that was not designed to protect the ecosystems upon which threatened and endangered species depend. But the Act very clearly provides that that is one of its purposes. Um, just incidentally, uh, it's not... So, so you can get a species listed to protect, to, to achieve something else as long as it helps the ecosystem? If a species warrants listing because of its biological status, it should be listed. And if the ecosystem is being destroyed on which that species depends, it should be protected. It's not just the environmental community that uses these tactics. Let me point out that about a year ago, there was a proposal to build a, a mall in suburban Maryland. Another mall developer actually raised legal issues about that uh, based on environmental laws, not because the developer was concerned about the environment, they were concerned about competition. If I were you, I'd have been as critical of him as I am, as I would be of him, because that's not what we ought to be using the laws. If we in Congress write a law to achieve a protection of, a, of an endangered species and it deserves to be listed and there's a proper strategy to protect that species, fine. But to pervert that to achieve some other end that the law does not allow or does, is not intended, I think, I think you open the door for criticism, and I think it's legitimate criticism. Mr. I'm sorry. I think the classic case of what you're talking about is in Texas with the Edwards Aquifer issue. That is an old-fashioned Texas water fight, uh, and the Endangered Species Act law was being used to promote uh, uh, more downstream water for those users down there and take it away from the uh, pumpers on the, Edwards, uh, on the Edwards Aquifer. So, yes, I think your concern is very valid. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I've finished my question. I think your time's expired. <laughs> I apologize to the panel. I've got a markup going in Ag Committee right now as well, and that's why I had to run out. Um, thank you all very much for taking the time, considerable amount of time to be here, and, and this panel's excused. I'd like to call up panel number three, Ms. Chris Nelson, Glenn Spain, Keith Romig, Carl Loop, Dr. Stuart Pym, and the Reverend John Parlberg. Thank you very much for being here and thank you very much for your patience with us today with our votes that have been going on. I know that there's a couple of you that will, are not going to be able to stay through the entire questioning period. I'd like to, to call on them first. Um, Mr. Nelson, if you are ready, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually I got my plans changed, but I'll go ahead. Okay, first. go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm invite uh, 
Chris Nelson with Bon Secours Fisheries Incorporated in Alabama as well as uh, representing the National Fisheries Institute. I'm a vice president at Bon Secours Fisheries. It's a family, family business. I'm in the business with my two older brothers and my father. I represent the fourth generation in that business. We have a uh, shrimp and oyster packing plant. We also unload Gulf shrimp trawlers. Uh, I'm also the regional vice president for the National Fisheries Institute. Uh, and in that regard, I've been working with uh, regional members in the Gulf uh, to discuss the Endangered Species Act uh, reformation and uh, trying to uh, reach some consensus on recommendations for change. I, it's a I feel privileged to be here. I appreciate the opportunity, and I, I would commend the chairman and uh, the other members of the committee on holding the field hearings around the country. I know the, particularly the shrimp industry in the Gulf appreciated the opportunity to come to those hearings and express some of their concerns. These are some of the real people with the real problems in our region. Mr. Chairman, our industry, perhaps more than any other, depends on a healthy environment. Uh, commercial fishermen have traditionally been strong supporters of, of environmentalism and government involvement in resource conservation, especially reasonable measures designed to conserve habitat. Mr. Saxton mentioned this earlier, and I, I agree with what he said. Uh, commercial fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico depend on clean water and wetland nurseries. Water pollution and coastal development, uh, general habitat degradation threaten practically every commercially important species of fish and seafood in the Gulf. Uh, the shrimp industry supports recovery and conservation of sea turtle stocks. We believe that, especially from a habitat standpoint, what's good for the turtles, good for the shrimp, is good for the fish, is good for the oyster. Uh, the goals of the act in this regard are widely supported by fishermen in general. What we in the Gulf cannot support is the misuse of the act and the precious resources which are being wasted as a result of this misuse. The ham-handed regulations and the resultant endless litigation which we're forced into are examples of such wasted resources and I think uh, I would find some agreement on the environmentalist side with that. The, the reforms proposed in H.R. 2275 are long over overdue and will help thousands of families and small businesses struggling to make a living under the increasingly onerous restrictions as a result of this act. One reform of particular importance to us is the obvious need for a more open and interactive planning and regulatory process. Um, I, I feel that uh, after spending some time talking with people in the industry, we want to be in the position of being committed to the to the goals of the act rather than having to be forced into compliance with the act and i think that you'll find that effective programs in general start with more with commitment rather than compliance um, but this is not happening because the industry feels shut out of many of the planning and uh... regulatory uh... formation processes uh, we would like to see reform in that area, have it be more open and uh, to the public and the science, science be better peer reviewed. This will give the affected parties more confidence in the process and reduce the cynicism that's at, uh, at hand. The new regulatory and planning process proposed in H.R. 2275 is a positive change in this regard. The compensation and incentives part of the bill. Um, regarding TEDS, TEDS lose shrimp and some of the fishery closures that are uh, proposed by the agency cost us money as well. The regulatory measures devalue our property and capital investment in the industry and we feel that fishermen should be afforded the same compensation and incentives as property owners on land are. We support the measures in H.R. 2275 which address this. Uh, we also have some other recommended changes which could strengthen the bill. We feel that the um, National Marine Fisheries Service Authority, which cur currently exists, should not be transferred to the Fish and Wildlife Service. We feel that, um, and I have to bite my tongue in saying this because we've had our, <laughs> our problems with the National Marine Fisheries Service, but we feel that uh, that 
that agency has worked more closely with the fishermen and has the necessary expertise. We also would encourage the use of incentives such as those currently proposed by the shrimp fishery to reduce fishing intensity in areas where turtles concentrate. Currently the bill focuses on land-based incentives and should be broadened to cover fishing. And finally, more needs to be done to encourage international conservation. Uh, sea turtle species found in U.S. waters migrate and use the water and, and beaches of many nations. Uh, multilateral standards rather than current unilateral regulations are needed to create a level playing field for all fishermen and foster international cooperation in turtle population recovery. Uh, just this week, several Western Hemisphere nations, including the United States, are seeking such an agreement. And if this effort is successful, we ask that the committee consider including the provisions in H.R. 2275, which would facilitate implementation of the agreement and foster future negotiations. Uh, again, I appreciate this opportunity, Mr. Chairman. I congratulate you on your efforts to date. And I look forward to working with you and the other members of the committee toward improving a law which is of critical importance to my industry. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Spain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here and testify again um, before you. I want to acknowledge, first off, the hard work and difficult tasks the staff have taken on and you personally as chair have taken on. Now, you, perhaps you should have read the fine print before you took the job. But clearly, I think you're uh, equipped to try to resolve what may be one of the most difficult cultural problems we have today. Um, I say that before broadsiding the bill. There are some things in the bill that I certainly would support. Some streamlining procedures, um, expedited uh, streamlined access to the uh, consultation process by non-federal agencies, non-agencies. Uh, certainly timelines on recovery programs and so forth. As you know, PCFFA is the largest organization of commercial fishermen in the West Coast. We represent thousands of small family commercial fishermen, many of whom made their living on the salmon. Uh, we have suffered enormous economic uh, damage because of lack of habitat protection, because of hydropower systems that did not take fish passage into account and were designed to extinguish whole runs. We have lost approximately 72,000 family wage jobs over the past 20 years, and I've cited some of the sources of that. These are independent economic studies. Because of lack of protection, these were jobs lost not because of the ESA, but because of lack of the protection that the ESA in the final analysis will afford to our industry to restore those jobs and restore that base. Uh, it has been said, well, why do we need salmon in the Northwest? Why do we need them anywhere? Uh, every time you extinguish a salmon run in Idaho or Montana or uh, Oregon or Washington, you are extinguishing a job and a source of jobs for the future. It's vitally important to maintain our job base, and I don't think we can afford as a nation to export not only our natural resources, but the 1.5 million family wage jobs that this nation provides through the commercial and recreational fishery, which amount to about $111 billion in this economy. Those are the voices that need to be heard. As to the bill itself, I, I, I I always use nautical terms hanging around fishermen. Uh, it's like a boat where the rigging has been replaced. It's got a new wheelhouse, pilot house. It's got perhaps even a new rubber, ru rudder, but there are holes kicked in the bottom of the boat and you're sinking fast. The holes I would like to outline briefly. Uh, number one, the definition of species must include the protection of, of distinct population segments. Without that, it's like a medic. I'm a medic, by the way, myself, and I've been a small timberland owner and a farmer. I come from cattle ranch country in Arizona. But it's like a medic who is told to go to rescue a crowd and is told also he cannot rescue any individual single population segment of that crowd, i.e. an individual person. You look around and you cannot find anything in that crowd but people. Species through their range are composed of distinct population segments. 
You forbid the protection of distinct population segments, particularly in aquatic species, you will lose the species as a whole, stream by stream, watershed by watershed, county and state by state, uh, until you're down to the last few specimens, at which point the ESA, as it's written in this bill, would kick in, where it's far too late to do anything but the most expensive, most uh, difficult measures uh, of, of triage. The other problem is the uh, overturning of the Sweet Home decision. I frankly think that we ought to be blunt about the ESA and say that it does protect habitat, it should protect habitat, and deal with the consequences to minimize the economic impacts on private landowners. Uh, a species cannot exist without habitat any more than you, Mr. Chairman, can exist for very long without food and water and shelter. That's what we're talking about. You remove the food and water and shelter from any member of Congress and they will be dead in a short period of time. Removing and destroying the habitat of a species is just as effective a death sentence as taking it out and shooting it in the back 40. The central goal of the ESA has been abandoned in the bill, that is recovery in the wild. For aquatic species, they've been replaced with essentially zoo fish, hatchery fish of inferior genetic quality at the expense of wild stocks. Hatchery fish are counted as equivalent to wild for population counts. Uh, there are water allocations are specifically exempted from the ESA, so you can't provide water for the fish. Uh, and you will have primarily re primary reliance on captive breeding and broodstock programs as the uh, conservation measure of choice. This is a death sentence for this nation's fishing industry. We uh, have problems with TEDs. We have problems with restrictions on all the coastlines. We are lear learning to live within the limits of biological sustainability as an industry. We are, I might add, the only industry that is required by law to live within the limits of biological sustainability. Far more of a difficulty for our industry and far more pervasive of job loss already lost perhaps a million jobs is habitat degradation over the last 50 to 60 years nationwide. And in terms of some of the other impacts here, I, I hear a lot of talking about taking private property rights. I'm a private property right owner. My people own private property. They own boats that have nowhere to fish. They own uh, gear tens of thousands of dollars of gear that has nothing to catch. Uh, they're trying to pay their mortgages and their families on the basis of public property rights. Where do fishermen go to sue for compensation for the loss of their watersheds, their ecosystems, their rivers, their streams? I ask you if there are private property rights, there are also public property rights, and there are private rights to the use of public property that have to be balanced. Uh, the takings has to be balanced in that respect. Uh, I will provide uh, more extensive comments line by line. I didn't have sufficient time to do that, and I'm happy to work with staff. You have very good, hardworking staff, and you've taken on a very difficult task. I'd certainly be happy to provide some more comments and work with you uh, on a one-to-one -one basis at any time. Thank I you. I look forward to that. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Pym, <coughs> we are going to have to break in, in a few minutes, but I want to give you the opportunity to, to give your testimony before we have to, to take our break. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here this afternoon and talk to you. I speak as a scientist who studies global patterns of biological diversity and extinction. My remarks today are not the official position of any scientific body. Nonetheless, I'm confident that the majority of my colleagues will conclude that HR 2275 is not scientifically sound. Nor, I'm afraid, can we consider it a credible attempt to address the scientific problems of managing biological diversity and preventing extinction. I think it's unfortunate that none of the current scientific consensus on endangered species management has found its way into this bill. In May this year, the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences issued a report on the Endangered Species Act. 
the Ecological Society of America published its deliberations about the same time. And more recently, a distinguished team of scientists, including Tom Eisner of Cornell and Professor Ed Wilson of Harvard and Jane Lubchenco, who is president-elect of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, published their thoughtful reviews, views on the matter in the prestigious journal Science. Not one of their recommendations seems to have been included in this bill. And perhaps under those circumstances, I can't present a complete list of the bill's scientific problems within five minutes. The major, among my major concerns are these. First, the bill's reliance on captive propagation is misplaced. I serve on an international commission that deals with captive propagation and their reintroduction of species into the wild. Indeed, I believe I am the person um, who released a bird, the Guam rail, back into the wild following its extinction in the wild. And that was the first time that a bird species has been reintroduced into the United States and its territories following its complete extinction. Captive propagation is no substitute for restoring a species to the wild. It's the medical equivalent uh, of relying on heart bypass surgery to address our nation's high incidence of heart disease. I know from my considerable practical experience that restoration is an extremely expensive, last-ditch effort. It fails roughly 90% of the time, and it rarely addresses the underlying problems. Our zoos and botanic gardens have the capacity to propagate only a tiny fraction of the endangered plants and animals. Even Noah could protect only the plants and animals of the planet for a few weeks, and he had divine help. The bill's denigration of computer modeling is quite extraordinary. Computer models provide insights regarding the fate of populations that would take decades to obtain empirically. Such models of the future are an integral part of our society. It's hard to imagine how we could manage without models of the nation's economy, the spread of HIV, and of course, weather forecasts. The bill systems of biological diversity reserves does not target areas of maximum diversity, nor does it provide for new reserves. Indeed, only a small portion of existing federal lands appear to be eligible. Many wilderness areas that are eligible for, were established for reasons having nothing to do with biological diversity. One example I know well um, is Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Its boundaries were drawn to exclude almost completely those areas in Hawaii where most of the rare species are concentrated. Moreover, federal lands are disproportionately located in western states. We in the east would be disenfranchised. On the subject of peer review, I have a minor editorial role on the, uh, for the journal Science, of which you have heard so much. I can assure you uh, that that journal would not be prestigious if we had to name the reviewers of our articles. On the subject of peer review, we are told that only peer-reviewed data are admissible. Scientists, by our very training, are capable of sorting the wheat from the chaff. And indeed, without credible long-term but not peer-reviewed data, the National Research Council could not have made its recommendations about the management of the critically endangered bird, the Hawaiian alala. Implementing those recommendations has led to one of the most dramatic stories of how the 1973 Act has saved species from the brink of extinction. Finally, uh, and most importantly, the major cause of extinction is and will remain the destruction of habitat. The 1973 Act affirms this, and so did the Supreme Court in its decision on the case of Babbitt versus Sweet Home a decision obviously applauded by those of us who wrote the brief of the Amici Curie scientists. The bill's redefinition of harm thus removes the single most significant cause of extinction from the scope of the Act's prohibitions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I know that, that you, uh, am I correct that you're going to have to leave? It's going to be a touch and go. Uh, because we have a vote going on the floor, and I, I did want 
to ma to make a statement or, or to point out something that's in the bill and get your response before you did have to leave? I will try, sir, to reschedule my flight. Just because we're going to have to run, I just want to point out that there's four places in the bill when we talk where we talk about propagation of, of species. And in every instance, it talks about for release into the habitat to be used as a tool in, at the option of, of the secretary, the biologist, potential captive breeding programs, uh, a description of, in the recovery area, a description of any captive breeding program recommended for the alternative. Uh, in general, in carrying out this act, the secretary shall recognize the maximum extent practi practical and may utilize captive, may utilize captive propagation as a means of protecting or conserving an endangered species or threatened species. In every instance where it's mentioned in the bill, it is talked about as a tool or a possible tool that can be used in a conservation program or a recovery program. In no place in the bill does it say that that is what we're depending upon to recover endangered species. And I know that, that a lot of the, the propaganda sheets that have been passed out have said that that's what the bill does, but that's not what it does. You want me to respond to that? Yeah, please do. Um, I'm a scientist and not a, and not a lawyer and not a drafter of legislation. But have you read the bill? I've read the bill. Okay. Um, and um, perhaps it's uh, my inexperience, but I got this sense that um, captive propagation received rather um, greater billing um, than I would feel comfortable with. And, and that's probably perhaps one other my point on peer review before, before we have to go. On, on peer review, you say that you would not release the names of the people who peer review your work. Do those people who are doing the peer review in your magazine, in, in the science magazine, do they know who has, who has presented the work? Oh, yes, indeed. Although that's not if, always in, true In the last magazines. 20 years, the esteemed scientists that you listed off, have you ever known the peer reviewers to say that what their work was was wrong? Could you, could you run that by me again, please? You listed a, a list of esteemed scientists. That's right. In the, 20 year, in the past 20 years, in the past 10 years, in the past five years, you pick your time period. Have the people who peer-reviewed their work ever said they were wrong? You are asking me to disclose confidential information. So let me address that. Well, the, can I say something very general? Yes. Frequently, very distinguished scientists, very eminent scientists, receive very harsh and very critical reviews of their work. They're contrary anonymous contrary to what you're telling me, process. over the past several months, I've met with a lot of scientists and a lot of people in the scientific community, and they tell me that one of the problems is that when you have someone who has a reputation, the chances of other scientists saying they're wrong are slim. I, and I can it, assure and you that a lot of times that's the problem. Now, we may have to do something on the language it, that deals with peer review and, and the names of those people and, and how we go about that. And I'd be happy to work with you on, on a better way to do that if you think there's a better way to do it. But there are problems with the way it's currently being done. And we have to take a break and run a vote. I, if you can stay, please do. There, we have more questions, but if, if you can't, I, I understand that this, this hearing has gone on a long time. So thank you very much, and the, the committee will temporarily recess. We'll continue with this hearing in a few minutes. First, some programming information. The U.S. House of Representatives returns today at noon Eastern Time. Members will meet in a pro forma session. No legislative business will take place. You can see live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the House on our companion network, C-SPAN.
C-SPAN programming brings the public policy and political process to students all across the country. Educators interested in using the network as a teaching resource can join our free membership support service, C-SPAN in the Classroom. One benefit of membership is a liberal copyright policy for the use of our programming. Teachers may tape any C-SPAN produced program without prior permission, as long as it's for classroom use only. Also, our coverage of U.S. Congress floor proceedings is available without copyright restrictions. For more information and to receive a copyright certificate, write C-SPAN in the classroom, 400 North Capitol Street Northwest, Suite 650, Washington, D.C., 20001. We now continue with the House hearing on rewriting the Endangered Species Act. The 22-year-old bill requires the government to do everything it can to save all species from extinction. The hearing is chaired by Congressman Don Young of Alaska. back to order. Again, I apologize to all of the witnesses for the crazy schedule we've had here today. But, um, let's see who we left off with. Romick? Keith Romick. Keith Romick, you, if you're ready, which I'm sure you were about five hours ago, you can begin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm speaking to I work with the United Paper Workers International Union. I'm an information officer and among my duties is to respond to environmental issues, statutes, regulations, and issues that impact our membership as you well know the Endangered Species Act does. In addition to speaking on behalf of our 250,000 members, I have been authorized to say that the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and the International Association of Machinists even though I'm not speaking for them today, agree with the basic gist of what I'm about to say. Our union strongly supports the goals of ESA, but we are extremely concerned about the job losses and economic impacts resulting from the act. In our view, the ESA has failed to consider these issues adequately, and for that reason, the law needs to be adjusted. I'd like to point out that many of our members have spent their lives working in and around America's forests. Their livelihoods depend absolutely on a strong strategy for preserving the environment. We do not believe that economic and environmental goals are in conflict, but we do have to resolve conflicts that have developed in the implementation of this act. In all of the current political posturing and media coverage over reauthorization of this, this law, Little attention has been paid to the working men and women who will be so dramatically affected one way or the other by any reauthorizing legislation. Protecting species and protecting jobs should not and must be not be partisan issues. For that reason, I'm very heartened by the sense I get from the discussion today that there is some possibility that we can move toward agreement. I want to emphasize that when we talk about environmental train wrecks due to some of these problems, that's not an abstraction to our members. When there are environmental train wrecks, as in the Pacific Northwest, our members are the casualties. I'm here today because pulp and paper workers throughout the nation have felt the, the heavy blow of an unbalanced Endangered Species Act. The problem is most dramatically and obviously illustrated in the ongoing debate in the Pacific Northwest where communities are still reeling from the impact of efforts to protect the northern spot at all. ESA restrictions prohibiting timber harvest activities on state and private lands, combined with unfavorable judicial decisions, have resulted in closed mills and laid off workers. To be specific, since 1989, some 212 pulp mills, sawmills, plywood mills, and panel mills have closed in Oregon, Washington, and Northern California. Almost 20,000 men and women who worked in these mills lost their jobs. Communities in the region have seen their tax bases erode as unemployment rises and social services are overburdened. We know, for example, 
that communities suffering from a mill closure experience a loss in normal commercial business activity. I mean, if there's no money, you can't buy things. Due to the, the increased unemployment or the lower income for displaced workers. We also know there is a loss in the assessed value of any closed mill as a tax base for basic local government services. In many, and in many communities within the Option 9 area, the region's operating under the administration's Federal Forest Management Plan. Loss of timber revenue ranges from one quarter to one half of federal timber receipts. In some cases, this timber revenue makes up from 35, has made up from 35 to 40 percent of the funds required for local government services in an individual county. I have heard from our members that cases of alcoholism and depression have increased in communities suffering from mill closures. In one case, in Roseburg, Oregon, the, the town was forced by budget cuts, cuts brought on by decreased revenues to lay off social service workers even as the need for their services increased. This is, this is absurd. In Alaska, where the timber and pulp and paper industries are operating at the lowest level in years, efforts have been made to further reduce the timber base under the Endangered Species Act to protect two species which have not yet been listed as threatened or endangered, the Alexander Archipelago wolf and the Queen Charlotte goshawk. Already, more than 220 men and women, the overwhelming majority of them members of the UPIU, lost their jobs in Wrangell when the facility closed, when the sawmill there closed its doors last year. Additionally, two sawmills, one in Ketchikan and the other on Annette Island, shut down because of a lack of fiber and chip supply. Unless Congress makes necessary changes to, e to the ESA to achieve a balanced approach toward species protection, we will see further job loss in the small communities in southeast Alaska as well as in other parts of the Northwest. Indeed, I want to point out that most of the communities hit hardest by the effects of this law, the current ESA, are small rural towns. A loss of several hundred jobs, or even a few dozen in a small community, can be an absolute disaster. When a mill closes, the whole town suffers. Too often, and for far too long, we have seen the livelihoods of our men and women, our members and others, run into inflexible legislation or unbalanced federal resource policy. We need to make changes to the ESA that avoid these mistakes and take the human element into consideration. The UPIU supports the principles contained in HR 2275 as a reasonable approach, certainly the beginning of a reasonable approach to making the necessary adjustments to the Endangered Species Act. In our view, these principles provide sound environmental protection while allowing for the consideration of the economic and social effects of species protection early in the listing process. We look forward to working with the committee and with other interested groups to refine the legislation that finally comes out of the Congress so that the President can sign it and so that we can have Endangered Species Act, Act reform this year. Our members cannot afford more train wrecks. Thank you. Mr. Liu. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Carl Loop. I'm president of the Florida Farm Bureau Federation and vice president of the American Farm Bureau Federation, the largest organization of agriculture in the nation. I appreciate the opportunity to present the views of Farm Bureau on the reauthorization of the Endangered Species Act. And I wish to thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Young, for your authorship of the legislation that's before us today. Reform of Endangered Species Act has been a priority for Farm Bureau for several years. The current act is not working, not working for species or for farmers and ranchers. That is why several thousand Farm Bureau members from across the country <coughs> attended the hearings held by ESA Task Force earlier this year. Clearly the time has come for constructive changes. Excuse me. Farm Bureau supports H.R. 2275, the Endangered Species Conservation and Management Act. It is a positive step in the right direction towards establishing a common sense policy on how we protect species in this country and protect the rights of American citizens. Our written statement outlines the reasons for our support, along with several concerns we have with the legislative proposal. 
But I must emphasize that the primary reason Farm Bureau supports this legislation is that it recognizes the rights of citizens to property. It is only fair that the protection of endangered species, a program of public interest, should be borne by the public as a whole and not those landowners unfortunate enough to find species on their property. This concept will do much to help establish better relationship between landowners and agencies who are charged with protecting wildlife and plants. We support the approach taken in Section 101 of the bill. However, we are concerned that landowners must pay 20 percent tax on the value of their property before compensation is triggered. We realize that this may be a political decision. However, for many in farming, a 20 percent reduction in equity is difficult to live with. Secondly, we are concerned that payment under the bills are limited by annual agency appropriations and may result in landowners who are entitled to compensation under the law unable to actually receive their compensation in a timely manner. Mr. Chairman, Farm Bureau also supports adopting of amending the ESA so that a landowner may modify his land without becoming subject to the harm provisions of the Act. Adoption of this concept contained in the original ESA will go a long way towards removing most of the problems and concerns that private landowners have with the way the Act is implemented. The current prohibition against habitat modification, narrowly drawn but broadly applied, represents ultimate control over private land use by the federal government. Current applications of the harm definition has created a serious disincentive for species protection by landowners. While the creation of a critical habitat reserve program is not contained in H.R. 2275, I would like to comment on the CHRP program. This concept was developed by Farm Bureau some years ago. We believe it is a landowner's incentive that is practical and necessary. We like the mechanics of the proposed program in terms of participation, incentive, and duration. However, we ask that Congress establish the program under the Department of Interior and not USDA. Interior has jurisdiction over endangered species, and overlapping jurisdiction only creates problems and confusion. Secondly, the program would be limited as to who or what type of habitat will qualify. We have suggested that the program be limited to critical habitat in order to cover only the habitat that is necessary for the species. This bill makes no such limitations and would even apply to candidate species habitat. Since the program will not have unlimited funding, it is very important that to be effective in protecting the species, this is the most important part of the protecting the habitat. Lastly, the program must address the question of what happens at the end of a contract period. The bill should specifically allow the landowner to terminate a contract at the end of the period and to use his property for other purposes without fear of civil or criminal penalties. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, H.R. 2275 contains many of the principles that Farm Bureau believes should be a part of ESA reauthorization. We ask that you continue to seek additional incentives for property owners under the ESA. Farmers and ranchers can and should be part of the effort to protect species. We have seen that an act that wields a regulatory stick will fail, but I assure you that an act with positive incentives and good common sense will rightfully earn the cooperation of farmers and ranchers and protection of endangered species in our nation. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Parlberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This has been a long day, but for me, a very uh, worthwhile and educational experience, and I hope that in the few minutes remaining, I can also contribute something worthwhile to this process. I'm very grateful that the committee has seen fit to make room in these hearings for a voice from the religious community, uh, an indication, I think, that you recognize that the issue before you is not simply a matter of politics or economics, but that it touches on the very deepest of human values. Indeed, that this issue has to do with the very nature of what it means to be human. In biblical terms, what it means for us to be creatures among other creatures, and yet creatures created.
created in the very image and likeness of God. I'm an ordained minister in the Reformed Church in America, one of the oldest Protestant denominations in this country, a denomination that participates in both the National Council of Churches of Christ uh, Eco Justice Working Group and also in the Evangelical Environmental Network. Each of those groups is also a part of a broad interfaith coalition known as the National Religious Partnership for the Environment. All of our faith traditions recognize and celebrate creation as the gift of a wise and loving creator. O Lord, how manifold are your works, sings the psalmist. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. For the psalmist and for every person of faith, I think the astonishing variety of life on this earth is a cause for wonder, praise, thanksgiving, and reverence. Every creature is in some sense seen as an indication of the power, wisdom, love, and continuing care of a creator. As one Lutheran theologian put it, I have never been able to entertain a God idea which was not related to the fact of chipmunks, squirrels, hippopotamuses, galaxies, and light years. Moreover, the biblical tradition affirms that humankind occupies a very special and unique place in creation. Of all the creatures, only humankind is created in the image of God, made a little lower than the angels, and given dominion over the other creatures. And that concept for our debate, I think, of dominion is very important. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann has said that the dominion here mandated is with reference to the animals. The dominance is that of a shepherd who cares for, tends, and feeds the animals. The task of dominion has to do with securing the well-being of every other creature and bringing the promise of each to full fruition. The human person, he says, is ordained over the remainder of creation but for its profit, well-being, and enhancement. The role of the human person is to see that creation becomes fully the creation willed by God. And if I could mention just one other biblical example in the second creation account in the book of Genesis, the man is placed in the garden to till it and to keep it. Those words in Hebrew, to till and to keep, are elsewhere translated in the Old Testament as to serve and to protect. So the human person is charged to keep the garden, to serve and protect creation the way the Lord keeps us. The Endangered Species Act of 1973, although far from perfect, has been one important way we as a people have sought to exercise our God-given responsibility to serve as the guardians and protectors of God's creation. And the proposed bill, it seems to me, seems to abdicate that responsibility in some significant ways. Briefly, um, the protection and preservation of species habitat is seriously jeopardized. We've talked about that already today. Uh, that seems to make no sense to me, either theologically or scientifically. Um, the psalmist celebrates God's habitats, the variety of habitats is as much as he does the variety of creatures that occupy those habitats. And scientists will tell us that the critical need in preserving endangered species is to protect their habitats. Secondly, the bill appears to abandon the long-standing recovery goal for listed species. By choosing a conservation objective for each species, um, the secretary would no longer be required to attempt to recover those species, and it's inappropriate, I think unwise, to assume that any single individual or agency has the authority to decide whether or not one of God's unique and unrepeatable creations will now become extinct. And thirdly, the issue of uh, compensation for private property owners, something I think that needs to be done and is very helpful in many cases, but I would raise a note of caution. Um, care for God's creation is such a fundamental human responsibility that I don't think we want to get into the position of saying that in every case a property owner must be compensated for doing what he or she should be doing in the first place. Um, I support the right to own private property, but I also recognize that it's always tempered by our responsibility for the common good and by our responsibility before God, who alone is the absolute owner of all things. Creation does not belong to us, it belongs to God. And we 
are not the lords of creation, we are but underlords. Speaking out of my own Christian conviction, there is only one Lord of creation, and that Lord is Jesus Christ, in whom, through whom, and for whom all things in heaven and on earth were created. The Endangered Species Acts Act needs to be fixed, and by all means fix it, but please don't undo it. The proposed bill, if enacted as written, I fear would cause serious and perhaps irreparable damage to God's creation. It abdicates our responsibility of careful and loving dominion over God's creation, and I fear it assumes a power and an authority for humanity that rightfully belongs to God alone. I hope and I pray that as you consider this legislation, you will consider ways that it might help us as a nation become not the usurpers of God's power, but rather the instruments of God's tender love and care for all that God has made. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I know Mr. Nelson is just about ready to run out the door, but before you run out the door, uh, we heard testimony earlier today that the shrimpers in the Gulf Coast were having a record year. Could you comment on that? Um, yes, the shrimp catch has been good. It's a cycl cyclical um, harvest, and uh, it's been about five years since we had a, a good harvest above average, so it's not, not unexpected. It's not as good as it could be without TEDs, though, I'll add. In reference to the, to the TEDs, have the shrimp industry, the shrimpers, made recommendations to uh, National Marine Fisheries on alternatives to the TEDs that would preserve uh, sea turtles that would have not have the same impact as, as the TEDs do? Yes, um, there have been a number of, from a, from a number of different angles, you can, you can look at that. There have been a number of TED designs that have been proposed that it's arguable exactly um, what the results of the testing were. We would maintain that the testing of, of these designs showed that they were effective and the agency has disagreed with us. One of the mo more recent uh, offerings from the industry, however, has been a an alternative management program that would give the fishermen incentives to uh, not fish so intensively in areas where the turtles are, are more highly congregated. And this is areas uh, primarily west of the Mississippi River, um, off Grand Isle, Louisiana, for instance, and, and in areas of Texas. And uh, it's now out for public comment, I believe, but it was uh, a long bumpy road to get it uh, recognized by the agency and uh, out for out for comment and and given due consideration but I think it's uh, it certainly is a uh, a good proposal and in principle is supported by the Gulf industry you heard testimony as well that stated that the the Ted's work just fine would you agree with that statement <laughs> um, no. Do they uh, work to the the, to TEDs, save the, the TEDs work just fine if you um, if you use them in areas where uh, the bottom is hard and there's very little debris. There are areas of Florida, for instance, and and on the east coast of the United States, and where they work pretty doggone well. And I think that uh, the the willingness of the fishermen in, let's say, Georgia and South Carolina, they've been more willing to implement these devices because they work better in those areas. Uh, in the Gulf, we feel that we lose between 10 and 25 percent of the catch, depending on what your conditions are, time of year, weather, uh, conditions, uh, and the debris that you would encounter. Ms. Chenoweth, did you have any questions of Mr. Nelson before he had to go and before we took a break? <clears throat> Not Mr. Nelson. Okay, go ahead because he's going to have to go. I just had one comment from Mr. Nelson, and I think that he mentioned opening the process up for public comment, and I think that is extremely important. I was so glad that you mentioned that because 
Um, the only way we can do that is through the NEPA process and to keep the NEPA process alive. And I think it's so important that, that the public who will be impacted by a decision um, have input into that decision making process um, as NEPA uh, was purposed to do. And um, that may sound strange coming from a Republican, but I, um, I, I want to see the NEPA process opened up and I appreciate your catching that point. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gilchrist, did you have a question? Just a quick comment. Um, I, 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 your testimony seemed to lead to the fact that uh, turtles and other species and are important to preserve, bycatch, all these uh, technical advances that we can create in a cooperative manner to preserve the turtles, to, to limit the bycatch, I think is something that we're all working for. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, would, uh, I would agree to answer any questions that could be submitted in writing. Um, Thank you. And there, I'm sure there will be further questions. The committee will again temporarily adjourn. We'll continue with this hearing in a few minutes. First, some programming information. The U.S. Senate returns today at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Members will begin debate on an $81 billion fiscal year 1996 Veterans and Housing and Urban Development Spending Bill. Funding for the Environmental Protection Agency and NASA are also included in this legislation. See live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the Senate on C-SPAN 2. Then later on our companion network C-SPAN, campaign financing a discussion on regulations, the issue of soft money, and 1996 campaign funding. The forum is hosted by George Washington University's Graduate School of Political Management. We'll have live coverage Monday at 7.10 p.m. Eastern Time. We now continue with the House hearing on rewriting the Endangered Species Act. The 22-year-old bill requires the government to do everything it can to save all species from extinction. The hearing is chaired by Congressman Don Young of Alaska. Oh, okay. We're going to call the hearing back to order. And Mr. Nelson left. Mr. Spain. Yes, sir. In, in your experience in the fishing industry in the... Uh, Pacific Coast. <clears throat> Do you believe that we can develop a bill which handles the problems that are associated with land-based species and aquatic species so that it's not an either-or proposition? Um, in a nutshell, yes, and I'd like to explain why if I might have about 30 seconds. And also some of the problems that clearly you're going to have in drafting. Um, every species is different. They have different habitat needs. They have different behavioral patterns. Aquatic species, even among themselves, are different. So you have some basic problems. I think the, the approach of looking at habitat and trying to protect habitat and creating some agency flexibility in recovery planning so that they're not locked into something that is inapplicable. Much of the language here, much of the smoke and hysteria, frankly, has been around spotted owl issues. They are vastly different in their behavior and vastly different in their needs from aquatic species. Uh, fish can't jump over uh, ridge tops. Um, they can't, they're not widely migratory. They're tied to the streams that they live in. So you have to protect those streams. You can't have protection in this stream that really 
is protection for another stream and expect the fish in the first stream to exist. That's one of the problems. But I think, yes, we can um, draft a bill that takes into account the variability of species, the variability of their needs, but we've got to do it in a way that does three things. Number one, create some flexibilities for the agencies to manage this problem. Number two, creates a much greater public input from the bottom up so that people in the local community, number one, come up with solutions, and number two, buy into the solutions. And number three, we've got to have much better research so that we've got the best available science. W one of the problems that I see is we don't have enough funding by far to do the job that we need to do without creating dislocations. And that's we, part of the, what we've got here. We attempted to, to address exactly what you've brought up. And I know that in previous testimony and in discussions that we've had on this issue, those are the issues that, that we tried to address. And we may not agree on exactly how you get there, but I think we can agree on what the issues are. But you've also heard testimony earlier today criticizing our process for bringing more people in as being cumbersome, as being uh, delaying the inevitable, and that we shouldn't bring people in to the system. You've heard testimony here today that by making the changes that we make to try to bring in better science, that we somehow jeopardize the peer review process. And, and the peer review process that's going on now is, is virtually non-existent, and which you're well aware of in the problems that we've had in, in the Pacific Northwest. But the difficulty that we have in trying to put those together is that we, we may agree that those are important issues, but we will be criticized for putting those issues in and for trying to address those. That, that's correct. That's also the fine print in the contract uh, that you signed when you uh, raised your hand and were <laughs> sworn in. Uh, that's one of the problems. Uh, you ought to be more specific in the future. <laughs> well, but, you know, it's... And I don't, I don't mind that. I mean, this is, but let me, this let is me a address very that important issue. issue, and I think that we, that we do have to come to a solution. I don't think we have time to wait. Mr. Romick stated that his people can't, can't go another year like this, and he's absolutely right. I mean, my farmers at home, you know, the timber guys, the people that work in the mills, they can't go another year. This is something we have to do, and there's tough decisions that, that have to be made. I appreciate the effort that you've put in to this process, realizing that we are not going to agree on everything. But I do appreciate greatly the effort you've put in. Reverend, you, another part of your job, I would assume, is to counsel and console your parishioners as well. And I think that if the people that belong to, to your church that you saw every day were the union members from Mr. Romig's organization who had lost their jobs and all the problems that the Pacific Northwest faces today, that the, that the Southeast faces today, that the Central Valley in California faces today, and had heard the stories that, that I have heard and the problems that are going on there, you may still feel exactly the way you do about God's creation and God's earth, but I think you'd look at it and say, we've got to do something here, because this is just not working for another of God's creation, and that being the human being. And we have to be able to put a balance so that we do recognize that, that humans are part of God's creation, and that humans are part of the environment. And so often we try to pretend that human beings don't exist and that if we shut down our forests or shut down our farmlands or tell our shrimpers or our fishermen that they can't fish anymore that that's going to be great for species that's going to be great for wildlife but we're ignoring the fact that that they suffer real problems and I, I'm sure that the other gentlemen that are sitting at this table whether they agree or disagree with my bill and in our attempt 
to solve the Endangered Species Act will tell you that the stories of pain that the people in their industries are suffering are very real and are not anecdotal stories that were made up to prove a point. And Mr. Spain has spent a great deal of time explaining the difficulties that the fishermen on, in the Pacific Northwest have gone through in the past years. That's very real pain. That's very real to each and every one of those people. It may not matter in New York. It may not matter in, you know, in the East Coast where they don't have that problem. But to his people, it matters a great deal. I'm, I'm not denying um, that it matters. And I'm not denying that there are difficult choices that, that need to be made on occasion. Um, I think what is not said often enough, and, and fortunately we have heard some of it uh, today, is that there are times when the Endangered Species Act uh, has helped to protect jobs. Um, and I think that also needs to be said. Um, I know that there are times when it also has worked to the detriment of, of workers, and I'm not saying that the act as it is written is perfect by, by no means. It does need to be changed. Um, I'm just raising a word of caution um, that economic value is not the only value, um, and we need to do the hard work of, of working out those balances. Well, and, uh, I've spent the past 10 months doing a lot of hard work in drafting this proposal and in no means has anyone shirked their duty in doing the, the hard work well, that as, is as, necessary. As someone once said, as a, as a preacher, my job is to proclaim just let justice roll down like waters and you work out the details of the irrigation system. <laughs> um, well, you, you have the more difficult task. That, that's, that's fine. And, and I understand the perspective in, from which you, you come on this issue, and, I, and it's really hard to disagree with, with what you're saying. But I just want you to understand that a lot of the, the parish priests and ministers and reverends from, from my district have talked to me about the need of doing something about the Endangered Species Act because what they see every day in, in carrying out their duties is as ministers in their area and they they see very very real pain and suffering that's happening and and they want us to do something they they really want something to happen and from that perspective I just would like to bring that to your attention Mr. Loop you've you've told us that the Endangered Species Act is a very important issue in in the state that you come from and, and the conflicts that, that you have seen arisen. Can you tell me whether the cooperative agreements that, that we have outlined in the bill, in the series of bills that we have introduced, what effect those would have on the ability of, of the farmers and ranchers and from your state to cooperate in a better way with, with the, the Endangered Species Act? Mr. Chairman, I think it would have a uh, in, uh, great impact and, and let me give you an example uh, the Florida panther is, the, is our state animal uh, about two years ago Fish and Wildlife got together with the other agencies and drafted a plan to save the Florida panther without any public input uh, without any outside and when we first heard about it uh, we thought we had a, a responsibility to uh, involve the private uh, landowners, and so we set up a town meeting. This is one of these town meetings, after you did it, you probably wish you hadn't have, because we almost had a rout, because what they were trying to do, or what they wanted to do, was to, to make this plan that they had drafted work to put another 1.2 million acres of private land into this plan, along with 3 million acres that the state, our government owned, and, uh, and this didn't work, and as a result of that, uh, Florida Farm Bureau put together a program. We call it the Perfect Partnership. The purpose of this was twofold. First of all, to educate the public of the value of rural lands to wildlife habitat. Also, to get farmers to look at what they might do on their property to uh, provide wildlife habitat and what kind of incentives that would take to, to do that. Since that time, we have done a lot as far as uh, uh, public service announcements and uh, 
publicized this, had workshops, town meetings, and everything. And we have seen the, the private landowners, the agencies, the public, and the environmental groups come together, and we haven't finished this yet. But we feel like this is, uh, is going to have a, a big impact, and as people work these problems out, we find there's a lot more in common than, than they're, they're apart. So I think the cooperative management agreements in your bill uh, would be right along what we're doing, and I think it would offer a lot to, to bring this, uh, this whole issue together. At uh, a previous hearing, we had a Dr. Simberloff from Florida, um, I believe it's Fl Florida State. Yeah, Florida State University, who testified about, and one of the issues he covered was the biodiversity in Florida, and, and Florida is rather unique in, in its biodiversity because of its makeup. But he testified that he could protect, he felt you could protect about 98% of the species in the, on the endangered species list in Florida with less than 100,000 acres, that a biological area in that uh, in Florida and he said that there were a few that he couldn't he couldn't do because of uh, their range one of those being the Florida panther there, something I wanted to show you this and I'll pass this down to you but this if you set up the, these biodiversity reserves that would include the state and the federal lands that currently have conservation easements on them, this is what the map would look like. And obviously, because there's more land in the west that's federally owned, it would be heavily weighted toward the west. But you can also see throughout the country, there would be areas that would be protected. And in your state of Florida, there are, there are several areas that are either federally or state-owned that are protected. And this does not include privately owned lands that are held in, in a conservation easement or conservation status. And I believe that if you had the cooperative management agreements on private property, the state and federally owned lands as held in a conservation status, that you would do a much better job in protecting wildlife than what we're currently doing. How would, how uh, would you respond to that? I, I certainly agree with that, and uh, I think uh, not only on the federal lands or government lands, but we have got a lot of people that would like to cooperate, but, uh, you know, regulatory agencies coming out with an arrogant uh, dictatorial attitude has uh, turned a lot of people off. We did a survey and asked landowners what would be the incentives that they would like to see that would make them, entice them to put land into wildlife habitat. Much to our surprise, it wasn't the financial part. The number one thing they wanted was relief from regulatory agency and be able to have some certainty that they could continue to operate that, that farm, that they could afford to make the investments and do the things that they need to in a daily operation of their business. And that, that seemed to be and this cloud that's over them, it affects their ability to borrow, it affects their ability to expand their operations, or, or, and the uncertainty is just difficult to live with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, final question, Mr. Romick. A lot of the testimony that we've heard today, a lot of the debate has centered around private property and, and habitat, and yet you represent, I guess, a different point of view in terms of the people that, that are affected by, by the act. You stated, I believe, in your testimony that there were 212 mills that closed. Uh, that's correct. And over 20,000? Approximately, yes. And is that just in the Pacific Northwest? That, to the best of my knowledge, is specifically in the Pacific Northwest. Do, do you have figures on the rest of, of your industry for the rest of the country as well, or did you just concentrate on, on that particular problem out there? I don't believe the number has been researched in the same way in the rest of the country as it has been in the Pacific Northwest, just because of the intensity and long-standing nature of the issue up there. The, um, I know that 
because of other testimony that we've received at, at this hearing as well as previous hearings with the red cockaded woodpecker and, and other endangered species in, throughout the, the northeast and the south that they've had similar problems. My under, based on what I do know, there have not been very many pulp and paper, there haven't been any pulp and paper mill closures in the southeast related to this, and I'm not up enough on sawmills. What about uh, Arizona, New Mexico? Uh, we represent very few people, and the mills we do represent are still operating. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Mrs. Chenoweth? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, Reverend Perlberg, I was very interested in your comments. You, you opened your comments with a very interesting scriptural quote, which I think was from Psalms 8. Uh, Psalm 104, I believe. Okay. It was very similar to the one in Psalms 8, which says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And um, I think I share with you the sense of humility that that same the psalmist who wrote up above said, when I consider the heavens and everything that he has created, um, the stars and the moon and, and man, that you know there is such a great sense of humility. But then it goes on to say that he made man to have dominion and to care for all the works of the earth, including all the sheep and the ox and, and the beasts and the fowl and the fish and everything. And I, I, I take that um, as, a, as a very direct command to be very, very good stewards of what we were um, given to uh, steward, much like what you said about the shepherd. But I think, <clears throat> I think Psalms 8 and Psalms 104 are very close there. But I think that we are supposed to be the stewards. And I found it very interesting that in the Sweet Home decision, uh, that Supreme Court decision actually um, took that command away after years and years of functioning in a, in a, a balance of understanding. And, I'm, I'm uh, not sure. Um, I, I don't know the details of that decision, but... Um, as I understand it, that was a decision that served to protect habitat for the very creatures that God has asked us to care for. I would see that as a means of, uh, of exercising careful dominion and stewardship. Uh, we can't care for God's creatures unless we also provide habitat for them. I think it involved a plaintiff who was an 80-year-old lady who wanted to be able to harvest some trees um, so she could acquire uh, money to be able to live reasonably comfortably. And they found a pair of spotted owls within that 4,000 acre grid. And so she was not able to utilize her, her property. But um, I did, I did want to ask Mr. Um, Spain, you spoke, you spoke about um, you spoke about hatchery species not having the same gene pool as natural fish species or having an inferior gene pool. If I can answer that question, hatchery fish are no more like wild fish than a tame turkey is like a wild turkey. Um, they have, over the years, made serious mistakes in genetic intermingling and to some degree the hatchery programs that we have now in the Northwest have contributed to the loss of wild runs. That's being reformed now. We know a lot more about genetics than we ever did before. Our organization has worked with hatchery programs. We've managed and funded hatcheries. We've also criticized some hatchery programs. So we're neither pro nor con hatchery, but it is a tool. It is well known, though, that hatchery fish have nowhere near the survival rate of wild fish. And you simply cannot, simply cannot replace the wild stocks with hatchery fish. For one thing, the genes that, that support those hatcheries have to be continually replenished. Those can only come from wild stock. 
the genes have to be continually replenished? Yes, they do. And that's mm. because there's genetic drift in the hatchery stock. They become much more dependent on hatcheries than on wild um, uh, environmental factors. And they become basically less and less able to adapt to life in the wild unless their gene pool is continually replenished. That's true of almost every agricultural crop, by the way. And the source of those genes must be wild stocks that are adapted through millions of years to survive. Well, I'd love to talk to you about the hole in the ozone, Mr. Spain. Well, that's but a different issue. I'm, By the I'm way, ask, I, one comment. Wait a you, minute. I'm, I have sure. control of the time, please. Um, I do want to say that the hatchery fish have the same genetic pool as do wild fish. And there is nothing in the code of federal regulation that distinguishes a, a fish that's reared in, the, in a hatchery as far as its gene pool. I'd refer the you to... The gene pooling is, is the criteria in which species and subspecies have been listed under. I'd be happy to continue the dialogue on that and supply you with some information. By the way, it may um, perhaps ruin your day to know that we agree on the NEPA... Uh, issue and that you and I are both struggling to open the process and make it less bureaucratic in the ESA. I think that goes a long way toward resolving some of these problems. So I wanted to comment on that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nice to find common ground. <laughs> I appreciate that comment. Um, when you fish, do you ever catch salmon? Well, right now, as you know, most of the, the fleet in the Northwest is closed down, uh, largely because although there are abundant Chinook runs, we can't catch those because of the danger of catch of depressed runs, coho. Uh, salmon used to be the workhorse for the entire West Coast fishing industry. Uh, the declines over the last year have been directly resulting in some 72,000 jobs lost over the last 20 years. But it is not the ESA that is the problem. There are no coastwide listings of any of those fish. There are a few listings relatively recently in the Columbia and in the Sacramento. The problem is the declines. That is the issue we must address. The ESA is a very poor tool for addressing those declines. But it is, at the last resort, the only tool we have left. Wouldn't you agree that last year, though, in the commercial fishery industry, that they enjoyed a record catch of salmon? Not in the Northwest. In Central California, and those, uh, those restored runs, frankly, are attributed primarily to ESA-driven water reforms in the Central Valley. ESA-driven water reforms in the yes. central. What about the fish that migrated up around the, the, the Alaskan coast? There was record catches of salmon up there. Well, that's and in Alaska. Year, Those this mostly come from Canada, where they've taken much better care of their habitat. <laughs> um, I, I, think that, you know, I, I, I think that it's very interesting that the Endangered Species Act has never addressed gill netting, addressed gill netting or... Well, certainly or, does. For instance, the Columbia River gillnet uh, fleet is probably one of the most studied, most uh, permit-laden um, catches in, in, in the country. Uh, there are at least 17 different agencies that have input into the permits for those. Every effort is made to reduce and minimize or eliminate bycatch. Now, gillnets are very much part of the process as well. Those fleets, those boats don't sail without a, uh, a, 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 a take permit under Section 10. Um, <clears throat> what, what impact do you think that the El Nino has had on the record return of salmon that we're now beginning to experience in our, in our west coast rivers and streams? El Ninos are cyclical. When ocean conditions are hostile, it does cause declines. When they're more favorable, it causes um, better survival rates. The problem is, if you superimpose a declining habitat year after year over natural fluctuations, you have periodic crashes. Uh, the salmon evolved for millions of years to survive El Nino. They did not evolve to survive the more, more or less total destruction of their inland habitat. We do have to address that issue. El Ninos will never go away. But if we depress the stocks so close to the edge 
under normal conditions. When we got a downturn in ocean conditions, they crash and they get into a situation which we're beginning to see where there are too few fish to replenish themselves. Even though the fish are there, they can't find each other if it takes a mile or two miles or three miles of streams to, uh, to mm. do so. El Ninos have an impact, no question about it, but we need to control those factors that we do have control over. And in terms of stewardship, we have the obligation, I believe, morally and legally, to undo what damage we have done. You didn't answer my question when I asked you if you ever catch salmon. I don't fish. I do mostly oh. this. I wish I were fishing. Oh, I see. Well, do members of your organization catch salmon? Uh, certainly. Uh, our members are, are from every port from San Diego to Alaska. Many of them have in the past participated in the salmon fishery. Many of them now have to re-gear if they can, if they can, and try to get into other fisheries. Isn't that a violation of the Endangered Species Act? No, it's done pursuant to an incidental take permit in those areas where no, it's that, required. That has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with Section 10A. You may not harm, harass, injure, or kill an endangered species. The fall, the summer, and the spring Chinook has been listed as well as the sockeye. Now, don't tell me they're not being commercially fished. If you look they at, are. If I you, know it, and you know it. If you look at the section, you'll find that the exemption is if there's an incidental take permit, those stocks are caught, if at all, as bycatch pursuant to an incidental take permit where every effort, every so, effort is made to protect them. So every fisherman that is catching salmon has an incidental take permit with an entire uh, process, uh, the biological opinion and everything that's attached to the giving of an incidental take permit for every fisherman that's catching a salmon. Those are programmatic and they're uh, yes, issued they are. through the agencies. I think there's one agency that issues an incidental take permit and I don't believe, sir, that every fisherman acquires an incidental take permit. Not individually, no. It's programmatic. Um, do you know, do you know, you talked about the record um, or if we uh, cause harm to the uh, existing fish runs in Idaho, we're harming the, uh, the entire stock. Let, let, let me tell you something about the listing, listing of the sockeye salmon. The sockeye salmon is, is, uh, is an anomaly by birth of a genetic pooling of two kokanee, landlocked kokanee. And our state fish and game for years diminished the, the population of the kokanee in the lakes in preference for trout. So our fish policy in Idaho uh, absolutely ran against what came later in the Endangered Species Act. And so you know, what we need to do is everyone needs to get together with the same long-range goal and not punish people because we diminish the parent stock in, in the lakes, the high mountain lakes, in preference for fly fishing. And then Idaho people have had to suffer. I couldn't agree with you more. That's one reason all the agencies have to be required to be at least on the same page in terms of protections. You know, as far as genetic... Um, work with genes. It's very interesting that when we passed the Clean Water Act, um, we needed to clean up the Great Lakes and get rid of a certain type of algae, which the Pacific salmon would adapt to very easily. But how could we adapt the Pacific salmon and anadromous fish in the West to the, to the Great Lakes? We did it. We did it by the, the chemical imprinting process. We can do it all over this nation when we see um, people with great minds, people who've studied fish, people like yourself, and, and various other scientists come together to make it happen right. And, you know, my concern is that there's a consensus that while we let the, the salmon live, as, and the best salmon you can catch nowadays is in the Great Lakes, and it was artificially originally stocked, and that salmon gene tradition was fooled by chemical imprinting. I think we can let the salmon um, live very well, as well as our workers of the forest and everyone else, and 
um, I, I think there is a great future if we'll just work together. Well, we are, yeah, we must work together. That's absolutely required. And frankly, one of the reasons we're here is we want an ESA that requires everybody to work together, and preferably one that doesn't isn't regulatory in nature, in so far as it's, it takes a proactive approach. One of the problems with reintroduction programs is for salmon in the West Coast, each salmon um, genetic strain fits into its watershed like a lock and a key fit together. It's very difficult to transplant from one to the other. It usually fails, and it's very expensive. Mother Nature can make a fish better, faster, and cheaper than the Corps of Engineers any day, and I think we owe it to ourselves as an economy and as a region to uh, try to prevent harm, you know, the this Hippocratic Oath, uh, do no harm first. I think we need to do no harm uh, before we rely on trying to undo damage that's irretrievable. So let's work together on that. Thank you, Mr. Spain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank the panel for your perseverance and your patience <laughs> with us today. Uh, there's a lot going on back here right now, and uh, we're trying to keep ahead of it all. But I appreciate a great deal you being here and sticking around for our questions. And would like to remind you that if there are questions that members of the committee have, that they will present to you in writing. And, and if you could provide a response to the committee in writing, it would be greatly appreciated. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Is there anything else I'll do before I adjourn? The hearing will be adjourned. The House Resources Committee hopes to complete its work on the Endangered Species Bill and send it to the House floor for further consideration before October 1st. The U.S. Senate returns today at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Members will begin debate on an $81 billion fiscal year 1996 Veterans and Housing and Urban Development Spending Bill. Fun